Inheriting the Farmhouse, A Havenwood Cowboy's Romance, Book One. Written by Caitlin Meadows. Narrated by Emily Norman. Stay, stay at home, my heart, and rest. Homekeeping hearts are happiest. For those that wander they know not where are full of trouble and full of care. To stay at home is best. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Home Song Chapter One Going back to Bridgewater was going to kill me. I was devastated to hear about Grandpa's death. Anyone who knew him, related or un, would have felt his departure as poignantly as a square of fabric torn from a perfectly patterned quilt and would have shivered from the resulting chill that seeped in because of the loss. But that wasn't why I hadn't been able to sleep, eat, or even breathe at a normal rate for days. No. The real reason for my drumming heart and fractured mind was the prospect of returning to my hometown. I told Aunt Sarah I'd come for the funeral. I mean, of course I would. But that meant... I closed my eyes, blocking out the passing farmland on both sides of Bex's minivan, and reached for the side of the torn leather seat. I needed something I could hold on to. Something wrong? Bex asked. Her steady hands guided the wheel, and though my eyes were closed, I knew she slipped a quick glance in my direction. The last time I'd seen my high school best friend, Bex had had a rounded belly and a toddler on her hip. Now we were making for town to pick up that toddler from flag football practice. The baby was jabbering from the back seat about preschool and what she'd played during rug time, and a new baby, whose cheeks I couldn't wait to squish, babbled nonsense in return. I don't think I can do this, I told her, exhaling slowly through a small opening in my lips, praying the constant, controlled breaths would do their part and tell my heart to get a grip. Funerals are tough, Beck said, passing the green roadside and announcing the exit toward Bridgewater was in one mile. One mile. What was I doing? The sight flared the flame already imposing on my lungs. Though I'd been in a car thousands of times before, no matter whose it was, the frame had never closed on me like this before and yet the framework supporting the windshield and keeping it a reasonable distance from where I sat seemed to bend closer, encroaching on my personal space and my sanity. I braced a hand against the van's upper structure as Beck signaled, slowed, and took the unwanted exit. Bell, Beck said. The stop sign was nearing. Beats pounded in my throat. Road sounds crashed, filling my ears with uproarious sound, and I couldn't breathe. Stop the car, I pleaded, as calmly as I could manage, though it still didn't mask the struggle in my tone. Bex, please, stop the car. She pulled off onto the safety zone within the roadside's white line, and I bolted out, swallowing the cool fall air and willing it to clear the cotton suffocating my brain and my airways. The familiar Idaho countryside swept before me. Sunflowers danced wild and carefree, bowing to the warm October breeze. Sunlight blazed orange, and I reached for that light, for the comfort it promised, even as I bent to rest my hands on my knees. What's wrong with Auntie Belle? Bex's three-year-old daughter asked from her seat. I closed my eyes. In my panic attack, I hadn't thought to close the car door behind me. Why did we stop, Mommy? I'll be right back, Bex replied circumspectly. Clicking sounds followed, and as the van was still running, the driver car door made several repetitive binging sounds before her feet crunched the gravel beside me. I couldn't bring myself to look at her. I stared at the sun, wishing it could burn me up, 
wishing whatever outside source was pressing against my skull would ease up already. Is this the first time you've been back since... She didn't finish, and I was glad. If I could barely handle returning to Bridgewater, period, I sure as the blue sky couldn't handle talking about why. All I could do was nod. Bex chewed her bottom lip. I'm so sorry, she said, sounding genuine and just a little bit lost. I'm no expert on PTSD, but some time has passed since it happened. Maybe this is good for you. I've heard facing your fears helps to ease them. Making yourself face this could be the best thing for you. I knew she meant well, but that couldn't be right. According to my body, confronting pain was only making that pain worse. My heart was a dull ache. Anxiety had taken place of my bloodstream, shooting my veins with stalwart fear and stubbornness and the certainty that walls were closing in, even though there were none. I can't do this, I said. Bex took another step toward me. You know you don't have to. What do you want me to do? She asked, sounding as though she wanted to help but didn't know how. If you want, we'll turn this car around and head straight back to Twin. Bex. I'm serious. I'll get my brother to take Cody home from flag football. Cody's already waiting at his office anyway, and it'll be closing time soon. I finally brought myself to meet her earnest expression. Bex was pretty and petite, with her blonde hair dyed fuchsia on the underlayers. She was tanned and determined and didn't take her gaze from mine for a second. I read everything I needed in her blue eyes. Steadiness, compassion, friendship. I can't ask that of you, I said, breathing the tiniest bit easier. She'd already taken time out of her day to pick me up from the airport in Twin Falls about an hour away. I didn't deserve such reliability, not when I hadn't been in touch with her like I should have in the time that had passed. Yet that didn't seem to matter to her. Yes, you can. Her hand found mine and squeezed. Her sincerity struck me to the core. How could it be that three years had passed and still she acted as though I was still important enough to cancel plans for. She released my hand, folded her arms, and took on a battle stance. Listen, tell me why you're here. On the roadside? My poor attempt at humor won me an eye roll. Why are you in Bridgewater? She clarified, gesturing to the road sign indicating the town was just a right turn away. I expelled a breath, and with it, some more of the tension that had seized me during the drive loosened its hold. Grandpa Toby died. And? I closed my eyes, shutting out the swaying sunflowers. The email Aunt Sarah sent had outlined every detail. And he left me Havenwood Farm and all its land. Over 300 acres. I couldn't manage anything like that, not when I was situated in Oregon State with my job. I had a good life there, a life free from panic attacks and traumatic memories. I'd had hours of therapy to help me deal with the accident and didn't need everything recurring now, not when I'd worked so hard to make it stop, dang it. I sent a prayer heavenward. Dear God, help me get myself back again. I was here to pay respects to Grandpa, take care of appraising the property and get it listed. A week, tops. I could handle a week here. That was what I kept telling myself anyway. Obviously, the self part of me wasn't listening. One step at a time, Beck said, placing her hand on my shoulder. Huh? She waited until I brought my gaze to hers and continued. You've already made it this far. That's huge. Now we move on from here. We're just going into town, that's all. Then to my house before I get you to Aunt Sarah's. That's all you need to worry about for now. That's your goal. Aunt Sarah's.
I repeated. At a girl. What do you say? Main Street's first. Main Street. I nodded, disbelieving just how much I needed her encouragement and reassurance, and glad for it all the same. There you go. You ready? She was falsely bright, but I wouldn't falter that. I tried to match her smile. Thanks, Bex, I said, while repeating just to Main Street in my head over and over. Surprisingly, more tension loosened. My airways cleared. The sunflowers arched to me this time, nodding their approval. Bex climbed into her van, and I found that I could too. She shifted into gear, but paused before pulling back onto the off-ramp. Tell you what, she said. Tonight, we make a night of it. Tyra's working at the Elkhorn. She's dying to see you. She's the new bartender there. Drinks, cake, girl talk, maybe some karaoke. How does that sound? I was encouraged. I could handle that, I said. She talked some more about her kids, about how hard it was sending Paisley to preschool, and chatting about the impossibility of finding a decent nail salon since What's-Her-Name closed her shop. And I knew she was rambling to keep me distracted as we rounded the bend, the road curving in its familiar way past several businesses to reveal Bridgewater in all its tiny town glory. It was like coming back in time. Or better still, it was as though, while the rest of the world was moving on, changing and advancing, Bridgewater was frozen somewhere in the 1900s. A line of buildings to the left introduced the Elkhorn Cafe and Pete's Malt Shop in conjoined buildings whose exterior resembled the Wild West, with dark slats of wood and squared-off boxy false fronts above railed porches that provided a walkway between the two establishments. An old church that no one went to, a little way down past a few more buildings, a closed-off building that used to be a gas station when I was a kid, but had its doors and windows shuttered for years. Venturing farther into the town, the buildings looked the same as though I'd left yesterday rather than three years ago. The only distinguishing difference was that the corners of structures like the insurance agency and the dress shop now had crumbling stucco and signs of peeling paint. Everywhere I looked, every shop window, the street lamps, even the sign of the old movie theater turned dentist office, was drenched with memory. Bex stared at me. And I realized not only had she pulled up in front of the insurance agency where her brother worked, but she'd also asked me a question. Hmm? Sorry? I said, fumbling for the handle. I need to step out again. Sure, she said, shifting into park. Cody will come out when he sees us here. Take all the time you need. My shoes crunched the leaves that had collected in the gutter. I basked in the warm air breathed in the slight scent of burning chimney smoke and fallen leaves, while memories slammed into me on every side. I closed my eyes and attempted to bring my mantra back up again. We'd made it to Main Street. What was next? Bex's house. Bex's house. I can make it to Bex's. I pivoted, turning my face to the sun, allowing the warm air to clear the emotions contaminating my insides, when I collided hard with a firm torso and the scent of something earthy and woody, with the faintest hint of sky. Whoa there, the man said, gripping my arms to keep me upright. My eyes flashed open. For a moment, I was met with blue eyes, freckles, and a handsome, heart-thudding smile that both infiltrated and haunted every thought I had. It was a face I thought I'd never see again, and disbelief dominated while my thoughts attempted to keep up. A blink later, the vision vanished, and the man's eyes changed and settled from blue to warmest brown. The freckles darkened into smooth tan skin with a few light scars and shaded by soft stubble. The smile, though? That smile was shaped by a different pair of lips, 
yet somehow it still made my heart knock into my ribs. I'd say I didn't see you there, but I think it was the other way around, he said. The voice was all wrong too. Friendly, joking even, but at a lower timbre than the voice my ears were trained to hope to hear. Embarrassment flooded my cheeks. I hurriedly backed away, tucking my hair behind my ears and wishing I wasn't a basket case right now. Sorry about that, I said, not sure what explanation I could give. Not a problem. He jutted his fingers into his pocket and examined me. You must be new in town. Haven't seen your face here before. Oh, I... I hadn't planned on anyone here not knowing who I was. I supposed after a three-year absence, others would have moved in. With how unchanged the town appeared to be, I assumed the people in it would be that way too. Before I could answer, the door to the insurance agency jangled open, and a boy about seven years old came skipping out. I peered over to find Bex waving him to her, and the pieces connected. Cody's cotton so big, I said on a breath. Bex and I kept in touch online, so I'd seen pictures. But still, it was different equating a face with their image in person. Hey there, Cody, the man said, stopping the boy on his path to the van. Maybe you can help me out. How can I do that? Cody asked. The man tucked his thumbs into his belt loops. This lady seems to know you. Mind telling me your name? Cody inspected me for a few moments and then wrinkled his nose into a grimace or a squint to block out the sun. I wasn't sure which. I don't know her, he said in pure innocence, skipping toward his mom's waiting van. More heat flooded my cheeks, though I wasn't sure why. While this man was good-looking, with an attractive set of shoulders, his slightly husky scent of cedar wood drifting to me with the breeze, and I liked the look of his hands as they crossed his chest to rest on his biceps. I wasn't here to meet anyone. No better time to make that fact clear. There you have it, I said, turning to follow the boy's direction. The van door was already sliding to a close behind him. The man took a step and intercepted me with a hand. Wait up. You're not going to tell me either? His mom's in a hurry and she's my ride, I said. Sorry, I added. He placed a hand behind his neck and didn't take his eyes from mine. She knocks into me, won't tell me her name, and she's sorry. I'll be here for about a week. I cursed myself the minute the words left my mouth. What was I doing? This was no time for sympathy chatting. And I just sounded like the conclusion of a bad comedic act. But um bum, crash. Thanks, folks. I'll be here all week. Maybe I'll see you around, I added, as an attempt to cover my faux pas, only to hear the hopeful implication in my voice. It sounded like I wanted to meet up with him later, which was so not the case. Oh, I'm counting on it, he winked, and my stomach did a flip. I climbed into the van, and hard as I tried to act unaffected, my traitorous eyes drifted in his direction anyway. He remained where he was, one hand on his side. He watched Bex back up, giving a motionless wave as we drove away. What was that? Bex said with a cheeky grin. That? I said, clicking in the seatbelt, was nothing. If you say so. Bex was momentarily distracted, backing out onto the street. But I folded my arms, cursing the whole situation, my stupidity included. He could count on seeing me around, I supposed, but that didn't mean anything would come of it. I couldn't handle any distractions while I was here. I was going to get Grandpa Toby's property taken care of, and then I was gone. Chapter 2 Bex didn't stop smirking the whole 30-second drive through town and to one of Bridgewater's few suburban streets. To make matters worse, my brain was caught on the man's handsome features, friendly manner, and insistence on knowing my name. 
Who was that, anyway? I asked. Luke Holden, she said, turning down Leafland Avenue. Luke. I tried connecting his last name with someone else I may have known before, but nothing clicked. I don't remember any Holdens being here before, I said, hoping she read my interest as purely informational, which it was. That's because there weren't any. He moved to town shortly after you left. Let me guess, the town flirt? He's kind of reclusive, actually. Lots of women talk about him, wondering why he keeps to himself so much. I've never seen him flirt with anyone like that before. Truth be told, I don't know much about him. But he watched you walk away and didn't take his eyes off you until you climbed back into my van. She punctuated the statement by breaking for a squirrel that had skittered into the road. Danger passed, she continued down the street. Yeah, because I smashed right into him. I said. A man doesn't recover quickly from an impact like that. From her smile and tone, I knew her words were meant to be lighthearted, but they played on the wrong sentiment, especially considering the emotional difficulties I'd been battling just being here. I sighed and rested my head against the seat. Bex's mouth dropped open. She reached for my knee. Oh, Belle, I'm so sorry. That was totally heartless. I shouldn't have said it. Tears welled in my eyes. What was my problem? It's all right, I lied. I need to face it sometime, right? Maybe talking about it will help. I shook my head, lifting my eyes and widening them to dry the tears that hadn't yet fallen. I keep seeing him everywhere here. Even meeting Luke, I was deluded enough to imagine his face instead. Well, you loved him. You were going to marry him. She was right. It was just that I'd tried everything I could to erase Eli Combs from my mind. He was gone. It was my fault. And no amount of mourning or longing could change either of those things. I was better off letting him go so I determined to do just that. Three years ago, I couldn't even face the graveside service for Eli. I hadn't been able to bring myself to go to his funeral. Instead, once I was well enough, I had stuffed all the memorabilia from the years I'd spent loving him into a cardboard box and crammed that box into my closet. Then I'd hastily packed some clothes and a few things I thought I might need, and scribbled a note to Grandpa that I was leaving. I'd hoped Grandpa could understand how badly I needed to get away from everything. From my shame. From the place where Eli had breathed his last breath. From the disappointment and judgment emanating toward me from all sides, and the fact that everywhere I looked reminded me of him. I'd left as much of him behind as I could, it wasn't fair that I now had to come back and have it all shoved in my face again. The man I'd loved for so long. The life I'd wanted to have. All of it was too painful. And yet, I had no recourse. Where are you staying? Bex asked. I haven't decided yet, I told her honestly. According to the email Aunt Sarah had sent, the Havenwood farmhouse had been bequeathed to me. That meant staying there was the most logical option, and I knew I'd have to make my way up there eventually before I left again. That didn't mean I had to go up there right away, though. I thought I'd get a room at the Frontier. Does Tisha Brady still run it? She does, Beck said, and it's as cute as ever thanks to her. By rights, the woman should go into interior design or something, if we ever build a new house, I'm hiring her to help me spiff it up. But you don't have to go to Tisha's. You can stay with me if you want. I don't want to impose, I told her. Not at all, she said. In fact, I've been planning on it. And we have Cody's room all ready for you. Bex turned onto Applecroft Street and into the driveway of one of the small homes situated there. Trees lined both sides, giving the street a tunnel effect. 
Leaves littered front yards, cloaking any hints of grass and creating small orange mountains that gave me a strange urge to run through and start kicking just to see the leaves fly. Your house is cute, Bex, I said, stepping out and staring at the brick bungalow. She and Rock had lived in the same place since they married right out of high school. This is it, she spoke sardonically, as though she'd accepted that fact but didn't like it much. Interesting. Was she unhappy here? I'd never gotten that impression before. Then again, the last time I'd been to this house, it had belonged to Rock's mom, Lila. Cody blazed into the house the minute the side door opened. Bex got her baby, Sophia, from her car seat, and I helped little Paisley down from the other side. I have stars on my shirt, Paisley informed me with delight. I couldn't help my smile. Looks like they match the stars in your eyes, I told her. She beamed at me with her cherubic cheeks, and I was struck at her likeness to her mother. She had the same blonde hair and vibrant eyes, feathered by eyelashes that would make gluons jealous. The smoothness of her skin and the brightness in her smile were striking. Clearly not as affected by me as I was by her, Paisley tottered off in the direction Cody had taken, climbing the cement steps with effort for her little legs and taking the steps one at a time. Paisley is completely adorable, I told her truthfully, slinging the diaper bag and my purse onto my shoulder. Bex adjusted Sophia higher onto her hip and gave a tired smile. Thanks, she is. She is also completely inquisitive and will annoy you to no end with all her questions. She's in the why stage. She asks why about everything. Sounds like she loves learning, I said. Yeah, she does. Bex tapped the button to close the van door. Don't get me wrong. They're so fun. I love my kids. I know you do, I said, following her inside. We entered through the side door Cody had taken and stepped into a squat but cozy kitchen. The small house was beautifully cluttered, smudges on the doors near the handles, drawings that hadn't yet been scrubbed from the walls, toys strung along the carpet and walkways. But I'm just tired, Beck said, closing the door behind us. She gestured to the chair and I set the diaper bag there and turned to find her placing the baby in the high chair by the table. Sympathy struck me. I felt suddenly selfish for being stuck in my own non-existent problems where here Beck seemed to be battling her own. I don't have any kids yet, I told her, but I can only imagine the pressure of having others rely solely on you for their care. It's a lot, Beck said, retrieving milk from the fridge and pouring some into an awaiting bottle. Sophia clapped happily at the sight, made a cooing noise, and then pounded her tray, kicking her little legs. Bex mimicked a few of her baby noises lovingly, earning a toothy grin in return before handing Sophia her bottle. Like a plug, the instant Sophia guided the bottle to her mouth, all noises stopped except for those that accompanied her drinking. Bex poured a few finger food items onto the tray, including what looked like freeze-dried fruits and peas. She stroked Sophia's hair, gave the baby another loving smile, and then sank onto the chair at the table, gesturing for me to follow. You look like you're doing an amazing job, I said. Aw, thanks. I do what I can. Really, the most stressful thing in my life right now is the heyday pumpkin walk. They're still doing that? The heyday pumpkin walk was a weekend-long event that had been started to celebrate the end of harvest. But as most potato and sugar beet farmers were still harvesting their crops mid to late October, and it was much colder and sometimes snowy by the time harvest actually ended, the date for the walk had been moved up and become more of a fall celebration. They are, Beck said. It's this Friday and Saturday, and I'm on the committee. What did you do that for? Bex laughed at my lighthearted question. I got suckered into the PTA at the start of school this year, trying to support Cody as much as I can, you know. And one night at our meeting, they announced Bev Walcott was stepping down as head chairwoman, and I got nominated. You could have said no, I told her. 
She slid a smirk in my direction. You clearly haven't been to a PTA meeting. I laughed, and Bex joined in. The release felt good and eased the lingering dregs of anxiety I'd been battling since I got to town. Distractions were good. Talking about something else entirely helped immensely. And if that meant laughing at my friend's expense... Kidding. Sort of. What about Rock? I asked. Does he mind that you're on the committee? Sophia lowered her bottle, slamming it against the tray with a little laugh as she scooped a handful of freeze-dried strawberries with a chubby fist. Bex reached and uprighted the bottle. Nah, he doesn't mind, she said. She peered out the window to the leaf-infested sidewalk. A navy blue pickup truck pulled up out front, looking too nice for the street around them. In fact, I think he's here now. Strange. Usually he doesn't get home this early. Rock trudged in. While Bex was two years older than I was, Rock had a few years on her. His skin was tanned and leathery, a tuft of beard scratched his chin, and he had dirt caked on his pants. The smell of sweat was instantaneous. Regardless, Bex rose and strolled to greet him with a kiss on his cheek. Everything okay? Bex asked. Tractor broke down, he said, opening his hands and displaying the dirt and grease on them. Dallin killed the thing, and that sucks because I get to fix it. My brows rose at his gruffness, but the report didn't bother Bex. She gave him an encouraging smile. No one's better at that than you. Rock grunted, not replying to his wife's positive response. Da, da, da. Sophia said happily from her high chair, but her dad ignored the baby's happy reaction to him, his glower drifting to me. Haven't seen you around here for a while, he said. Yeah, I said, not sure what to reply. He had to have heard about Grandpa's funeral. I worried my lip, reacting to the tension rippling from him. I wasn't sure why, and while I was sure Rock wouldn't mind... I didn't really want to stay here and get in the middle of anything, or add to his stress in any way. He and I had never been on the best of terms, not even when Bex had dated him in high school. By that time, Rock had already graduated. It was entirely possible he found me an annoyance, like a bothersome kid sister who was always hanging around his girlfriend. I was surprised when Bex had announced they'd eloped after she graduated. Her grandpa's funeral is in two days, Bex supplied. I picked her up from Twin Falls not an hour ago. You drove clear to Twin today, he said with disapproval. I squirmed. Bex had offered to pick me up and I'd accepted, not thinking it was an inconvenience because of her friendly insistence that it was no problem. She needed a ride and I offered, Bex said defensively. She lifted her chin. I'm going to pay for her gas, I told him, suddenly wanting to be anywhere but here. Was he this menacing all the time? I wondered if it wasn't just the PTA and the festival committee weighing on Bex's shoulders. If she was dealing with an unhappy husband, that carried an emotional burden all on its own. An uncomfortable silence clouded the kitchen. Even Sophia seemed to be aware of it. Her happy babbling and cooing had ceased. Shouting traveled from down the hall, and within seconds Paisley appeared, her small hands raised. Daddy! She cried. Rox's gruffness faded as he bent to greet his daughter, and I sidled closer to Bex. You know, I still have my old room at the farmhouse. I think I'll just stay there, I told her. Thank you for the offer but I also need to stop in and talk to Aunt Sarah about the inheritance before I head up there. You'll have plenty of time to do that, Bex argued. Really, grumpy is Rock's default setting. I'd love to have you stay. Cody's fine to sleep in Paisley's room. You can sleep there. She smiled as though the concept was humorous. The idea didn't seem fair to the little boy who had come into the room and was laughing at something his little sister had said. I'll be all right. Aunt Sarah will want to catch up with me anyway. 
although I wasn't looking forward to that part of things. I'd sequestered myself good and distant in Oregon for a reason. Aunt Sarah would undoubtedly ask all kinds of personal questions I wasn't ready to answer. Bex acted as if she wanted to argue some more, but I wouldn't back down. I wasn't lying about wanting some space and solitude. This did, however, present another problem. When Bex had offered to pick me up from the airport, I'd declined, mainly on the grounds that I would need a vehicle to get me around, at least until I got up to the farmhouse. Bex had then offered the use of their second car, which I hadn't yet seen. If Rock was that upset about her driving to Twin Falls to pick me up, I wasn't about to ask if the offer to borrow his old car still stood. You're still up for our night out tonight, though, right? Bex asked. Rock's gruff voice cut in. He'd returned to his full height after talking to Cody and Paisley. Where are you going tonight? Bex straightened her shoulders, unaffected by his tone. Either she was used to him talking this way, or she wasn't in the mood to back down under whatever mood he was in. It's Belle's first night back, she said. I already worked things out. We're going to hit up some karaoke. Karaoke. I wasn't sure what it was, but something in his tone affected the air itself, stringing it tight through the entire room. The kids stilled as if they recognized the tone as well, and their eyes widened. We have a girls' night, Beck said, unperturbed. I made plans. Who's watching the kids? I had plans of my own. Beck slung her purse on her shoulder. Get your mom to watch them. Belle is having a rough time, and I told her I'd take her out. His nostrils flared, and his gaze darted to me as though just realizing I was there. And that look in his eyes. I wish she had left me out of it. I didn't want to cause any more problems between them than there already apparently were. She'd never mentioned anything about her marriage being as rocky as her husband's name, but something was off here. He grumbled, swore, and then stormed out. It's really okay, I told her, wanting to do anything I could to ease the friction swirling in the Cutler household. We don't have to go tonight. Rock's always got his boxers in a twist about something. He'll be fine. I'll figure out someone to watch the kids. Here. She dangled the keys between us. I don't think he'll like me borrowing your car much. It's just to get you around for a few days. He won't even know it's gone. It's fine, I promise. I stopped her. I couldn't let her insist, not this time. If you can drop me off at Aunt Sarah's, she can get me to the farmhouse. Once I'm there, I can drive Old Blue. Really. You know Rock hates me. I'm not comfortable borrowing your car. It's fine. From her rapid smile, I could tell she was trying a little too hard to be her usual perky self. Bex. I couldn't bring myself to mention my concern for her and her kids. She put on a good front, that was for sure. She was still on her way out the door. We stepped outside, and then she stopped when she saw the worry on my face. Bex returned. I'm sorry. I know your emotions are on edge, but everything is okay, I promise. Rock's a little rough around the edges, but he's just had a bad day. He'll get over it. Ten years from now. She laughed, as though expecting me to join in. I didn't. I didn't see how I could. Bex didn't back down from her laughter, lifting the mood enough that my chest lightened, too. She was right. My emotions were unsettled. Maybe I was reading too much into the situation. Karaoke? I asked. We can do it another time. You may be able to pass on our girls' night out that quick, but I need a night out too, she winked. That changed things. I'd been so consumed with my panic attack over returning to a place I really didn't want to be, I didn't take a minute to consider what kind of pain my bestie was going through too. For you then, I said, breathing a little easier. Chapter 3 
In all reality, Bridgewater was small enough we could have walked and gotten to Aunt Sarah's in minutes, but my suitcase was another matter. It's good for Rock to have to watch the kids once in a while, Bex went on, climbing behind the driver's seat and talking about the juggle they dealt with on a regular basis when it came to their kids. How Rock's long hours in agriculture made her grateful his family was nearby to help watch the kids when she needed it. I did my best to listen, but I struggled to hide my astonishment. I'd always pictured marriage to be the kind of thing that worked if two people loved each other. But from the sound of things, Rock was a little too focused on work and going out with his friends, rather than sticking around to help out around his house. What would draw a man to neglect his family like that, and then get angry when his wife brought the matter to his attention? It was strange to think that if the accident had never happened, I'd be married now too, with a home and possibly a trail of kids lined up behind me like ducklings. Would we have been happy like I'd always imagined? How did someone go about having a happy marriage? Not something I needed or wanted to worry about right now. The drive to Aunt Sarah's took a matter of seconds. Her double-level home with sky-blue siding struck another pang of nostalgia, its yard manicured and cleared of the leaves that littered so many others' yards. The windows glistened, the bushes perfectly squared, the flower beds free from invaders, the rose bushes within trimmed and ready for the coming winter. Even the delicate statue of a Victorian woman holding an umbrella appeared to be scrubbed clean in its position where the front walk met the porch steps. Aunt Sarah always was pristine in her cleaning and organization. Disgustingly so. I thanked Bex again, and after agreeing to meet at the Elkhorn at 8.30, closed the door and wheeled my suitcase behind me up Aunt Sarah's perfect sidewalk where traces of fallen leaves were non-existent, because they'd been eradicated from the face of the lawn the instant they fell. The porch even had a floral rug on it that I knew for a fact Aunt Sarah vacuumed weekly, if not daily. It was wide enough to fit an intimate metal table and chairs with elegant coiled wrought iron. Several decorative painted signs wished me a happy fall and were accentuated by a cluster of pumpkins arranged just so, and ornamented by joyful, perfectly coordinated sprays of plastic, glittery foliage. The doorbell's cordial chime had the effect of a mallet to my heart's bass drum. It pounded out an uneven but frantic rhythm, though I was doing nothing more than standing there. Several moments passed before the door swung open, adding a gust of a floral incense along with it. Bell! Aunt Sarah's face was delighted at the sight of me lifting my spirits and making my insides sink all at once. I felt like the prodigal son, happy to be so wanted, but chagrined because I didn't deserve it. Her hair was cropped short like always, and she wore a trendy, long-sleeved navy blue shirt with several bracelets placed over the sleeve to be more visible. Grandma had told me Aunt Sarah and my mom looked extremely similar, mahogany brown hair just like mine. But as my mom had died when I was two, all I had were pictures to prove that fact. She pulled me into a swift hug, pouring more of her floral smell over me. How are you? I could tell she wasn't just talking about Grandpa's passing, but since the accident, too. Even though three years had passed, Ever since I got here, it seemed like the time I'd been gone had been only days. I hugged her back. It felt indescribably good to be hugged, like a mother would. There were other times Aunt Sarah had tried filling in that role, helping me learn to tweeze my eyebrows or shave my legs, or even shopping for a prom dress. While it wasn't by any means new, her house was immaculately clean and orderly, giving the impression of newness. I was just about to get some water, she said. Would you like some? I'd love that. Go ahead and leave your suitcase by the door. She directed me to sit at her rounded kitchen table, left for a few moments, and then returned with a bottle of water and a manila folder stuffed full like a sandwich. 
Tell me how you've been, she said, making me realize I hadn't answered the question when she posed it earlier. She settled in the chair beside me and slid a plate of cookies my way. I couldn't help my smile. It was so Aunt Sarah of her. She was the living definition of homemaker, short of walking around in heels while she vacuumed, though something told me she'd rock that too. Whenever I'd come over, she always made sure I had a full stomach. That fact hadn't changed, even though I was no longer ten years old. Good, I said, knowing the one-word blanket response wouldn't be enough for her, but hoping it would be just the same. Unable to resist the pull of chocolate, I reached for one of her cookies and took a bite. The cookie was the perfect softness, and chocolate oozed over my tongue like temptation. I let out a little moan. These are as amazing as ever. I'm glad to hear it. Now, come on, girl, she said, scooting her chair closer and placing her warm, too soft hand on mine. Tell me, where do you work these days up there in Oregon? I write marketing content for a company in Portland. Other businesses come to us if they need blurbs for their product marketing pages on retail sites, and I write them. Interesting. You always did like writing. And you like living in Portland? I do, I said. I've got my own place and can set my own hours, which is nice. It's why I was able to take some time off to come here. My boss had been supportive enough when I told him I was taking off, but he'd made it clear he looked forward to having me come back. Odd as it was, he liked having us come into the office as much as possible, said it was easier to communicate that way, though what was easier than texting or emails? I'm glad to hear that. Lee and Allie are coming either today or tomorrow for the funeral. They'll be happy to see you. It'll be nice to see them, I said, meaning it. I hadn't been close to either of my cousins, but they were friendly enough. I can't believe Lee moved away from here. You know, I hoped she and her family would settle close, but they had to go where the jobs are. And there aren't many of those around here, I said with a smile. At a population of 350, Bridgewater was as small as towns come. If you weren't in agriculture or didn't already own a business around here, the chances of finding a job were slim. Lee had married a few years before, and as far as I knew, Allie wasn't quite that settled. She'd opened a boutique store in a neighboring town. For a moment, I wondered if either of my cousins were included in Grandpa's will the same way I was, and if so, what they'd received. I already knew what I'd inherited as his main beneficiary, and my palms clammed up at the approach to the topic. Aunt Sarah tapped the manila folder with a bright red fingernail. I guess we'll get to it, she said. She opened the folder and lifted the top paper, handing it to me. The deed to Havenwood Farm, she said. As you can see, here it outlines that you are the recipient of the land. She skimmed past the last will and testament verbiage to the section labeled Properties and Assets, and then Beneficiaries. Despite the fact Grandma and Grandpa had three living children, I was listed first. Aunt Sarah pointed to the line delineating the fact that the farm— including almost 300 acres, would go to me. And the house. She summarized other beneficiaries, including herself and the things she'd inherited, a sum of money Grandpa had invested, and what her brothers, Uncle Thomas and Uncle Marvin, had inherited, a cabin Grandma and Grandpa owned in Island Park. Other things were itemized, including furniture and personal possessions. The girls and I would like to come get a few things that were left to us. He left the piano to Lee, but we can talk about when to handle all of that after the funeral. Makes sense, I said. Honestly, it didn't matter to me what others inherited, not when I wasn't planning on keeping the house at all. The animals will need looking after, and frankly, so does the house. Daddy's got a renter there now who doubles as a farmhand, and even though he's living in the old shed, 
Once you move in, it's probably not the most appropriate thing to live there while a single man is also living on the premises. I'm not moving there, I told her. Aunt Sarah's mouth dropped. She stared at me so long I began to squirm under her judgmental scrutiny. You're not? Why ever not? My job in Oregon, for one thing. She waited, as if for me to list more reasons I couldn't come back. But really, that was all it was. My job. And the memories threatening to eat me alive at every turn. That right there was reason enough. Why can't you have that here, too? Aunt Sarah said. You should have the house. It was your home. And besides, you deserve to have such a treasure. They don't build homes like that anymore. It's got some genuine intricacies you won't want to let fall into someone else's hands. Don't tell me you're thinking about selling such a valuable heirloom. It would wind up with someone who doesn't appreciate it the way you and I do. Like Uncle Thomas. He wants to make it into something impersonal, like an Airbnb, if you can believe it. It'd destroy the heart of the place, commercializing it like that. She wasn't wrong. But at the same time, I could see the potential there, too. The farmhouse had so much space. It would be a shame to waste it on a single woman like me. I opened my mouth to argue, but she went on, pulling another piece of paper out. Besides, Daddy also left you his land, which, believe me, your uncle is probably salivating to get his hands on. Do you know how much land 300 acres is? Probably enough to build the town of Bridgewater on all over again. Actually, I do. And why didn't you tell me this before? He didn't leave any to you? Why didn't Uncle Thomas and Uncle Marvin get some too? They got their fair share. Daddy invested well, believe me. And as for me, my inheritance is enough. You got the land, sweetheart. Land that's paid for. Don't turn your back on a gift like that. I couldn't fathom what she meant by this. What am I supposed to do with it? I don't farm. And I didn't intend to pick it up anytime soon. You do what Daddy did in his later years. Rent that land out. Local farmers are always looking for more land to tend. In fact, he had quite a few people lined up using his land now, and they're probably already thinking ahead to lease it again for next year's harvest. Or, not that I know all that much about this, but there are ranchers out there that need grass and pasture land for their cattle. That could possibly be an option, too. Though I think for a farm to be considered a ranch, the amount of land available has to be a bit more. In any case, you'll learn enough on rent. All you need to worry about is covering property tax and water, and then whatever living expenses you have, of course. Utilities, food, gas, that kind of thing. This was a completely different arena than the one I currently cantered in. Disbelief and denial settled in hard and fast. I couldn't picture myself working as a landlord for farmers or ranchers. Her tone stilled. Just think about it, Belle. You move back here, rent out this land, and manage the honeymoon farm. You'll be set for life. You'd never have to work again. Not with all that rent money coming in. You could do anything you wanted to. The notion inflated possibilities inside of me. I could look into writing for myself rather than for companies. It was something I'd thought of doing before but never saw it as a lucrative option. Or there was writing. I'd loved my horse growing up, but had left him at the farmhouse because I knew I'd never be able to afford the board and maintenance. The prospects were rose-colored and sounded too good to be true. And usually, when something sounded too good to be true, it was. I couldn't process it. Yet, at the same time, in my heart, I knew she was right. I'd be an idiot to pass this up. But I didn't want the farm. I turned away from that reality. I could sell the house and the land like I intended. That would situate me for life just as much as keeping everything would. 
but she was right. Grandma and Grandpa's honeymoon farm was a family heirloom. Memories thrived there, too. And they weren't all bad or painful. Well, start thinking on it, she said, collecting papers and stacking them together on the table before enclosing them in the folder. No need to decide right this second. Why don't you go on up to the property and reintroduce yourself to the honeymoon house? See if it's somewhere you can make a home for yourself. You know everyone in this town loves you and would be pleased as punch to have you come back. Live in Bridgewater? A town where memory and heartache were one and the same? I didn't respond because I doubted everyone would be pleased as punch. In fact, the fewer people I interacted with while I was here, the better. Do you mind giving me a ride up there? I figured I could drive Old Blue around until it's time to go. Sure, honey, Aunt Sarah said. Anything I can do to help with the funeral? I probably should have asked sooner. Better late than never. You let me worry about that. Would you like to say a few words? I thought it over for only moments. Speaking at the funeral went against my intention to avoid interactions with people. It was enough that I was going at all, especially when I hadn't been able to face the last funeral they'd held for someone I loved. I don't think so, I said with a twinge of guilt. Would Grandpa even want me speaking at his funeral? I'd let him down. I was sure of it. Just like I'd let everyone else down. The thought was a choking one. But I'd kept myself closed off from everything that had reminded me of Eli in any way, and that had included Grandpa. I hadn't meant to. Had I ever told him in person how much he meant to me? How grateful I was that he'd taken me in and raised me? Aunt Sarah smiled. We'll plan on it. And I think it might be easier for both of us if you just borrow my car while you're here. It's probably more reliable than Old Blue. She winked and handed me a set of keys. These things happen for a reason. You get on up to the farmhouse and remind yourself just what you'd be missing if you sold it. I felt infinitely more comfortable borrowing a car from her than from Bex. Yet, for some reason, it didn't loosen the wedge in my chest anymore. Thanks, Aunt Sarah, I said, taking the keys. She offered the manila folder as well. It loomed before me like a road sign at a crossroads. This wasn't a decision I was ready to make yet. Taking the folder doesn't mean you're agreeing to anything, I told myself. That gave me the willpower and ability to lift my hand and close my fingers over the folder's edges. It weighed a thousand pounds, but I managed to pocket the keys and hug the folder on my way to her front door and my suitcase. Once in Aunt Sarah's exquisitely clean and freshly vacuumed car, I made my way past the bend in the road that signaled the end of Bridgewater proper. The view opened up to the mountains, arching their backs in a huge, breathtaking, never-ending expanse of farmland spreading out to touch its toes. It was rustic and rousing, and had the same effect on me as standing near the ocean had, reminding me of the importance to slow down and see where I fit in all that space, beckoning me to explore. The only thing out here now was a single gas station, scattered ranches, and a little ways beyond the road to the ski resort. I passed the gas station and traveled on before taking the dirt road beside a copse of trees I'd recognize anywhere. The road changed, inclined and slimmed down to a single lane. At the fork, I refused to glance to the left any longer than to check if the road was clear. That way led to the cemetery and the train bridge. If I thought the town was hard, the train bridge was an explosion in my brain which should have been my answer right there. How could I keep the farmhouse? Move here? Live so close to the site where the love of my life had been taken from me? I'd been raised to believe just as Aunt Sarah had said. 
things happened for a reason. And usually the reason was because God was guiding my steps. But I didn't see how I could accept that logic anymore. Aunt Sarah meant well, but she didn't understand just what she was asking of me. My answer was settled. God had to know. I couldn't do it. I couldn't keep the house. The wooden fences were crumbling a little more than they had been the last time I was here. Though, from the look of things, someone had started replacing the logs and reinforcing the fencing. They were a brighter color than the weather-worn paddocks I'd known. The shed providing shelter for the horses looked a little worse for wear, too, as did the barn. I crawled past, taking in the sights of the meadow pastures and the fencing, the chicken coop, the segment fur. I slowed for a better look, gripping the wheel and squinting. Llamas? I said, sizing up their shaggy, horse-like bodies and funny expressions. When did Grandpa get llamas? In any case, the road curved again, and my body had a jarring reaction as though I'd stuck a fork into a light socket and held on, sizzling and trembling, making my nerves stand on end. There it was, the place Grandpa had long ago dubbed the Honeymoon Cottage, because he'd inherited it when he'd married Grandma. The house wasn't a cottage at all, not with seven bedrooms and a handful of bathrooms. It had enough space to accommodate a growing family like Bex's. Not for me. I let the car crawl along the rounded dirt drive up to the line of weeds where I used to park in high school and shifted into park. I stepped out, as if in a daze, and stilled. Among the hiss of insects and the swagger of the few leaves still bragging about being on the branches overhead, the montage of the barn in its quintessential red, the chickens foraging the ground within their pen, and the bleeding goats. I closed my eyes and breathed. I drank in the aromas of earth and animals, of wood and rust and leaves, and the slightest traces of lemon. I needed to orient myself, to brace myself for what I knew awaited me. Chapter 4 I swept my gaze across several discarded pieces of equipment that clustered near the barn, along with neglected, rusted wagon wheels that had been there seemingly since the dawn of time, and flower boxes left for dead, and let my eyes descend on the house. Nostalgia struck in torrents, making me resonate with it. The porch alone was worth investing in. It wrapped around the entire house and then angled out in a hexagonal shape at the main door like an unwalled beehive. I loved the silhouette of the place. The pointed dormers on the roof, the occasional rounded windows that added character and variety from the other typical, expected rectangular windows. And because of those dormers, many of the upstairs spaces had unusual slants to their ceilings. I approached the porch and climbed the steps, pocketing the car keys Aunt Sarah had given me. I wondered if I'd need to unearth my house keys from my suitcase. They weren't anything I'd had much use of before. Using keys to enter seemed wrong. Even after Grandma's passing, Grandpa had always been there, and the door had always been open to anyone who came out this far. What looked like a handcrafted rocking chair creaked a few times in the space where the porch widened. When had Grandpa gotten that? It wasn't here the last time I was. Pity, too. Grandma would have loved sitting out on the porch on something like that and shooting the breeze on a summer evening. I opened the door, bracing myself. No noises rattled from the kitchen. No shouts of greeting from whatever corner of the house Grandpa had sequestered himself in. In place of the crooning western music he loved, silence reigned. The only time I'd heard the house this quiet was in the middle of the night. And even then, Grandpa's snores filtered through like lumberjacks at work. 
exhaustion, and sadness took over my body. I crumpled to the bench just inside the door, hugging one of Grandma's throw pillows to my chest and clenching my body just as tightly, trying to keep myself together when it felt like everything was falling apart. It didn't take long before my grief gave way to slumber. My eyes were sore when I awoke. My chest felt as though someone had taken to it with whittling knives, determined to carve me from the inside out. My stomach growled and I checked the clock, worried I'd missed my girls' night out with Bex. I still had an hour. It turned out Grandpa's hot water hadn't yet been shut off, so I put it to good use, hosing away dregs of stress from my very bones the instant I stepped into the shower in my old bathroom upstairs. I probably stayed in the spray too long, but I relished the soothing heat, wishing I could take it with me as I stepped out to dry off and dress. I picked a pair of jeans and a soft sweater, dried and styled my hair, and readied my face with mascara and powder. Slightly rejuvenated, I carried some of the sadness of Grandpa's passing with me down the stairs and out the door. Bridgewater didn't exactly have a nightlife. Most establishments closed at 6 p.m., though some owners were out locking their doors as I passed. Etta Miles at the dress shop, Kyle Wakefield, Bex's brother, stepping out and locking up the insurance agency. Teresa Gaines waved to me from the malt shop as she exited with a case of beverages in hand. Although I wasn't sure she waved specifically to me, or because everyone around here waved at passers-by regardless of who they were. Bex's van was already parked in front of the Elkhorn. I pulled into the empty space beside her, my stomach making itself known, and I hurried to lock Aunt Sarah's car. I was only a few minutes late. Hopefully Bex hadn't been waiting long. As I reached for the handle of the cafe's thick wooden door, Gina Hansen stepped out. Her smile fell, her mouth dropping. She tugged the sleeve of her husband Bill's jacket, pulling him to a stop. Bell Toby, is it really you? She yanked his sleeve again as though the man were blind and relying on her for direction. Look, Bill, it's Belle. It's me, I said, managing a smile. The delight in her face increased. I'm so glad you're back in town, though I'm so sorry for the reason. We all miss Hank. It sure crushed him when you took off without a word. She spared a glance for her husband who nodded in obligatory agreement. Hank missed you like crazy, Bill said. It's too bad he didn't get to see you again before he passed. It would have taken ratchet straps and a few zip ties to keep my smile in place, both of which were tools I didn't have. Indignation and hurt spilled through me, and I couldn't bring myself to reply. Well, you have a good night. Gina said, tapping my arm in a friendly manner as she passed. Bill's grimace was apologetic, and I wondered if he had any idea how hurtful the interaction had been. I threw open the door to the Elkhorn and stormed into the delectable smells of barbecue and the sounds of live acoustic guitar from the small platform the Hutchinsons installed to give local musicians a place to feature their talents. I recognized a few of the faces— a family sat at a table enjoying a meal. The Hillard sat at another table. And Emmett lifted his chin in my direction in greeting. I briefly acknowledged him before finding the face I was looking for. Bex was sitting at a stool at the bar, stirring the straw in her water glass and laughing at Tyra, who was wiping a glass with a towel. Tyra's black hair was painstakingly tied into hundreds of small braids laced with colorful ribbons. Sorry I'm late, I said, claiming the stool beside Bex. Hey, I was going to text you. Bex looked significantly different than she had a few hours before. Her blonde hair was curled loosely, and makeup accentuated her pretty eyes. The improvement had taken years off, and she looked significantly happier than she had before. 
though there was still a rim to her smile that hinted at all she was hiding. I waited for an update about who was watching her kids, but she smiled carelessly the way she used to. Maybe she'd been telling the truth earlier. People had bad days. I just happened to interrupt her household in the middle of one. You're here, Tyra said. She placed her glass down, hurried around the bar, and pulled me into a hug. So good to see you. You too, I told her. In high school, Tyra and Bex were seniors while I was a sophomore, but they still welcomed me into their duo anyway. I ordered for you, Bex said when I sat down again. Burger and fries. I hope that's okay. It's perfect, I said. I'm starving. Not ten minutes later, Tyra placed our plates in front of us. Lucky I'm working the bar tonight so I can hang out and talk with y'all at the same time, she said, her southern accent resonating through along with the term. Tyra had moved here from Alabama her freshman year. I agree, I said, digging into my burger. The blend of meat, cheese, and ketchup was delicious. I see you bumped into Gina and Bill on their way out, Beck said. Gina was asking if you were coming back to town. I am sure she was, I said, reaching for my root beer and taking a nice long sip. It cooled my head just enough that I took another long draft. Uh-oh, Tyra said. She cornered you, didn't she? Good old Gina, Bex added. I swear, when I get old, give me a hobby that has nothing to do with sticking my nose into other people's business. What did she say? Just how sad it was that I couldn't make it back before Grandpa died. I took another long sip. The icy beverage cooled its way down my throat. She means well, Tyra said. I'm sure she didn't mean for it to come out as a guilt trip. Yeah, Beck said, eating a fry. She could have been trying to pass on how much Hank loved you. I stared at the half circle of my bite marks on the burger. I know, but it completely slammed me instead. I already feel bad enough about that, you know? You didn't know what would happen, Tyra said kindly, leaning her elbows on the bar across from me. The pieced glass lantern over her head cast shadowed light on her pretty features. I know, but... My emotions cracked. I fought to speak through my thick throat. I was at the house today, and it's just not the same without him. I never grasped fully that he's really gone. But... A swallow. But he is. Bex placed a hand on my knee. He loved you, she said. He knew you loved him. You talked to him before he died, right? Tyra said turning away to refill another customer's drink before returning. Yeah, I said. We talked every week sometimes, but... My lip trembled. I didn't want to focus on losing Grandpa. That wasn't what tonight was about. I shook myself, inhaling and placing my palms on the bar. Dealing with Grandpa's death was one thing, but being back here at the Elkhorn was something else all on its own. Memories swarmed so thick I could hardly breathe. It was here that for the first time I realized Eli liked me as more than a friend. It was here that we had the first date we went on, karaoke night. Our first everything was here. I definitely needed a distraction. Since when did you start working as a bartender? I asked. Tyra had worked at the Elkhorn after school serving tables, but, obviously, she hadn't been old enough then to serve alcohol. I've been doing this for about two years now. I'm pretty good at it, too. Can I get you something? Maybe it's the edge you need tonight. I waited for Bex to argue against it. It was a school night. She needed to get home, get her kids to bed. But she and Tyra both watched me with their brows lifted in anticipation. I don't know, I said. I wasn't one to drink. I didn't like losing control over my inner workings the way alcohol made people do. I'll get y'all around, 
Tyra smirked. I'd better not, I said. Bex nudged me with her elbow. Come on, your grandpa just died. You accomplished a major thing by coming back to this town, something most people don't realize was extremely difficult. I mean, you've been struggling hard since you got here. Maybe it'll help. Would it help? Did alcohol ever help anyone? Then again, I'd do just about anything to help ease the voracious throb in my chest and the buzzing anxiety humming around the fringes of my existence. Tyra poured a round of vodka into shot glasses. Bex seemed edgy and anxious, and I hadn't forgotten her comment earlier about needing to get out. She acted eager for the numbing this would bring, and that did it for me. I wouldn't do this for me, I'd do this for her. I tipped one back, wincing at the resultant burn as the liquid made its way down my throat. And then another. And another. My mind grew hazier with every one that I tossed back. You know what you need, Tyra said. As she was on the job, she'd offered to be our designated driver. She maintained her post behind the bar, served another customer, and then came back. Meanwhile, Bex tipped back another shot, flinching as it went down. You need to get yourself a new man. I'll just saddle the next one who walks in the door then, I said, like it was that easy. The truth was, I didn't deserve love. Not after how I treated it the last time I'd had it. The bell over the door tinkled, and the next moment, the handsome man from the street walked in wearing a cowboy hat, t-shirt, jacket, and jeans, and looking so very on his own. What did Beck say his name was? Luke. My, my, what is he doing here at just the right moment? Tyra's lips twisted. Bex pointed to her as if she'd just made an extremely poignant remark. He scanned the room, and then his eyes clasped mine. A little smile tugged at the corner of his lips, and he made his way toward me. I gripped the bar, a buzz numbing me from the inside out, relaxing my limbs and my good sense. He was good-looking, with a stone-cut jawline, tan-easy skin, and soulful brown eyes that somehow promised the same appeasing effect as rich chocolate satin cake. I hadn't wanted to admit as much to Bex earlier, but he was the kind of handsome that made a girl's temperature rise. I hoped I might see you here, he said, splaying his fingers on the bar. You going to tell me your name yet? I turned and rested my elbow on the bar beside me. You don't need to know my name, I said. You just need to know you're my next bad idea. The girls whooped at that, and Bex tapped her empty shot glass on the bar a few times like a gavel. The cowboy peered to my empty glasses, granting me a full smile which rendered him that much more desirable. Bad idea, huh? He said. Just how many of those have you had? Bad ideas or drinks? The answer was a toss-up. Enough, I said. Mind and movements jerky, my rebellion from my younger years rebooted in an instant. The girls were right. I needed a distraction of the worst kind, and he fit the bill. He didn't fight me when I stood and slipped my hand into his. He didn't pull away when I let him outside. The October night was chilly. I walked in a daze to the side of the cafe and tugged him into the shadows. Just what are you up to? he asked. You're about to find out. I flattened my hand to his chest and tiptoed up. He didn't let me. Hold on, he said. I make it a point to know who I'm kissing. Call me whatever you want. I broke his resistance and pressed my lips to his. The impact was a rush of deep water. I drowned in the feel of him, in the heady way he claimed my mouth and the way his hands clasped my sides. His lips parted, taking in more of me. 
I lifted my hands to his face, sifted my fingers into his hair as he turned us so that my back was against the side of the cafe and he was on the offense. His lips worked their next play, teasing mine with soft touches, while his fingertips tantalized my spine. He made as if to pull back. I didn't let him. I hadn't been kissed like this in so long. Not since the accident. Not wanting to dwell on that, I gripped the front of his jacket and held him close. He indulged me, allowing one last long, lingering kiss that I wanted to explore a little longer before he eased away. You said that was a bad idea, he breathed, his voice whisper soft. I ran my thumb across his zipper. I said, you were. He stepped back enough to let a rush of cold air hit the skin at my neck. I think you might be right. Something tells me I'm not the one you want to be out here with. I toyed with the hair at his nape and stared at his swollen lips. Why is that? Because. He pried at my hands and drew away further, so he was now a few steps from me with his hands still on my shoulders. He released me allowing distance and a modicum of sense to attempt waffling through. Either you're making up names, or you just called me Eli. Heat and reality slammed into my cheeks, made the world spin, and my stomach right along with it. I shoved him as hard as I could. Knee-jerk reaction. How dare you? How did he know? Was he trying to rub it in my face? This was what I hated about this town. First Gina and Bill Hansen, now him? I didn't even know him. A person's personal business was never personal at all. How did anyone stand living here? How dare I what, he said. Of all things, he appeared to be stunned. Say his name. You said it first. Too much spinning. I, I didn't. I would remember if I said that name. And I hadn't. I hadn't even been thinking of Eli, just of how much I wanted to forget him. To forget that Grandpa was gone too. To rid myself of the pain both of their losses brought. Look, he ran a hand through his hair. Let's have a redo, all right? We haven't even met each other. He offered his hand. My name is Luke Holden. And you are? Catching the first flight home, I said with mortification. Why was he even here talking to me? I would made a complete fool of myself, flung myself at him, and then summoned my dead fiancé's name while kissing him. What was wrong with me? This wasn't me. I didn't drink, and I certainly didn't act on random impulses like cornering the next hottest guy who walked through the door in answer to a friend's dare. Of all things, Luke showed concern. Are you okay? Can I take you somewhere? Maybe get you to wherever you're staying? Sorry, was all I managed to utter before I retched on the pavement between us. Chapter 5 My mind had been drilled. Either that, or I'd been hit by a bus, one of the two. Pain hammered beneath my skull, and I clutched my temples, rolling over in bed and hiding beneath my pillow. I didn't mistake the striped sheets or the surrounding wallpaper littered with pictures from my high school days. A groan escaped. I'd made it back to the farmhouse? How? The mortifying events of last night nailed into me with each new pulse inside my skull. I checked the time. Just after 10 a.m., and I flung my elbow over my eyes. Seriously, Belle? I chastised myself. What had I done? I'd never drink, yet I'd let Tyra and Bex talk me into it. And then... Regardless of my hazed brain, I remembered that kiss with Luke 
and prayed the putrid taste now lingering on my tongue hadn't been present during that kiss. The funeral is tomorrow, I said. Then I'll be gone. All I could hope for was to avoid running into him again until then. I blinked with sandpaper under my eyelids and rolled out of bed with a groan. I staggered to the shower, knowing the stream of hot water would wake me up better than anything else. The warm spray did its job, soothing my tense muscles, though it didn't do much to ease the regret I still carried. While brushing my teeth, my eyes drifted to the view of the barnyard through the bathroom's double-paned window. The animals, I said, rinsing my mouth and enjoying the minty toothpaste taste, whose contrast was a far cry better than the sewer I'd woken up with. I tied my hair up, slipped into some shoes, and hurried outside. Aunt Sarah had said Grandpa had a farmhand, and all my panicked arrival and distracted thoughts I hadn't stopped to check on the animals and make sure they were being taken care of. Was there a worker here after all? What if she'd been misinformed and no one was here to tend the animals now that Grandpa was gone? I hadn't taken care of the chores, as Grandma and Grandpa had called the animals' care, in years. But I'd grown up mucking out stalls, gathering eggs, cleaning the bunny cage, and grooming and feeding the horses. It would take nothing at all for me to fall back into that rhythm again. I hadn't brought the right shoes for it, but the least I could do was check. The only vehicle that had been here besides Aunt Sarah's was Grandpa's 1950s truck that had long ago been dubbed Old Blue. But this morning, along with Aunt Sarah's Honda, was a newer truck than Grandpa's, parked down the lane a ways, directly in front of the shed he'd had remodeled into what was essentially a one-room house. It had been done to accommodate a passer-through who'd needed somewhere to stay, and it ended up being a dwelling for hired help since the farmhouse was so far out from the rest of Bridgewater. Lifting a hand to block out the sunlight, which was warm for early October, I decided to start with the barn. A small flicker of eagerness glimmered in spite of myself. I hadn't seen a horse, let alone ridden one since I left. I wondered if Grandpa still had Grady, his paint horse, and Sweetie, Grandma's mare. The combination of those two gave me walnut, my gelding, and an unexpected longing to see my childhood horse rose inside. The gravel drive extended from the road, circled around a patch of grass, and past the sheds, including the guest house, on its way to the barn and the corrals. I'd crossed it halfway, gravel crunching beneath my shoes, when movement startled me. A cowboy wearing jeans, a flannel shirt, and boots guided Grady by the reins toward the corral's thick wooden enclosure. Hey there, I said, letting my voice carry. Nothing was worse than a spooked horse, and I didn't have any reason to sneak up on the farmhand. In fact, it was better that he knew I was here. The man stopped and rested a hand on Grady's side. You're awake, he said. That was an awfully intimate way to greet a stranger. His face was shadowed by the brim of his hat, but my heart stopped the minute I drew close enough to make sense of his features. Oh my, I placed a hand on my chest. I'd know that face anywhere, but it was his accusatory voice and the intoxicating ghost of his lips against mine that really got me. Kill me now. Let me drop to the ground, hit hard, and get it over with. Luke? His eyes registered my face, then cascaded down across my body before returning. I'm glad to see you're okay, he said. I've been wondering how you were after your friend and I got you home last night. I shook my head, hardly able to connect the present with past events. The man I'd cornered and kissed like a passion-deprived psychopath, who I'd embarrassingly called my ex's name, was Grandpa's tenant? And he'd taken my passed-out butt home last night? I was stunned, but not enough to make me inconsiderate a second time. I worked the latch and opened the gate so he could finish leading Grady into the corral. So, you live here? You are Grandpa's farmhand? Yes, ma'am. Once the horse was in, Luke closed the gate, swept the hat from his head, and pointed to me with it. 
your bell, he said, as though he knew me, as though he'd been watching for my arrival. Had Grandpa told him about me? Or had he heard it through the Bridgewater grapevine that I'd returned to town? If so, what else had they told him about me? Unless Bex? Or Tyra, since Bex had had as many shots as I had last night. She'd told him who I was, presumably part of last night's rescue efforts. I shouldn't care. I didn't. Even as I tried to convince myself of this, I couldn't take my eyes off of the broadness of his shoulders or the confident way he carried himself. The glint of sweat on his tanned skin piqued every inch of curiosity I'd ever had. The morning's temperature was gradually rising with the sun. You, you know my name after all. I tried for quirky and coy, but it came out sounding breathless and stupid. It occurred to me that I should apologize for my sleazy behavior the night before, but that was a deep pit hidden beneath a spread of branches. Once I stepped in its direction, I'd be sunk with no way of getting out. He replaced the hat onto his head, a feat that sent my attention to how strong his arms were. Good old manual labor. You could have told me who you were, he said, resting a boot on the lowest rung of the paddock gate. Might have made things a little less interesting last night, he added with a chuckle. If he was hoping for an apology, he wouldn't get one. I was mortified. Bex knew he was Grandpa's farmhand. Why hadn't she said anything when I'd first met him? How long have you worked here? Just shy of three years now, he said. That meant he must have come to town right after I left. I combed through my memories. I'd tried to repress everything Grandpa had told me about Bridgewater, so much he'd stopped talking about home during our chats. Was that why he hadn't told me about Luke? Or had he told me about Luke and I'd been too stubborn to listen? Looks like Grady's good here for a minute, Luke said. I was just off to feed Hector and Berlioz, but is there something I can help you with? Hector and Berlioz? Hank's llamas. He wasn't sure about acquiring them, but said he'd always had a fetish for them as a boy and figured, why not? I hated this. I hated that this man knew something about Grandpa I didn't that he had an inner connection that should have been mine. Hector Berlioz was a composer, I said. Was he now? I nodded, still trying to make my brain connect these latest events. And I had the slightest gratification at knowing something Luke didn't. Grandpa wasn't ever one for classical music, though. Since when would he not only get llamas, but name them after a classical music composer? Luke may have known the answer, and so I decided not to give him the satisfaction of informing me by asking. Luke waited as if still wanting an answer to his question. I think I'm good, I told him, angling for the porch. Alrighty then. I guess I'll be seeing you around. He returned his hat to his head and carried on in the direction of the llama corral. I watched his leisurely saunter, allowing too much attention on his fine form though the sight didn't cool my frustration. He glanced back at me before disappearing behind the barn, and my chagrin flared before I hammered up the porch steps, certain of one thing the closer I got to the door. He wouldn't see me around. Not for much longer. Not if I could help it. Chapter 6 The house smelled the same. Wood and dust and dirt and books and something musty I'd never quite been able to name. The same carpeted stairs with their gaudy oak railings climbed immediately once a person left the entryway, first going up a short distance before changing direction the rest of the way up. They matched the heavy wood crown molding and wood frames encasing every window and door, including decorative wooden adornments separating the living room from what Grandpa had called the parlor. I stepped beneath the gingerbread accents of these wooden adornments and into the parlor's spherical shape, where five windows broke the room's rounded walls to consume gallons of sunlight. I stood in one of the warm beams with a hush as my companion. 
Though I was the only one breathing, this place still teemed with life. Conflict tore through me as I rotated in a small circle. Aunt Sarah was right. I didn't want to let this go. Yet how could I stay? Why, I said aloud, crossing to situate myself in one of the tall chairs placed around a high top table, crushing one of the floral pillows Grandma had left there. I propped my elbows on the round table and stared out the window at the expanse of land swallowing the view from every angle. Hills interrupted the distance, set off by a few grazing cows. Why, of all people you could have left this place to, would you leave it to me? There was no answer that I could discern, only about a dozen other more logical solutions. Aunt Sarah had a daughter who had a family. My uncles would have performed several illegal acts to get their hands on this land. Grandpa could have divided it among his progeny. And yet, while they'd each gotten a share of the inheritance consisting of the spoils of Grandma and Grandpa's extremely wise investments, this house and all its land was mine. And ungrateful cur that I was, I didn't want it. I made my way through the rest of the space. The kitchen was the same as ever, the same dark cabinets and the bar cutting through the generous area. One stool was pulled out as though Grandpa had stood to get something and would be back any minute. Better see what's in here, I said, making for the fridge across from the sink. I braced myself for the smell of neglected food, but the repellent aroma didn't greet me. In fact, the fridge was empty except for a few condiments. Looks like I'll need to pick up a few things, I said, continuing my conversation with myself as I closed the fridge and popped my head into the pantry. He had basics like flour and sugar, but nothing to get by on. I'd have to stop at the mercantile when I went back into town. Every empty room I visited only widened the wedge burrowing in my chest. Rooms for children I would never have. Dining rooms for dinners I would never host. Evenings together unspent, counsel ungiven. Even animals outside I could never care for. Everywhere I turned, I saw a future here that had been ripped from me. A future I'd craved. And the reminder was painful. So suffocatingly painful. I stormed out the front door, letting the screen slam behind me the way I used to as a teenager. Luke pushed a wheelbarrow full of clippings past but stopped when he saw me. I ignored the way muscles pushed their lines through his thin shirt. I ignored the way he tipped his chin up to look my way from beneath the brim of his hat. I ignored his hands and work gloves still gripping the wheelbarrow. Easy, he said, pointing to the door behind me. What did that door ever do to you? I wanted to scream to tear open my chest and scrape the painful burrs that made breathing so impossible from where they'd lodged and throw them as far from me as I could. It was all I could do not to sink to my knees and let the tears fall. And maybe if Luke wasn't here, I might have. Instead, I lifted my chin, pounded down the steps, and marched past him without a word back to Aunt Sarah's car. I barreled down the gravel lane and out onto the main road that curved its way through town. Within minutes, I pulled with squealing brakes into the space in front of Bridgewater Real Estate. Conditioned air slammed awareness of my body's heat and only the slightest reminder that I needed to cool down. But I ignored that reminder and walked to the counter. A brunette woman around my age was sifting through files in an open cabinet, either not hearing my approach or not caring. She had an ignored styrofoam box opened which showed a half-eaten sandwich, and my stomach rumbled. I had woken up late and hadn't thought to grab any breakfast. Was it really already lunchtime? I cleared my throat. Be right with you, she said. This was too slow for my urgency. I needed action, and I needed it now. The sooner I listed Grandpa's house... That meant all I had left to do was get through the funeral and get as far from here as I could. With the money from this sale, I could buy a house on the beach. I could get a villa in Tuscany or Greece. 
I could buy a house anywhere I jolly well pleased, and preferably as far from Bridgewater, Idaho, as a map permitted. The woman turned, and I wanted to back away instantly. Turn around and forget I ever came in. Bell Toby. Ugh. Even her voice had the same shrill tone. I cracked out a smile. Hey, Emily. Her jaw dropped to display her full set of shark white teeth. I didn't know you were back in town. Then again, with your grandpa's funeral tomorrow, I should have guessed. I was so sorry to hear of his passing. Her false sympathy intensified to new heights. She slapped a hand to the décolletage visible above her low-cut shirt. And how terrible for you to lose someone else. First your mom and then that whole Eli thing. That Eli thing. As though his death had been an inconsequential piece of gossip to be tossed into casual conversation like the cost of eggs. My brain disconnected for several seconds before rerouting. Why did I come in here again? Her sympathy sounded disingenuous and obligatory rather than heartfelt. Then again, I'd never pegged Emily Stone as the genuine kind. Her crowd and mine had been born at opposite ends of the tug-of-war rope, and that much didn't seem to have changed. Yeah, I'm here to speak with a realtor, I said, getting to it. Emily's smile grew, and a sliver of sneaky interest flashed in her devious eyes. Are you now? Don't tell me you're thinking of selling all that property. I heard Hank left it all to you. Bless his heart. I'm sure the right person could do so much with it. My outrage battled against the confines of my chest. It was none of her business what Grandpa left to me. This conversation needed to end ten minutes ago. Why was I still here talking to her? Can I speak with a realtor, please? I'm your girl. She ran her tongue along her teeth, as though plucking at an unwanted visitor who'd outworn its lunchtime welcome. You? No, I meant... I glanced around. Wasn't she a secretary or something? She stacked some papers against the counter, all business, before clicking her pen. You never answered my question. What are we listing? I couldn't do this. Not with her. Emily had been the reason the whole school had known Lindsay Barris had slept with Jerry Dean and gotten pregnant. She'd been the loose cannon who'd shared the time I'd kissed Kenny Durham on a dare and word had spread that I was easy until I'd gone steady with Eli, and he'd had to help me set the record straight more than once. The only thing I could rely on Emily to do was to spread my manure all over town and watch the resulting growth. Never mind, I said, backing out the door, leaving Emily looking completely perplexed and almost hurt. I stood on the sidewalk near the hood of Aunt Sarah's car and stared at the leaves, golden and rustling on their branches, as if waiting for their turn to fall. Indignation tore through me. Was there nowhere else I could go? I'd list the house myself if that was what it took which meant I had to stay here a little longer than I'd planned. I typed out a quick email to my boss to explain the situation. Rodney was pretty understanding, and as I could get my deadlines done distantly, I knew he wouldn't mind my extended absence as long as I did so. Next, I'd need a few more items to get me by while staying at the honeymoon cottage. Rather than driving 20 feet to the mercantile on the corner, I walked wishing there was some way I could stamp out the past along with the well-meaning people who thought they had a right to keep bringing it up. But just as the realtor building was still there, even though I'd walked away from it, so too everything I wanted to leave behind still trailed me. The Perrys had owned Bridgewater Mercantile when I was growing up. Two kind people with a handful of kids a little younger than I was. They were kind, and never poked in places they didn't belong. I prayed that was still the case, and that I wouldn't run into anyone else while I was here. Won't take too long, I told myself, bracing myself to broach the wooden ramp leading up to the entrance. Just a few items to get me through till I can get the heck out of here. The mercantile looked more like a log cabin than a store. I wondered if it hadn't been a home at one point. 
I paused a few moments in appreciation of the festive pumpkins blossoming like orange flowers along the deck where outdoor seating was available. A few small children laughed and chased one another, their small feet pounding the boards while their moms talked. In the corner of the deck, a collection of pumpkins and fall foliage nestled in a wheelbarrow reminded me of the one Luke had been pushing when I burst out the door, but I stalked past the lovely display and headed inside. An old-fashioned ice cream bar greeted me. My empty stomach grumbled again, and Gerilyn Perry, wearing her usual apron over her rotund figure, gave me a sincere, pleased smile I couldn't help but return. She had more lines on her face than the last time I'd seen her. Belle Toby, she said, as though my name in and of itself was noteworthy. It sure is good to see you. Good to see you too, I said, and unlike the few other people I'd bumped into thus far and shared a similar greeting with, I meant every word this time. Gerilyn had always been motherly to me, helping me out when, as a child, I hadn't brought enough change to purchase the few things Grandpa had sent me for, offering unwarranted but appreciated advice as I got older. She always seemed genuinely happy to see me, to see people in general, and that made my interactions with her more meaningful. Still, I couldn't stand and chit-chat with her. That would give the wrong idea. I was not staying. And with the mood I was in, I didn't want to connect with anyone. I turned toward the grocery aisles, but Gerilyn tagged along. I'm so sorry about your granddaddy. He was a dear friend to so many in this town. Thank you, I said, smiling at her before centering my focus on the handful of aisles stocked with food. How long are you staying? The week, I said. No judgment. Only a pleasant smile with sad, perceptive eyes. I'll leave you to your shopping, she said. Let me know if you need anything. Something told me the comment wasn't only in reference to the soup mixes I'd put in my basket. I was sure that if I came to Gerilyn and told her I needed someone to confide in, she'd drop everything to listen to what I had to say. But I wouldn't go there. For some reason, that felt as settling as agreeing to keep the farmhouse. Instead, I rotated and took in the upgrades to the mercantile. They'd really dressed the place up. At the back wall, wooden shelves held offerings of not only grocery items, but specialty honey, bath bombs, and candies in attractive containers that made me want to buy them for the container itself, rather than what was inside. Other aisles offered drinks and boxes of cereal, along with bread and cake mixes. I added a box of cereal to my sundries. I paused at the end of the aisle where a gaping window offered a view of the Elkhorn situated next to the soda fountain shop across the street. I considered stopping in for some lunch, but that wasn't a place I'd be visiting again anytime soon. My eyes shuttered closed, weighed down by the shame of how I'd dragged Luke outside like a hussy and thrown myself at him. I didn't even recognize the person I'd been last night. What did he think of me? Pushing my weight around, kissing him drunk, getting sick, and then ignoring him the way I had. What was my problem? Hey there, Miss Toby, a friendly voice chimed, but even though Miranda Vreeland was kind, I couldn't prattle with anyone else. I kept making a fool of myself wherever I turned, and I refused to do so anymore. If that meant brushing people off, so be it. Hi, I said, knowing it was rude not to stop. I offered her what I hoped was an apologetic smile, broke for a half gallon of milk and a pre-made sandwich wrapped in plastic, and delivered the items to Gerilyn at the checkout register, needing to get out and away from people and from the memories that each individual brandished with a single greeting. Even the flyers near the register announcing the heyday pumpkin walk made me want to sweep them from the countertop. I bolted outside, drinking in the fresh flurry of newly fallen leaf smells, intermingling with the aroma of dirt and the smallest trail of chimney smoke. I didn't want to return to the farmhouse, but neither did I want to crash at Bex's or Aunt Sarah's and endure conversations with them, or worse, be the topic of them behind closed doors. I needed solitude. And, attractive farmhand aside, the farmhouse was the best place for it. 
Chapter 7 My afternoon was spent indulging in the slightly soggy sandwich I'd purchased, sorting through Grandpa's cupboards, and exploring the open storage area in the basement. The single room below was open, the cement foundation still visible on every side. An iron door where the coal trap had once been was still there, and I browsed, looking at the antique roller skates and a small metal tricycle, at the totes of holiday decorations I wasn't sure Grandpa had used since Grandma had passed away. I then spent some time going through emails and dealing with a few concerns from clients over their branding and blurbs on their products' websites. One client was particularly nitpicky over the verbiage for her laundry soap, and it took several tries before I presented her with something she approved of. I ended up drifting off into a dreamless nap for a few hours. When I awoke, the sky had caught on fire with blazes of fuchsia, pink, and tangerine streaks, beckoning me for a closer look. I slipped into my jacket and stepped out onto the porch. With the mountains interjecting their opinion on God's handiwork, it was a breathtaking sight indeed. I paused a moment from the porch's view of the barnyard just to appreciate the view. They didn't make sunsets like this just anywhere. In spite of my determination not to, I cast a sweeping glance across the yard for a sign of Luke. The lights were on in his guest house, evidence that work for the day was done. I brewed the soup mix I'd purchased from the mercantile, its heady aroma of freeze-dried onions and celery filling the kitchen with surprising force. In the interim of putting away the goods I'd purchased and making dinner, I came across Grandpa's stash of caramels that he was never without. Every child in Bridgewater knew they'd receive one from him whenever they saw him. I popped one into my mouth, relishing the smooth, creamy caramel as it melted on my tongue. Soup finished, I was ready to sit at the long dining table to the sound of a podcast playing from my phone, when a knock sounded at the door. I looked down at my soup with remorse, so close to a bite. I could ignore the knock, I supposed aloud, but this house had so many dang windows that feat was nigh impossible. I doubted the visitor was Luke. After our last few interactions, he probably had as little interest in seeing me again as I did in him. Whoever was knocking was bound to have spotted me at some point, whether while climbing up the porch steps or seeing through the front door, which happened to peer straight in on the dining room. Another knock. I set down my spoon. Maybe it was Aunt Sarah or one of my cousins. Lee wanted the old piano. Undoubtedly, there would be others who had keepsakes they were interested in. Or worse, had the Combs heard I was in town? I certainly hoped it wasn't any of the Combs. I hadn't spoken to Eli's family since before he had died. They'd come to visit me in the hospital, but I had been too out of it to really remember much of the conversation and I didn't fail to notice that his mother, Jocelyn, hadn't been there with the others. Did they hate me for what happened? Jocelyn had already had a bad taste in her mouth for me from the minute Eli and I had begun dating. I answered, but it wasn't a relative. Luke's hair was wet, and the dizzying smell of woodsy soap and shampoo wafting from him tangled my empty stomach. That smell, combined with his snarl of wet, dark hair taunting his forehead, and the solemnity in his brown eyes curled me in knots. Luke, I said, what are you doing here? I would say I live here, but you'd know that's not why I'm on your doorstep. In fact, I'd bet we could go for days without crossing one another's paths. Then why are you on my grandpa's doorstep? I couldn't call it mine. Grandpa was wrong to give me so much. I didn't deserve this house. I didn't need it, nor did I need the land. It would be far better to give it to someone who did. Something smells delicious, he said, inhaling. You came for dinner? I wouldn't say no if you're offering. My mouth parted just enough. Look, I can see you'd rather I don't stay. I just thought maybe we could talk. I wasn't very happy with him the last time we'd talked, but he probably hadn't meant how it had come out. I was a cactus these days, that was all. But I shook myself, 
or rather the memory of Grandpa standing behind me chastised me enough to shake some sense in. Grandpa always said, There's enough and to spare. God gave us what we have so we could share it with others. He never would have turned anyone away, especially not someone standing at the door asking for food, no matter how tactless it was. I wasn't completely without manners. Sorry, I said. Come on in. There's plenty if you want a bowl. Luke cranked out a thin smile. If you're sure. I turned around and didn't wait for him to close the door behind him before making my way back to the kitchen to retrieve another bowl, spoon, and a placemat from the cupboards. Grandma would fillet me alive if I neglected the placemat. Unsure of where he wanted to sit, I placed the settings in the spot across from me before dishing him up what I hoped was enough and placing the bowl down as well. Thank you, he said. Not just for the soup, but for letting me intrude. The polite thing to say would be, you're not intruding. But Grandma and Grandpa had also taught me not to lie, so I said nothing. The truth was, I was curious. He wanted to talk? Was he going to bring up our kiss? Or my, yet again, embarrassing behavior earlier? What else could have brought him here tonight? We sat together in silence, cut through by clanging spoons, slurped soup, and the agony of my thoughts. I didn't have a clue what to say to this man. There was so much about him that I didn't know, and so much I wasn't sure I wanted to. This must be a lot for you to take on, he began, wiping his mouth with a napkin from the center holder Grandpa never let go empty. I slurped the final spoonful of my soup, enjoying the blend of salted broth and vegetables, and put down my spoon. What was he referring to? The house? The land? Grandpa's legacy of having everything exactly in place? Oh, was all I could say. Luke kicked back. His feet brushed mine beneath the table, and I pictured him stretching out his long legs. Yeah, I mean, I know how much your grandpa must have meant to you. He mentioned you grew up here? I did, I said. I can't believe Grandpa talked to you about me. First Bex, now this. I hadn't spoken to her today, but at least I could rest easy knowing she hadn't said more than she should. Bex was no Emily Stone. Not just you, Luke clarified. I'd come in during the evenings and we'd play bridge and chew the fat. He took me down memory lane quite a lot, talking about all of his family and how he loved your grandma, too. Grandpa had loved her. He talked about Grandma like a much younger man, like he'd fallen for her yesterday. The notion was endearing, but still made me leery that Grandpa confided personal things to Luke. I'm glad he had you to keep him company, I said. Though I'm not sure I like the idea of a total stranger knowing so much about me. I wouldn't say it's that much, Luke said. Though I do feel like I know you more than I actually do. What do you know about me, then? The question was meant to be curiosity only, but it was tinged by a flirtatious tone that I only recognized when it was too late to take it back. What was I doing? This was exactly what I didn't want. The long memory every street in this town had. The way every person I encountered seemed to dredge up things I'd sooner forget. Maybe I wanted to know if Luke fit into the same category. Was he a brittle gossip tree, or a true and steady pine that held on to its needles? I know you moved in with your grandparents when your mom passed away. I know you grew up tending animals and helping the Tobies with their daily chores. He mentioned you were reliable, always did what you should, that you loved riding horses, and your laugh filled the room with light. My heart clenched. That sounded like something Grandpa would say. He told me I was the sunshine in his overcast life. Is that all? I asked. Luke's fingers linked together on the table in front of him. His eyes blazed with something I couldn't name. Some kind of intuition that hinted he knew more about me than he was letting on. Had Grandpa told him about Eli's accident? About my part in it? That, and how sad he was that he didn't have the chance to see you before he passed. I couldn't breathe. 
I wished everyone would stop bringing that up. I also know you happen to kiss like a woman on fire. I met his gaze with no small amount of incredulity. His eyes blazed with the very fire he'd mentioned. Was he here because he wanted to repeat the instance? Great. He was here, buttering me up with fond memories and softening me with smooth talk. Regardless of my awful impression last night, I wasn't that kind of girl. I bolted up from my chair. I think you need to leave. Luke rose too, his hands lifted as if in surrender. I was just calling it like I see it. My entire body trembled. Please, I'd like you to leave. Luke picked up his dishes. I'm sorry, I only meant to compliment you. It's not a compliment. I acted like a complete idiot, and I'm so tired of everyone in this town bringing up all my past mistakes. And I gave you the wrong idea. I don't go around kissing men I don't know. I was drunk and stupid last night, so if you think I'll give you anything more, you're sadly mistaken. I'm not into one-night stands or... Whoa, hold up. That's not why I came. And I didn't mean for conversation to go there. I really was trying to tell you. I liked it, that's all. I like you. I don't see you that way, I promise. This wasn't supposed to be hard on anyone, least of all you. Was he saying this conversation was hard for him, too? I met his eyes and saw pain there, of all things. What could possibly be hurting him right now? Besides me, I mean. I just came to talk about Hank. Your grandpa meant a lot to me, he said. That's why I came by. I'm sorry things turned awkward. My throat was too tight to speak. In the meantime, Luke retrieved my bowl and stacked my dishes with his, taking them to the sink while I tried not to turn into a puddle of mess and pulses on the spot. I searched for some way to clear the air and ease the tension between us. When Luke returned to the table, he stared at his hands, but didn't make for the door as I suspected he might. I'll get going. If you don't mind, I do have one more question before I do. What's that? I managed. What are you planning for this old place? He asked. Why does that matter? I live here, for starters, he said. I'd like to know if I need to pick up roots. Yes, I said not able to understand the spice simmering in my blood. Why was I so irritated with him? With everyone else I'd encountered, for that matter. What was my problem? I'm selling this place. Then I'm buying, Luke spoke without a single pause. My mouth gaped. You can't be serious. Why not? Hank was good to me, and this old place has been more a home than I've ever had. I gawped at him hardly believing this was possible. Here, I'd wanted to sell, and a buyer lands literally on my doorstep. It was too easy. Something was off with all of this, but I couldn't figure out what. I needed time to sort, to think. I didn't even know what this house was worth. Family members wanted sentimental items. It would take time to sort and distribute items and furniture collected over a lifetime. And would Luke want all the land as well? More importantly, could he afford it? There was still so much to go through, appraisals and property things, not to mention the fine print of paperwork Aunt Sarah had mentioned. I hadn't even seen the full account of everything Grandpa had left to me. Rushing to the realtor's office earlier had been a mistake, and not just because Emily Stone worked there now. I realized how impulsive I'd been. No, I'm not selling it to you. Luke's brow snapped down. Why not? Because it was too soon. Because he was attractive and had his life more together than I ever hoped to from the sound of things. Because I was a wreck and couldn't handle so much thrown at me in one day. It was a wonder Grandpa hadn't bequeathed the house to Luke in his will instead. Therein was the problem that had gotten my back up. How much of my past had Grandpa told Luke? He'd mentioned my love of horses and doing what I was told. Those statements implied there was more to it. Undoubtedly, Luke was like everyone else around here who judged a person based on past actions. 
He probably thought he could handle the land better than I could, considering how I'd destroyed everything with Eli. I couldn't talk about this now. I needed him to leave. I'm sure you're very nice and more than capable of handling everything around here, but I have to ask you to leave. Get off my property. Are you crazy? he asked. Do you have any idea of what I do around here? I closed my eyes, willing the world to stop spinning, for time to cease ticking, for everything to stop. I wasn't asking him to leave the property, just the house. I'd better make that clear. Get out of my grandpa's house. Now, please. Luke seethed and left a flaming trail of hot energy all the way to the dining table to retrieve his hat. He shot me a glare as sharp as darts before thrusting open the door and storming out. My blood raced as I stood in my boots, wondering what had just happened. The sound of a truck door slamming shook me, and tires crunched the gravel, and then I knew he was gone. I sank onto the nearest couch and plunged my head into my hands. What was my problem? For all I knew, he'd come over for some small talk and to reminisce about Grandpa, and I'd butchered things like I always seemed to lately. I cleaned up the dinner dishes, wiped the counters, and headed upstairs, dressing in pajamas and crawling into my old bed. But the escape of sleep was slow to come. My overactive brain replayed every one of my interactions with Luke, including the part where he said he liked kissing me. And class act that I was, I'd scared him off like smallpox. Luke wanted to buy the house. That would solve all my problems. I wouldn't have to deal with listing it. I wouldn't have to stay in Bridgewater longer after all. The fist clenching over my heart wouldn't relent, though. It seemed too personal. If Grandpa had wanted Luke to have the house, why didn't he just leave it to him? I punched a fist against my lumpy pillow and flopped onto my back. No need to figure it out right now. The funeral was tomorrow. I could deal with listing the house just as soon as we handled saying goodbye to Grandpa for good. Chapter 8 The next morning, Luke's truck wasn't anywhere in sight. I slipped into some jeans and a hoodie, stuffed my feet into my shoes, and shuffled over to the guest house. It was a one-room shed with a single door crossed by planks and a pair of large windows. The roof had been extended over a brief porch with one step leading to the door. A pair of painted chairs that looked like they'd belonged to a dining table at one time sat empty and welcoming beside a potted flower that had succumbed to the end of summer. Birds chirped in the trees behind the shed-turned cabin, the tree's orange leaves bursting against the morning sky. Several knocks and waiting in silence told me what my heart already knew. He'd done what I'd asked. Luke had left. I stared around the yard, hearing the chickens clucking and the rooster's morning serenade. Horses whinnied from within the barn, and several of Grandpa's goats bleated. The thing with farms was that you couldn't neglect chores. Regardless of whatever chaos their owners were dealing with, animals needed looking after. I'd hate to be left without food or clean accommodations, and I'd been trained and ingrained by Grandpa and Grandma to get out and get the animals what they needed. I shot a quick glance at my phone. Time was limited. The funeral was coming up in a few hours. There was little chance I'd get through what I needed to before it was time to go. I cursed myself for sleeping in so late. I could have gotten an early start and avoided the time crunch. In high school, I'd always started with the horses, but as I passed the goat pen, something struck me. There was a baby goat, but no mom to feed it. Did Luke bottle feed the goat? Not to mention, Grandpa had llamas now. I didn't know anything about caring for llamas. Did they eat hay like the horses and goats did? Another sweeping glance across the barnyard sank a bowling ball into my stomach. Every task compounded with physical force before me. This was going to be impossible. I needed help if I wanted to get through this before the funeral. For a fleeting moment, I considered contacting Luke. Had he left town? Some farmhand he was. 
The worst part was, I knew he knew the funeral was today. Not only that, but having firsthand experience with the farm's demands, he knew exactly what burden he'd left me with. Fury began to simmer inside of me. I didn't have his number, but even if I did, I wouldn't have called. On impulse, I called the only other person I could rely on. Bex answered with a friendly tone. Do your kids want to earn some extra spending money? I asked, explaining the situation to her. Too bad it's a Wednesday. Cody's in school, she said. He'd want to come. I'll bring the girls, though. They'll love it. Brock, on the other hand. Invite him, too, I said, though I'm not paying him. I would meant this last bit as a joke, but Bex's reply came with a tone of displeasure. He'd probably only do it for money. I didn't have many adult friends now. In my mind, Bex was still my best friend, even though we'd grown apart. We'd only kept in contact through social media, and she wasn't one to blast personal problems there. I wasn't sure I liked whatever lay under her tone. I got a start on filling the horses' water and mucking out their stalls. My arms thrived on the exertion. It gave me a distraction and a channel for my pent-up frustration. The smell of hay and manure swirled anew with every stroke. Bex's van arrived 20 minutes later. Paisley bounded out while Bex retrieved baby Sophia and secured her in a pack worn over her chest. The baby cooed happily, slapping a hand in the space between Bex's collarbones. Rock hadn't come, but I hadn't exactly expected him to. Thanks for coming, I said. Are you kidding? Bex pulled her shoulder-length blonde hair free from one side of the pack where it had gotten caught. I should be thanking you. Pays is loving this already. She gestured to the chicken coop set up feet between the house and the barn. It was an old stone hut with chicken wire over its single square window, a wooden, people-sized door, and a small chicken run opening in the right wall along the ground. The smaller door led to a four-by-four four space enclosed by chicken wire, secured to wooden boards making each corner of the perimeter. Within this space, at least a dozen fat hens with brown and cottage-white feathers fluttered and clucked and pecked the ground, mingling with two cocky roosters in decadent plumage, with colors that changed to a sheen in the sunlight. Paisley wove her fingers through openings in the wire, bouncing in place and pointing. Look at that one! I like that one, she said. Bex's reply was interrupted by a rooster's crow. Stunned with wonder, the little girl beamed at her mother. Paisley turned around, bouncing. Mama, mama, that rooster made a noise like this! And then the three-year-old imitated the crow with noisy aplomb. Bex laughed and neared her daughter. He was saying hello, she said. Hello, rooster, Paisley said, turning back to the run and waving. You know, that rooster is an alarm clock, too, I said. He is? Paisley asked. Yep. Woke me up every morning once the sun rose. Paisley kept her attention on me. But why? She asked. Bex lifted her brows as if to say, Remember what I said before about her asking questions? The answer was, to me, implied. Roosters crowed because that was just what they did. We'd better get them started, Beck said before I formulated a response. Right. I bent and slid my palms to my knees, getting more on the child's level. Would you like to gather eggs? Yeah, Paisley said with exuberance. She clapped and laughed. I went to the chicken coop store and opened it to reveal a dozen more hens scratching around on their dusting of hay. Step in, but we need to be careful to close the door behind us or the chickens will get out. They have nests in the hay there along that back wall. I pointed to indicate the direction. We'll have to dig through and find the eggs. I stepped over, reached into one of the nests, and retrieved a beautiful blue egg. My chest warmed at the delight in Paisley's face as I showed her what I'd found. Can I do it? Paisley asked. Of course. See that nest there? Check that one. Where should we put the eggs once we find them? Bex asked from behind, propping open the door. Wings flapped as chickens responded to the unexpected visitors, and Paisley's laugh tinkled. 
The little girl kept her arms close to her sides, shoulders lifted, clearly uncomfortable in the new setting. Here, I said, stepping out and returning with a basket. Make sure to be extra gentle when you place them in, I said, holding the basket for Paisley to place her egg in. I don't want to break my egg, she said, setting it in. That's exactly right. Let's be quick now, Beck said, and then we proceeded to collect eggs. The process didn't take long, and Paisley's giggling and delight made the mundane task a little more exciting than usual. She skirted away from a hen, startling and dropping the basket she was holding. Oh no, she said with a little whine. I dropped it. it. It's okay, her mom assured. Bex bent for the basket and checked the contents. See, they're just fine. Paisley's worried forehead smoothed, and then the three of us, four if you included Sophia strapped to her mother's chest in a front-facing pack, exited. Where to next? Bex asked, securing the door shut. Horses? Horses, I said, leading the way to the barn. I got them fed and the water changed. We just need to finish clearing Sweeties and Grady's stalls. Got it, Beck said. She instructed Paisley to play outside the barn while the two of us went inside, and the little girl was only too happy to stomp in the grass. This isn't as easy as I remember, I told her, shoveling manure and dumping it into the wheelbarrow. I know, she said from the stall next to the one I was in. This is way better than any gym membership. If I did this every day, I wouldn't worry about leftover baby fat. Like you have to, I said. Bex was as trim and petite as she'd always been. She dumped her forkful of mess into the wheelbarrow and eyed me. So, tell me what's going on with you and Luke. I concentrated on the corner of the stall. There is no me and Luke, so there's nothing to tell. How are you two getting on? She asked, exiting Grady's stall to dump her manure. Any more spontaneous kissing? How did you know we kissed? She and Tyra had only seen me lead him outside that night before I'd passed out. They didn't know what had occurred once he and I were out there. She corked a brow, and my cheeks colored. Looks like I answered that question. No, though he mentioned it last night. She held her pitchfork's handle. He did? Yeah, right before I kicked him off the property. What? I'd left that part out of my hasty summary. I'd only told her he took off and left me with all the chores, not why he'd done so. I got stupid offended, I said. I just feel like an idiot for how I behaved. But if he's asking for more kissing, it obviously didn't bother him that much. Why should it bother you? I just feel so, I don't know, undignified. Like I have no self-respect. If I kiss him again after that, with no real connection. You're not the only one who wants a real connection with your man. She turned for a scoop of fresh hay to replace what she'd removed. Forget being my man. Luke wasn't even my friend. But I wouldn't go into that, not now that she was opening up. What's going on? Is everything okay with you and Rock? She smiled, brushing it off. Sure, everything's fine. I just... I just need to be more grateful. Grateful? I was all for gratitude helping a person get through difficult situations. But how could that help her relationship with her husband? Before I could ask what she meant... Paisley ran into the barn's wide open door with a beetle in hand. Look, I caught one. It's gross, Mommy. She crumpled her face at the black insect that would have made me cringe if it ever touched my hand. Yes, it is. Go take him back outside. And then we'll scrub your hands, she added under her breath. The two of us smiled at the little girl's crinkled nose before she darted out, and Bex turned back to me. What's really bothering you about Luke? I considered asking her what she'd told him about me, but that didn't seem relevant right now, not when she was here getting manure on her shoes for my sake. I scooped a batch of fresh hay and spilled. Grandpa Toby talked about me to him. He acts like he already knows me, and I just... 
I have so many screw-ups, Bex, so many things to hide. I went to Oregon for a fresh start. Did you find it? Are you happy there? Was I? I couldn't answer that. I looked at Grady in his newly cleaned stall. He eyed me, making me wonder if he remembered me. Or Grandpa. Did he miss Grandpa like I did? Anyway, he wants to buy this old house, I said. Really? That's great! You are looking for a buyer. He's the perfect fit, too. Luke's been living here since his accident. Bex took our rakes and hung them on their pegs near coiled lines of rope and saddles. I gripped the wheelbarrow and rolled it out to the pile. Its contents were reeking and potent. What accident? I asked. Bex kicked dirt and manure from her shoes. Neither of us were all that prepared for mucking stalls like this. This was the sign of a true friend if she were willing to face this in order to help me. Luke was a rodeo cowboy, she said, using her wrist to wipe errant hairs from her forehead. Paisley laughed, derailing her from the conversation momentarily. In spite of Bex's efforts, the chicken coop door was once again open, and a few chickens escaped, pecking across the lawn. Close the door, Bex yelled, startling the baby who'd fallen asleep during our work. I ran over and shooed chickens back into their coop and closed the door as Bex joined us. A few chickens fluttered their wings, alarmed at our advance toward them, but together we managed to wrangle them back where they belonged. She gave Paisley a gentle chastisement about not opening the coop door, and Paisley ranted about chickens and eggs as though she were now an expert on the subject. Luke rodeoed? I prodded, bringing Bex back to our previous topic, grateful she'd given Paisley a little instruction about the proper care of chickens so I didn't have to. She cleared a stray hair from her face. He moved to Bridgewater a few months after your accident. Was it the accident that brought him here? I asked, curious. I don't really know. He's kind of kept to himself up here. He became a kind of companion for your grandpa from what I understand. The two of them hit it off and became friends despite the difference in their ages. I thought back to my behavior the night before. I'd treated Luke with disdain when he tried talking about Grandpa, affronted that Grandpa had shared some of my life with him. Was it possible that Luke hadn't been digging out my secrets at all? What if he'd been mourning Grandpa and wanted someone to talk to? Someone who could understand how important Grandpa Toby was to him? And I'd accused him of wanting a one-night stand. Along with a downpour of humiliation, so many other questions tumbled into my brain, like potatoes down a line during harvest. What had brought Luke to Bridgewater? Was he hiding something all the way out here in no man's land, Idaho? I never meant to kick him out altogether, I told her. When I told him to leave my property, I only meant the house. That explains why I saw his truck parked at the inn on my way here, Beck squinted, taking in the sight of the rustic homey house. It had charm, with its wraparound porch, plethora of windows in varying shapes and sizes that added character to the exterior, and multiple gables that gave the impression the house had space to keep secrets. We'd spent so much time doing this, talking outside about boys, about life. Even though she was a few years older than I was, she'd been my best friend for so long. And though it had come at a sad cost, I was grateful for the excuse to return to those days, if only marginally. It's a killer house, she said. If you don't want it, why not take Luke up on his offer? I stared at the house as well. I don't know. When he came right out and said he wanted it, it got my back up, you know? I wasn't sure how to justify the effrontery I'd felt, not when I didn't fully understand it myself. No, I don't get it. You're not planning on staying, right? Hesitation impeded my response. I had been absolutely certain Bridgewater held nothing more for me, that it was only a repository of heartache and decayed life plans. Why did I now see the smallest sprigs of green at her question? Possibility had begun to blossom, timid and fragile as new buds in spring. I couldn't allow them to bloom. I couldn't change my mind. I... Mama! 
Paisley shouted with glee. Mama, look at the funeral. Each of her small hands held an apple retrieved from those that had fallen on the ground around Grandpa's line of fruit trees perpendicular to the house across from the goat pen. Bex's adoring smile gleamed in her three-year-old's direction. She's been calling everything a funeral since I explained to her where we're going later today. Those are apples, honey. Funeral, Paisley argued. I laughed at the cuteness, too, until the word's translation hit like a baseball bat swing. The funeral, I said, tapping fingers to my forehead, smelling the sweat and muck in my skin. Cringing, I checked the time on my phone. I had less than 30 minutes. Bex, thank you for your help. I've got to get ready. Hurry, she said, scurrying to shepherd Paisley to the van. The baby's hands flapped as she bounced against her mom's chest. We'll pack up and meet you there. I showered and threw on the black dress I designated to wear for the occasion. It was knee-length, loose and flowy, with long sleeves. I didn't have time to dry my hair, so I twisted it back into a knot at the base of my head, dabbed on my makeup and spritzed perfume, snatching my shoes on the way out to the car. Grandpa wouldn't mind if I showed up barefoot, I thought, with a little warming touch to the center of my heart, as I tapped the gas pedal in a completely illegal fashion with bare toes rather than the shoes I ran out of time to pull on and that were now sitting on the passenger seat. Luckily, Bridgewater was small enough that I wouldn't have to deal with much traffic once I made it into town. I was full of jitters for so many reasons. Disbelief that Grandpa was really gone. Though I'd seen the empty house myself, it still didn't seem real that he'd never cross through the door again and that we were about to lay his body in the ground. Mostly, I couldn't stop thinking about Luke and wondering what connection he and Grandpa had had and a small part of me was hoping he'd be at the funeral, too. I had to make things right with him. Not only that, but I had a whole lot of questions. Chapter 9 The whole town had to have come for this. A viewing would take place before the funeral began, a viewing I was late to. Every parking space was claimed. Fortunately, a spot was reserved for family toward the front, behind where the hearse was situated. I took the spot gratefully, slipped into my heels, and managed to stroll into the church with my heart a gooey, throbbing mess on the inside, but with the utmost picture of having it together on the outside. Sea town I was fine. Just fine. Total lie. Lula Richards and her husband, Garrison, stood in the church's foyer, speaking in hushed tones. Lula gave me a little wave, so I hurried over. The family's in the side room for a prayer, she said kindly. Better hurry. Thanks, I told her, following that direction. I knew this church like the back of my hand, just like the rest of the town. I'd come every Sunday for meetings with Grandma and Grandpa. Nostalgia hit like a flashback, and all the hesitancy I'd felt leading up to this point fled at the sight of so many familiar faces. Chairs were set up to create a waiting area before the telltale coffin at the head of the room, its lid open. Uncles, aunts, and cousins I hadn't seen in years responded to my entrance. And rather than being censured for being a few minutes late, I was met with smiles and welcomes that patched the dents embedded in my heart. Tears hit my eyes at their kind expressions, at the welcome words, at the warm embraces. Great Aunt Cora hugged me, gray-haired and smelling like baby powder. She was Grandpa's sister, the only sibling left. Uncle Thomas, with his mustache that was grayer than I'd ever seen it, spoke in hushed tones with his wife Mary, who was quite a bit shorter than he was and wore a black suit with a blue blouse. Their kids, my cousins, and their families included children I didn't know by name. Aunt Sarah and her husband Richard and their two daughters with their families were there too, along with other faces I didn't recognize, but probably should have. Distant cousins, perhaps, or grandpa's friends who'd traveled to pay their respects. Uncle Marvin broke his conversation with Cora at my approach. So glad you're here, he said. You were his favorite, you know, Belle, great aunt Cora said either not realizing Marvin was the father of two of Grandpa's other grandchildren or not caring. 
He talked about all the grandkids the same, but you had something over him that none of the others did. I suppose that's why he left you the house. Always said that house wasn't home once you and Nancy were gone. He'd put me on the same level as Grandma? I wiped my eyes. I don't know what to say. Uncle Marvin patted my back, and I was grateful it wasn't his brother-in-law, Uncle Thomas. While Marvin hadn't shown any signs of being upset that he hadn't gotten any of the farmland, I was sure Thomas would be chomping at the bit. He'd tried buying the house from Grandpa before when I was in high school. Grandpa had refused, and Uncle Thomas hadn't stopped griping about it since. Undoubtedly, he'd corner me at some point. I moseyed over to say hi to my cousin Lee and made small talk about her kids and how their drive here from Arizona was before Aunt Sarah approached. Unlike myself and others, she wasn't dressed in black but maroon, her dyed brown hair pulled stylishly back, her pearl necklace and bracelets classy and elegant. Good to see you, Aunt Sarah said, touching my arm. I worried you wouldn't come. She wouldn't be wrong in that worry. I didn't exactly have the greatest track record for funeral attendance. I was braver this time, and that said something. I didn't want to miss it, I confessed. In Eli's case, not only had I been recovering from the concussion I'd received from the accident, but I hadn't wanted to face the condemning glares I was sure to receive from his family and everyone else. There was one thing. At least I wasn't responsible for Grandpa's death. I prayed the Combs family wouldn't come today. I'm glad you're here, she went on. There's something else I realized I forgot to give you. Daddy left this for you. It was marked, well, you can see how he marked it. She delved into her purse and handed me an envelope. The inscription read, Four Bell on my death, in Grandpa's distinct, shaky handwriting. I couldn't take this. I wouldn't. What would he say? What had he written? And how could I deserve to read it now, after the way I'd abandoned him? Go on, Aunt Sarah said, as if sensing my hesitation. He wanted you to have it, just like he wanted you to have the house. The house. I had to wet my throat before I could speak. Do you think it explains why he left the house to me? Maybe. Read it. Find out. Have you seen him yet? Aunt Sarah asked, placing her arm around my shoulders. Seen him? Did she mean Grandpa? I blinked. Not yet. Come on, then. My initial reaction was resistance, but she guided me to the open casket. Envelope flattened between my hands, I braced myself for the sight of the man who'd been more of a father to me than a grandfather. The man who'd raised me, who'd taken me in and offered hugs he called squeezes at every greeting, well wishes at every parting, and caramel candies in between. Though he'd snapped at me on occasion, Grandpa taught with tenderness and patience. He always insisted on doing the dishes because Grandma did the cooking. He'd been careful to make sure shoes were brushed aside from the door so that Grandma wouldn't trip on them. Grandpa had taken care with everything he did. He was often seen in wide-brimmed hats working the ground outside, running the lawnmower, or greeting and tending his animals. I stared at his delicate face, his eyes closed, and the unnatural peach color of his skin. At his quiet hands resting solemnly on his unmoving chest, fingernails perfectly trimmed. He was so still. He could be sleeping. And yet I knew he was gone. Emotion swelled hard and strong, with a push and a pull, one end leading to denial, the other to finality. I wanted to touch him, to take his hand, to express every ounce of regret and gratitude I wish I had shared with him while he was still alive. I'm sorry I didn't make it back like I promised, I told him, feeling the tears sting my cheeks. And I prayed. Prayed to God that he would know the feelings scorching my heart. The regret that I'd left after Eli had died. The sorrow that I hadn't returned like I'd promised to after I'd healed. There'd always been some excuse. 
meeting the family of a guy I tried dating, bad weather, my demanding job. Why had I let so much get in the way? I assumed he'd always be there. Aunt Sarah called for the room's attention. Our pastor had stepped to her side and began to speak. Hank was an incredible man, he said, and we'd like to begin services today with a family prayer before heading into the service. Hank asked that his son Thomas give that invocation. We all bowed our heads in solemn coming together while Uncle Thomas gave a beautiful, heartfelt prayer. By the time he ended it in Jesus' name, I wasn't the only one sniffling. We lined up together and followed the procession into the chapel. My heart leaped into my throat, not only at the overflowing crowd who'd come to honor him, but because Luke sat on the stand behind the podium. He cleaned up in a fine white shirt with a cowboy tie at the neck. His dark hair looked tamer than I'd yet seen it, and he rose, along with the rest of the congregation, while the family all took our places. Aunt Sarah began with a life sketch, and I was touched by the reminders of Grandpa's kindness and generosity, his love for animals and fishing in the outdoors, his love for people. He'd never had a college education, which I'd known, but he'd met Grandma on a college campus of all places, which I hadn't known. She'd been abandoned by her date, and unable to see a lady on her own on the dance floor, Grandpa had swooped in like an old cowboy gentleman and rescued her. Tears spilled at the memories Aunt Sarah's sketch stretched up. The many people who'd been offered work or a place to stay, the music he'd enjoyed, and the impact he'd had on the town. I was touched by a life spent to its fullest in service to others. Then, of all people to stand up and speak next, Luke rose and made his way to the podium. My lungs stilled. Softness filled me. I was woven around his words as though I'd been a piece of twine around his fingers. Wanted, Luke began. One fishing buddy. Must be able to tie your own flies, provide meals, and plenty of good jokes along the riverbank. The entire room hushed at his unique approach to a eulogy. I was astonished by the sense that these were all things Grandpa had provided him with. Bex had told me he and Grandpa had become friends, but I didn't know they'd fished together. Was that how he'd ended up working for Grandpa and living on his property? That couldn't be the case, though. Bex had said something about an injury. Grandpa had taken in plenty of strays during my rearing years. People came and went, and Grandpa always claimed they had enough and to spare. Had Luke been one of his strays who'd refused to leave? Must be willing to fish with people of all ages, regardless of their skill or previous experience and be a good listener in the early morning hours, to offer sage advice from his own life experience. This person must also be willing to open his home to those in need, even young hotheads who think they're all that and a bag of chips. Luke paused with an endearing smile, as if it's some memory. Several in the congregation gave appreciative chuckles. Who are quickly brought down by injury and heartache. A solemn hush tore over the group, but I couldn't shake the dawn rising within me. Luke had told me Grandpa had meant something to him, but I hadn't grasped just how much at the time. What injury and heartache had he faced? Renewed shame scoured my insides. Like with Bex, I'd been so bent on my own problems, I'd failed to consider anyone else's. Aunt Sarah told me Grandpa had dictated how he'd wanted his funeral to go, which meant he'd requested Luke to speak. Luke meant something to Grandpa, too. I wanted to know what it was. I wanted to know who Luke was. Luke wiped a tear from his eye and stared at his papers. This person must be a kind soul, hard worker, and a helping hand to all he meets. On top of that, he's got to see the best in people, even when they don't see it in themselves. Luke lifted his eyes to the crowd. They were filled with tears. Hank Toby was all these things and more. He changed my life for the better, and I'm thankful God led me to him when I needed him most. The world has lost a friend, a father, a neighbor, and a brother in Hank Toby. 
but he left me some of the best memories of my life. He left a legacy behind I can only hope to keep up with. God bless Hank Toby, and God bless you all. People in the congregation nodded in agreement. Luke turned as if to leave and then thought better of it, returning to the podium for a final thought. I also wanted to thank the Toby family for letting me speak today. When Sarah specified that Hank had requested me, I was grateful for the chance to share in some small way what Hank has come to mean to me. I think I speak for many of you who received help at his hand, whether in small or large ways. His eyes strayed to mine, and a powerful connection surged, intense and filled with meaning. He nodded once and tore that look away before returning to his seat. I was affected, moved, and completely changed in that moment. Grandpa had taken in so many, without regard for background or whether they were even related. He'd accepted them no matter what. I determined to do better. I thought of my wretched behavior thus far since I'd returned to town. I'd been so focused on myself and my own pain, I'd failed to acknowledge anyone else's feelings. From Gina and Bill Hansen to Geraldine at the Mercantile, and even Emily Stone. It was a wonder anyone had wanted to talk to me at all. The graveside service was lovely. Aunt Sarah had arranged for each family member and Luke to lay individual right roses on his coffin as a final farewell before it was lowered into the ground. Luke hadn't glanced my way again since the penetrating look we'd shared, and though I wanted to catch him and apologize, Every move I made was intercepted by a family member I needed to speak to or hug or share condolences with. Uncle Thomas nodded at me, but thankfully didn't mention the house. By the time I had a second to myself, Luke wasn't anywhere in sight. I knew Eli was buried here as well, but I didn't want to know where. I hadn't had the courage to face it three years ago, and I doubted I did now. Beck stayed by my side. Her kids seemed to sense the solemnity of the occasion and stayed close to their mother's side, and none of the Cutler family seemed to notice or mention that Rock wasn't there. The whole town had shut down for this. Where was Rock? I didn't dare ask Bex, not with others around. She was a private person, and I knew from past experience that she wouldn't tell me if I asked about him, not if it meant others might overhear. With her daughters in tow, Aunt Sarah pulled me aside on our way to our parked vehicles. We know it's your house now, my cousin Lee said. She wore a fitted suit and her brunette hair was curled at the ends. But some of us were bequeathed things we'd like to come and get, especially since we'll be leaving town tomorrow. Can we come later this afternoon to pick things up? I stared at the rustling leaves and the orange and yellow tree line surrounding the cemetery. Sure, I said. What time were you thinking? How about four? Lee said. Aunt Sarah gave a nod. My fists were tight, but I knew I had to let things go. I was leaving. What did I care what happened to Grandma and Grandpa's belongings? Sure, four will work. The crowd dispersed until only a few of us were left. Bex kept her arm around me as we walked to her van. I saw his truck at the frontier, she said interpreting my silence. His. Luke's. How she could have known I wanted to talk to him, I didn't know. Gotta love small towns, I replied. Yes, you do, she said with meaning. I do. I love it here. It's why I... She peered toward the mountains, towering in the distance with wistfulness. Why you what? I asked. Is it rock? Is everything okay between you two? Marriage gets this hype, but no one tells you what to do if rust starts to show through the veneer. No one talks about how hard it really is. Whose brilliant idea was it to combine two completely different people with different backgrounds and expectations and make a new life together? And what logic did two equal one? God's logic. God encouraged his children to be one, to be united, which meant it wasn't only possible, but important. And who was I kidding? I had wanted to marry Eli so badly I couldn't see straight. If things ever came around to it, I still wanted to marry someday. 
I wasn't sure any of that was helpful to say to my friend. I didn't know what to say. It's fine, Beck said. We've made it seven years now. It only figures that we'll have good days and bad days. We'll get through it. Are you sure there's nothing I can do? I asked. Baby Sophia cooed, and Bex beamed at her before directing that smile at me. Nothing. At whatever expression was on my face, she went on. I'm okay, really. I shouldn't even be talking to you about this today. Of course you should talk to me, I countered. Bex, I'm here for you. Her expression turned forlorn, and though she didn't speak it, the thought was all over her face. I wasn't there for her. I'd left, and I was planning on leaving again. She hiked baby Sophia higher on her hip. Rock's frustrated with his job. Once they finish harvest, it'll get better. He's always cranky during harvest. We're fine. It's just bad days, that's all. Go find your cowboy, she said, pressing my arm with a smile. I'll come help with the chores again tomorrow if you need me to, okay? You just say the word. Bex. I said, but she'd already started to rally up her kids. I wanted to believe her, but she'd clearly said all she was going to say. I'd talk to her later, but there was something else I had to do first. Maybe it was all the talk about Grandpa's kind and generous heart. Maybe it was that some of his blood flowed in my veins. Whatever it was, I returned to Havenwood Farm and stashed Grandpa's letter in my room. I wasn't ready to face it yet so I placed the envelope on top of my Eli box and closed the closet door. Then I tore into the kitchen at the honeymoon house with a vengeance. Flour and sugar, cinnamon and nutmeg. Everything I needed was right there, including a basket of apples fresh from the trees out back. For a fleeting moment, I wondered if Luke had helped to pick these. I peeled and cut, measured and stirred, and the actions only propelled me to do more— so I cleaned while the aroma of cooked apples and pastry filled the kitchen. I skimmed through what was left in the pantry, threw some outdated cake mixes and cans out, and once the pie was cooled, I threw on my shoes and made my way to the other side of town. The Frontier Inn was quaint, and sure enough, Luke's truck was still parked out front. The receptionist was a teenager I didn't recognize, with thin blonde hair and a cleft in her chin. She barely hesitated to confirm Luke's room number, Thank you, small towns. And my anticipation reached new heights as I approached the door, balanced the pie in one hand, and knocked with the other. Luke answered in jeans and a t-shirt that, pulled tight against his torso, set a match to my blood. Heat flared in my cheeks, and I glanced down to realize I still wore the little black dress I'd donned at Grandpa's funeral. Worse still, smudges of flour patched several places, including my bust line. Luke's brow twitched. He registered the pie in my hand, the disheveled look of my dress, and who knows what the rest of me looked like, and said, Well now, you're the last person I expected to see, least of all with a pie in your hands. It's for you, I said. I came to say I'm sorry. I had no idea how he would react. He left me waiting for several beats before taking the pan from me. Nice of you. Thank you. Do you want to go for a walk? I asked, not sure what I was thinking. Luke and I walking together, with me in a flower-covered dress, would set tongues wagging for sure. Or you could come back. To Grandpa's, I mean. I never meant to kick you out. I only asked you to leave because I needed some time. You wanted to talk last night, and I was defensive and unthinking. I... He stopped my rambling with a hand on my shoulder. It's all right, he said, his eyes twinkling. Remember me calling myself a hothead? I was angry and didn't want to stay where you were. I thought if I left you to handle the animals for a day or two, maybe you'd appreciate me more and see what a good fit I was for the house. You were right, I said, apparently catching him off guard with my quick agreement. Did he expect me to argue against that point? He would be a good fit for the house. It'd be a shame to let a pie this delicious go to waste, he said. How do you know it's delicious? That could be salt on top, for all you know. Would you really have given me a salt pie? His lifted brow was too intriguing. 
I had to look away. Chapter 10 The feeling in Grandpa's kitchen was distinctly different from the last time Luke and I sat at the table. At my invitation, he checked out of the inn and was ready to resume his place at the farm. Where awkward defensiveness and willful misinterpretation of his presence and just about everything else he said had reigned, now the mood was speculative and careful and willing, but uncertain, too. I dished two pieces of pie and sat across from him once more. I see the animals didn't wither and die without me, he said, cutting a bite and moaning the instant it met his mouth. This is delicious. I love a good apple pie. Something warm stirred a smile to my cheeks. Thank you. And I'm sure you do a wonderful job tending these animals, but I grew up here. I was out gathering eggs and tending the horses before and after school. I knew how to handle everything. Except maybe the llamas. My friend Bex and her kids came to help, though, since I had a time crunch. One I didn't blame him for. I hadn't been the nicest person since we'd met. Those llamas have personalities of their own. They're pretty shy and calm, but they're great for kids because of that. You'll have to invite Bex over again and we can take the kids out to meet Hector and Berlioz. We. I may have read too much into the statement, but I liked how that one word sounded. He cut into the crust of his pie, releasing another moan. So good, he said. It's my grandma's recipe, I said. I took another bite as well, enjoying the cinnamon glaze over the apple's just right texture. And I bet the kids would love that. Or Paisley, anyway, since Cody's in school. You should have seen her with the chickens. We ate in silence for a bite before I swallowed, and then I lowered my fork and looked directly at him. Your tribute to my grandpa was really beautiful. How long have you known him? Pie finished, Luke set his fork onto the plate and slid it to the side. I met Hank about three years ago. Your eulogy made it sound like you knew him a lot longer than that. I peered toward the sink where a long rectangular window provided a glimpse of the guest house. But you live here now. Yes, ma'am. Then how did you end up here? I mean, how did you meet my grandpa? I know he was really generous with people and helped many others before you, but he never invited them to take up residence on a permanent basis. Even the hands he'd had help hadn't lived on the property for long, not when I'd been around to help with the chores. Luke laughed, his shoulders shaking as he rested his palm against the table. I can't imagine he would have. See? There. You talk as though you know him better than I do. Does that bother you? Excuse me? That I know him, I mean, he clarified. You act like it's a bad thing. You spoke at his funeral, Luke. At his request. I want to know what happened between you. I was on the rodeo circuit, he said. Got kicked in the chest by the bronc that had bucked me off. Had a couple of broken ribs. He rubbed the spot as if he could still feel the injury. I'm sorry to hear that. But why not go home? Where's your family? Why did he need to come and take over mine? My family, he said in a rehearsed kind of way. My parents live in Burley, but I had a falling out with my older brother Bryce, and he was living at home at the time, so I didn't feel welcome. The rodeo I was injured at happened in Burley. I had a few options for places I could wait out my recovery, but I'd met Hank the day before. He'd called a check on me, and when he found out I had nowhere to go, he brought me here with him. That sounds like something he would do, I said. Grandpa had been notorious for taking in anyone who'd needed it. The occasional problem turned up from his generosity, theft and the like, but it never stopped him from giving. He helped me while I healed and I wanted to make it up to him. Hank said he could use some help now that his family had all gone. I shifted in my seat. His family, meaning me. If I'd never left, Grandpa wouldn't have needed Luke's help. But Eli and I had been planning on living here after we married. 
Eli wanted to go into farming and had arranged things with Grandpa to start working some of his land. It had been too painful to stay after he'd died. Living here, alone, knowing that the life I'd dreamed of would never happen, had been out of the question, and still was. He had a daughter in town, your Aunt Sarah, but she and her daughter weren't all that interested in coming clear out here to help him with the animals every day. Yeah, Lee's sister Allie was still around. She was prissy, which didn't surprise me, considering how pristine and organized their mom was. Neither of them had connected with Grandpa like I did. I couldn't see Allie out there shoveling manure every day. So it's my fault you're here, I said. How so? I was his help, I told him. I... I couldn't go into everything. How Eli and I were planning on moving in with him. Grandpa had been waiting with open arms to welcome Eli Combs into the family. He'd insisted I didn't have to go anywhere. We could stay there, work the land, build a life together, a life just like he and Grandma had. I helped him in exchange for room and board at first, he said, nodding, either not noticing my discomfort or not wanting to draw attention to it. He told me to take over the guest house. He'd had it fixed up for someone else a while back, but they hadn't been using it, so he helped me clean it out. It did look like a nice place to live. I wouldn't mind seeing it, I said. The last time I was here, it was being used as storage. Luke's eyes glinted. You inviting yourself over? A blush torched my cheeks. No, that's not what I meant. Whatever you say. You just say the word and I'd be happy to show you where I sleep. He winked at me, making my face hotter. If I hadn't left, would Grandpa have invited Luke to stay? I already knew the answer. Grandpa had been so generous to so many. But would he have invited him to stay for good? I would have been married to the love of my life. I wouldn't have even noticed Luke then. God has a funny way of making things work out in life, Luke said, turning to rest an arm on the chair back to his left. That wasn't unlike what Aunt Sarah had said. You say funny, I say ironic. You don't believe in God? I didn't say that. I said he likes to arrange things in a way to torture me. Life's got its mishaps for sure, but I wouldn't say God puts roadblocks in people's way to bring them down, more like he puts roadblocks in people's way to bring them to him. I scoffed. I'd heard that before, but having people say something is one thing. Believing it is quite another. In any case, I've been working for Hank ever since. Another thought occurred to me. Are you the one who found him? You know, when he passed? Luke straightened and linked his fingers on the table in front of him. His gaze drifted to the windows above the sink and presumably to the mountains dominating the view outside. I hadn't seen him at all that day, he said with the pang of loss. He looked askance at the sky, but I wondered if he wasn't trying to squint away emotion as well. He usually hit me up for lunch when morning chores were done but it wasn't only my growling stomach that sent me here to the big house in search of him. I knocked a few times. He didn't answer, so I pushed through the main door. He rarely locked it. I nodded, my chest clenched, nails biting into my palms. I searched the house but didn't find him anywhere. Called through, searched all the regular places. He wasn't in watching his game. Luke shook his head with a smile at that. I smiled too, sharing the memory of Grandpa shouting at the team on the screen as though the players could hear his chastising words when they didn't make a play the way he thought they should. I found him on his bathroom floor, Luke admitted, his eyes turning glossy. I knelt to his side and called 911, but he was already gone when I found him. Grandpa, I said with a breath, my heart hurting. Using his thumb, Luke wiped his eyes. Broke my heart on the spot. He was so tough, I thought nothing could take him down. There was that smile again. 
Another tear glinted on Luke's cheek, and he brushed it away. He was tough, I agreed. That's why I thought it'd be okay if I left, I added, not sure why. Something about Luke's openness compelled me to return the favor. Why did you leave? I was surprised Grandpa hadn't told him. It may have been my own insecurity in the moment, but he'd acted as though Grandpa had spilled all of my secrets. Even though Luke was being open with me about his past and how he'd come to be here, I couldn't dredge up the pain about Eli. I just needed a change, I told him, not able to bleed every wound at once. Luke sniffed, wrenching his face in a way that told me he was trying to hold back whatever other tears threatened at the surface. This house sure is a treasure, he said, turning his body and changing the subject all at once. It is. My gaze drifted across the features I used to love so well. The dark kitchen cabinets, the wooden eaves, even the gaudy dated chandelier dangling over the table. Grandma and Grandpa's knickknacks, the old clock made from petrified wood, the pictures of grandkids and frames on the back wall. I used to love it here. But now you want to sell it. Why? His question pulled me back to him, back through all the answers I knew, but couldn't bring myself to give. Luke seemed to grasp as much. He leaned toward me across the table. You could tell me, you know. I don't talk to a whole lot of people around here. Hank always said I was as good to confide in as a horse, he chuckled. Grandpa used to tell his secrets to Grady. He'd mentioned how Grady was the best therapist there was because he'd never share news that didn't belong to him. Anything you say is safe with this old boy. Grandpa had said, patting the paint horse's neck. I like hearing you talk about him, I said. It makes missing him not hurt so much. I miss him too, he said. He was like a father to me. Me too, I said. My mom died when I was two. Grandpa and Grandma took me in and raised me. What about your dad? He and my mom had separated and he lived too far away. Grandma and Grandpa didn't want me to go live with someone who was practically a stranger to me. Dad was all too ready to hand over parental rights to them. That's too bad about your dad, Luke said. But honestly, you couldn't have had better than Hank in this old house. This would have been the perfect segue to bring up Luke buying the house again. But he didn't mention it, and neither did I. I'd given his offer a little bit of thought but I needed more time to sort through all the feelings surging from the wound that seemed to gape a little wider with every day I spent here. And yet, as Bex had said, that pain hadn't killed me like I'd thought it would. Which room was yours? I asked. Which did you stay in while you healed? I could show you if you'd like. I knew I needed to turn my back on this town, this house, on Luke and yet my heart didn't listen to my mind's warnings. I turned my back on those warnings instead and rose from the table, pushing my chair in. Deep down, I knew I should be doing the opposite. I should be turning tail and getting away from here as fast as I could. But I gestured for Luke to lead the way. Chapter 11 Luke guided me past the parlor, his boots thudding on the wood floor with every step. He angled through the entry and in the direction of the stairs. I hope you're not heading where I think you are, I said. Why, you think Hank set me up in your room or something? He better not have. Luke smirked over his shoulder at me. Rather than taking the stairs as I worried he might, he delved into the hall's shadows. He headed past the laundry room, bathroom, toward the sunroom in the back. I think I know where we're going now. In here? He asked, stopping before the room I suspected. I stared at the single bed beside the back window that offered a view of the overgrown garden and the apple trees, trying to imagine an injured Luke in here receiving help from Grandpa. He'd probably sat in the chair by Luke's bed, telling Luke stories about his days in the army or about the trail ride he'd taken Grandma on when he'd proposed. 
Or he dragged Luke out to the parlor to make him watch the latest Lakers game. I loved the sunlight in these windows, Luke said, boots disturbing that sunlight on the room's outrageous blue carpet. Felt like God was smiling at me every time Dawn returned. Sunlight can feel like smiles, I said. How long were you down for? I was bedridden for at least six weeks. Hank got me to the doctor, helped me sort out my insurance, or lack thereof. He laughed. He helped me with so much. It's why I was so glad he was willing to let me work off my time. So he never paid you for working here? I asked, wondering how Luke made a living. He mentioned he'd been saving up. He started to about two years ago, Luke said. Paid more than I thought I deserved. Something we might have to discuss should you decide not to sell. That's right, I said. I guess I'm your employer now. I've never been anyone's employer. The truth was, I hadn't been anyone's anything for a long time. Again, I thought back to Grandpa's letter, wondering if it mentioned the situation with Luke at all. Maybe that was why he'd written it, to make sure I didn't cast Luke off as heartlessly as I had Grandpa. Luke took a step toward me, his body radiating more warmth than the sun and cranking my awareness of him. As a first-time boss, he said, taking his tone down a few notches. I hope you'll take into consideration what your rules are for dating in the workplace. I caught on to the flirtatious lilt in his comment and mirrored it without thinking. Why should I worry about that? Considering our past history, such as it is, you never know what might happen with the two of us here on the property. I was rooted, unable to move. Luke lifted a hand to my face, and I shivered under the touch. His thumb skated across my cheek, his eyes locked with mine. He'd mentioned wanting to kiss me again. Maybe a non-committal second attempt without the alcohol this time wouldn't be so bad. My feet inched toward him. My fingers grazed his rope-like forearm. He really was attractive. My body reacted to him every time we were in the same room. The stone set of his jaw, the playful tease on his features, and invitation in his earth-brown eyes. My eyes roamed across his features, analyzing the scar on his brow and the shape of his mouth, and my pulse responded, kicking up dirt like a newly released bronc. A heavy knock sounded. Footsteps followed, and a loud voice jarred me out of his trance. A little alarmed noise escaped my lips, and I peered to either side for the source of the interruption. Belle, you here? My eyes widened. I stepped guiltily away from Luke, not realizing how close I'd drawn to him. Who's that? Luke asked resting a hand on my arm. The interruption didn't seem to bother him as much as it had startled me. I forgot everyone used to let themselves in here. I attempted to regain my breath as the intruders made themselves known. True enough, Grandpa had had an open-door policy. Any and all family members were welcome to walk right in as they pleased. I raised my voice and didn't fail to notice it was the tiniest bit breathy. In here... Aunt Sarah appeared in the doorway, wearing a pretty black blouse with frilly sleeves. Lee and Allie filed in behind her, both wearing nice jeans and t-shirts. The three of us looked uncannily alike, with thin brows, almond-shaped eyes, and full mouths. Cousins or not, I was closer to Bex than I was to these two, and the expressions on their faces reflected that. They peered around the room, taking in the loud blue carpet, the dated bed with its unimpressive wooden frame, and the anything-but-stylish wallpaper. Lee sniffed, and Allie lifted her nose in disgust. Aunt Sarah's smile faltered at the sight of Luke and me. We'd been reacting to one another like gravitating magnets, and undoubtedly the evidence between us was there for all to see. I recalled his mention of the rules for dating in the workplace— Tucking my hair behind my ears, I wondered if my face was as flushed as it felt. A few boundaries were definitely something we'd need to establish if it came to that. 
Are we interrupting? Aunt Sarah asked. You did say we could come to collect the furniture others inherited, and it's a few minutes after four. I peered at my phone. So it was. No, you're just fine. Luke and I were just reminiscing about Grandpa. He'll be missed, Luke added before anyone could voice their skepticism over the matter. Yes, he will, Aunt Sarah said. Lee sniffed again, and Allie folded her arms, upper lip practically curling over whatever it was she disliked so much in this space. She and Lee had slept over once when we were much younger. The three of us had bunked in this room, laid sleeping bags out on the carpet. We'd had a fun night, flaring our flashlights at the ceiling and making puppet animals. What had changed to make them look at this room the way they did now? Granted, it needed some updates. New flooring, for one thing. But still, the room wasn't that bad. Luke cleared his throat. So you're moving furniture? Aunt Sarah brightened, apparently grateful for the lighter topic. Yes, Arbel got the house. But not everything in it, Lee snickered as though aiming a jab at me. Was she bothered that I inherited the honeymoon cottage? I wasn't the one who wrote the will, I said, lifting my hands in surrender. I wasn't sure what furniture they were referring to. Lee had mentioned the piano, but were they taking a table or something as well? Heavy footfalls interrupted before anyone else spoke, and our group quickly grew in size at the arrival of Uncle Thomas and his wife Mary and their son John, who was a year older than my 23 years. Uncle Marvin wasn't in sight. We ready to load up? Uncle Thomas said without a greeting. John's got to hit the road, and he could really use a bed or two to take with him. Grandpa left you the beds? I couldn't hide my surprise. I peered at the bed Luke and I had been standing next to, and Luke raised his brows in my direction as well. All but yours, Uncle Thomas said with a prideful laugh. Got a list right here. He swiped the screen on his cell phone and displayed a document of some kind on it. I wondered who had put that list together. Were these items things Grandpa had delegated? Or had Uncle Thomas and Aunt Sarah gone through the items that remained with their children to let them pick heirlooms? I really should have looked over those papers Aunt Sarah gave me more carefully. They sat upstairs in my bedroom on the dresser, untouched since the day she'd handed them to me. The piano's not on your list, is it? Lee asked, sidling over to peer at it. I get the piano. Uncle Thomas offered her a momentary view before he jerked his phone to him again. Here, I'll text it to everyone. Then you can all have copies. Everyone but Luke checked his or her phone, and within seconds, the list popped up on my messages. I scrolled through, examining the carefully thought-out assignments and delegations. Uncomfortable tension laced among the group of us, like the points of a spider web. But whether the unease emanated from others' reactions to the list or just my own, I couldn't tell. I didn't like this at all. It wasn't that they'd inherited pieces I'd assumed would be staying with the house. It was the greed in their faces. I get the antiques, Allie added. They'll be perfect for the shop. You're taking things from here so you can sell them? The question slipped from my lips before I could stop it. What? You're selling the house? Lee spat with more venom than I felt the situation warranted. Whoa, where did that come from? The silence that followed was as though every person in the room was demanding an answer of what my decision regarding the house actually was. My forehead crinkled. Uncle Thomas winked at me, and I retreated, suddenly sick inside. Luke watched me expectantly, as did everyone else. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with it yet, I told them, grateful my stop at the real estate office hadn't panned out. Chatter broke out with several voicing their opinions. Heat crowded my head and tingled along the edges of my body. I was too much of a basket case to handle the confrontation right now. Though nothing in the room moved, the walls were closing in. I needed air in the worst way. My phone vibrated in my pocket, and I grasped the opportunity to answer it far too readily. Hello? I gasped several breaths 
waiting for my heart rate to slow, for the invisible walls pillowing over my airways to retreat. I was standing in the house. There was no logical reason for this panic to set in. Yet here it was all the same. The second panic attack I'd had in just as many days. That was too, too many in my opinion. I needed to conquer this. I just wasn't sure how. Bell, my boss Rodney said. I got your email. Sorry to hear you've hit a few snags, but I have two clients who've requested you do their write-ups. They'd like to meet in person to discuss their brand. Oh, another breath. The room still blurred along the edges, so I pushed out the front door and onto the porch, drawing in a longer span of clean, farm-fresh air. One of the goats bleated, adding to the respite I was seeking. When are they wanting to meet? I can't make it back right away yet. I thought you said I was okay to work distantly. More breaths. More relief. Slowly, the anxiety lining my vision and spiking my pulse began to dissipate enough that I didn't feel I was going to lose complete control. I did, but we want these accounts, Belle, and they specifically asked for you. Commotion stirred behind me. I peered through the screen to find Luke watching with concern as Uncle Thomas and John organized the removal of the dining table. They were taking the table? Another glance through the windows to my right showed Lee lifting throw pillows Grandma had embroidered from the couch and stuffing them into a black sack. My anxiety flared right back where it was before. Belle, Rodney said. Did I lose you? I'm here. I took a few steps down the porch toward the overgrown patch of grass in the center of the gravel. I didn't care that they were clearing the house. They were right. I was going to sell it. What did it matter what was inside when I did so? Grandma cross-stitched and embroidered many of those pillows, and Lee had plucked them off like they were candy on the roof of a gingerbread house. I collected another long breath through my nose. We just had the funeral today, I told him, working to keep my voice steady. I'd love to help, but I need a few days. Can you please tell them I'm flattered, but I can't make it back for at least another week? though I suddenly wanted to make that longer, too. What about Bex? I'd said I'd be there for her, and I wanted to be. I didn't have to be in close proximity to her to offer support, though, did I? Aunt Sarah held the door open while Uncle Thomas and John lugged the dining table out to the awaiting moving truck, its ramp already stretched open and waiting. I couldn't do this. I couldn't watch them gut the place like vultures. John lost his footing and slammed too hard on his way out, knocking the screen door off its hinges. Luke hurried to pick up the table's other end and help him down the porch steps. I'm sorry, Belle, Rodney said. You're right, and I don't mean to be insensitive. Is that why you sound so distracted? The cool air siphoned into my body, taking on the flare in my nerves and making them simmer. Sorry, I have to go. I'll meet them on Zoom if they want, I added. And I'll get to those write-ups tomorrow, okay? Rodney agreed, and I hung up and hurried over, relieved to find Luke now holding the other end of the table in John's place. Not only was his side lifted higher than it had been when John had held it, but his footing was sure as he guided the table toward the awaiting truck. The afternoon passed in similar fashion, my anxiety flaring at unexpected moments, and causing me to step outside for a few breaths, all while either Aunt Sarah or Uncle Thomas kept track of items being removed. That's not on the list, Aunt Sarah said to Lee, who tried making off with the antique Christmas decorations. She skimmed the screen on her phone and pointed to a section. See here, it says Grandpa wanted those to stay with the house. Figures, Lee said, glaring at me as though I'd had something to do with it. Allie dropped one of the boxes at the pronouncement. Several fragile-sounding glass pieces tinkled within, and I couldn't help flinching. I hoped it wasn't the snow globes. Not only were they irreplaceable, but if broken, they'd make a terrible mess. I watched as the house was gradually stripped from the inside out. 
Of course, inheriting it didn't mean the furniture and antiques were all included in the package. I just never considered how much emptier it would seem without the glass cabinet displaying hand-painted teacups that had been used by my great-grandparents, the piano I'd learned to play on, and several of the beds, including the one Luke had stayed in during his recovery. Pictures, keepsakes, couches and crystal glassware, even the rugs from the entryway in the hall and rooms without carpet had been rolled up and confiscated. I had grown up here. While none of this stuff belonged directly to me, it still felt like it was mine. The family acting as though I had no attachment to these items made things that much more difficult. Uncle Thomas must have read the forlornness in my expression. At one point, when the house seemed at its emptiest, he sidled close and swept his hand in front of us as if presenting a picture. Just look at all this space, he said. Young girl like you doesn't need it. See how this could fit a reception desk now? He gestured to the empty entryway before rotating to indicate the almost too spacious dining and kitchen area. Kitchen's big enough for company, and there's ample rooms here to make a killing off passersby. People come this way for the hunting, the skiing at the resort. It's the perfect location for a B&B. He then indicated the windows before us, which were growing gradually darker with the setting sun outside. All that room for parking, he said with longing. The secluded area is perfect here. It's prime real estate to offer trail rides, too, with all them horses. We could hire a cook or two and a few house cleaners on staff. I grew more and more resistant the longer he spoke. I don't see it like that at all. But you could, he said. With all this furniture gone, surely you can see the potential. You could even partner with me if you're not ready to let it go all at once just yet. I shook my head, my jaw clenching. Grandpa told me it was a terrible idea to mix business with family. Uncle Thomas laughed, a boisterous, booming, belittling sound, and clapped me on the shoulder. Don't listen to everything the old man told you, he said, trying to reel me closer. He was wise, I argued, slipping free from his touch. Be that as it may, it's a viable option, Belle. I don't see this place as a B&B. &B. Uncle Thomas rubbed his jaw. John knocked on the slanted screen door, gesturing for his dad to join him outside. Thomas lifted his hand in response and took a step toward him and away from me. I breathed a little easier the instant he moved. I'll give you some time to consider, he said, as though my decision had anything to do with him. But think about it, would you? You don't need all this. Them animals are such a hassle. So much work. John knocked impatiently on the screen door a second time, and Uncle Thomas gave me a little nod before backing out of the door and to the moving truck. I couldn't equate this house and its property and animals in the same viewfinder he did. Hassle, viable option, parking space where I saw beloved land and sentimental potential, he only saw dollar signs. Then again, was he right? Was I missing out on an opportunity? He had a valid point. I wasn't staying. I didn't need Havenwood Farm. It was selfish and wasteful for me to take this house without putting it to its full and best use. Uncle Thomas wavered on his way out, Still on the porch, chin in his hand, he stalked over to the wider part of the deck where the wooden rocking chair lingered with arms open to receive its next visitors. Well now, how did we miss this beauty? He circled the chair, eyeing it with all the greed and intention of a hungry lion orbiting its prey. I don't recall this being on the list. That's because it's not, Luke said. His voice had a commanding side I'd never heard him use before. He sounded almost threatening, and considering the way Uncle Thomas had laid claim to just about everything he could get his hands on, that wasn't surprising. It was almost like Luke felt protective of the chair. 
I gave that to Hank, so I'll be taking it back. Uncle Thomas looked as though he was ready to argue the point, but Luke stood his ground, chin elevated. The tension between them was thick with unmistakable heat. That's possessive of you, Uncle Thomas said. The way I hear it, when you give someone a gift, it belongs to them. I made this, Mr. Toby, Luke said. His tone had cooled just a bit, but was still firm. It was a gift to Hank, and if it's all the same to you, I'd rather it not be listed in your niece's store or hoarded by someone who won't appreciate it as much as he did. Hank told me I could preserve this for my own heirloom when he was gone. Luke made that rocking chair? I didn't like the look in Uncle Thomas's eyes. Why couldn't he just take no for an answer? Pity, he finally said, shoulders relaxing as his posture admitted defeat. That's a fine piece. It was still unclear whether Uncle Thomas was going to leave the piece where it sat. After divagating for several more seconds, he relented and pronounced himself out of here. I'm off as well, Aunt Sarah said. Her daughters had long since left. Lee and her family were headed back to Arizona, and Allie needed to manage her boutique store in Burley, which was 20 minutes east of Bridgewater. I was glad they hadn't been there to fight over the rocking chair. It did have the look of something that might fit well in Allie's shop. Need some help with these last few boxes? Luke asked. I couldn't believe he was still here, especially after Uncle Thomas had tried making off with the chair he'd built. He left it on the porch, mighty trusting in my opinion. In any case, Luke had done the majority of the heavy lifting, from beds to couches to the hutch that had been opposite the dining table. That would be great, Aunt Sarah said. Your help today was invaluable. Not at all, Luke said, bending impressively and situating his sure hands beneath two boxes at once. I bent for the third and followed Aunt Sarah out. We sure got a lot done in a short amount of time, she said, leading the way. We did. It doesn't look the same, I said, hauling the boxes containing the china dishes Lee had inherited, but had decided to leave at her mom's house until a later date. Or she was just saying that so that Allie could collect them and sell them at her boutique shop, which I suspected was highly likely. We'll get through this, Aunt Sarah said. From her solemn tone and the sad tinge in her gaze, I suspected she was feeling the impact of change as well. This was the house she'd grown up in, too. I suspected this was a weird and sad experience for her just as much as it was for me. She led the way out the front door. I peered past the box in my arms the best that I could, and Luke took up the rear with two boxes stacked on top of one another. We piled the boxes into the open trunk of Aunt Sarah's car, which she was going to take back home with her. No one had wanted Old Blue, so I'd have the pickup at my disposal. At least there was that. Uncle Thomas drove out, taking the monstrously large moving truck he'd brought with them. It roved slowly over the ruts in the drive, and it left marks on the grass where he'd parked it for the most direct angle. Aunt Sarah nodded to Luke, and he slammed the trunk closed. Thanks again, she said. That would have taken me twice as long without your help. Happy to, Luke said, straightening. Something in his back creaked in response, and he glanced to the house with the light gleaming from its many windows. Although the house will take some getting used to without all its duds. I couldn't bring myself to vocally agree with him. There was too much. Too much taken. Too much altered. Too much that would never be the same again. He was gone. Grandpa was gone. Well and truly gone. And every part of his personality, of the life he'd breathed into the house, was gone too. It'll be okay. Aunt Sarah said, taking my hand in hers. The warmth of her skin made me aware of just how cold the evening had gotten. This is hard for everyone, Belle, but if you ask me, you've gotten the best part of him. He loved this house, this farm. She cast her gaze across the barnyard. This is your chance to add on to that. Make this place your own. She pressed my hand with the statement. 
I shook my head, still too emotional for words. She patted my cheek, bade Luke good night, and slid into her car. I stood motionless, watching her car brave the ruts in the road, bobbling up and down around them before she reached the curve and disappeared into the trees. At least I got to see it one more time before they cleared out, Luke said. I have you to thank for that. You and that pie. I rubbed away the cool fall air biting through my sleeves. It's not all gone. They didn't touch my room. There you go. Way to look for those silver linings. With a gradual inhale, I headed toward the porch. I'm not a silver lining kind of person. I climbed the first step. Luke remained on the ground. Your aunt is right. You could do a lot to make this place your own if you wanted to. I shook my head. The cold air pushed me up a few more stairs. I don't know. It's been a long, emotional day. Yeah. He laid his hand on the railing. It wobbled under his grasp. Luke steadied it and tossed a grin at me. Looks like even the best things need a little looking after. I guess they do. He climbed the step. So, who's looking after you, Miss Bell? My mouth went dry. I took in his handsome features, the warm brown of his gaze. The temptation and heat of his body were a call to my weary soul. I longed to step toward him, to have him wrap me in his arms, to lose myself in his kiss the way I'd wanted to the night we'd met. He was probably tired, too. He could probably use the comfort from me, but that was a wasp nest I couldn't play near again. I fought my every inclination and retreated another step toward the house instead of him. I'm looking after myself. The slightest trace of disappointment flashed over his face. I hurried to ease it the best that I could. Thanks for your help. You didn't have to stick around. Sure I did. You made me pie. Why fight this? Why not go to him like we both wanted? Invite him inside. Logically, I wasn't sure where we would nestle together to comfort one another, though, considering that the only piece of furniture that remained was my bed, and that was out of the question. I took another step backward, standing unsteadily on the porch itself now. I couldn't let him think I was completely uninterested. That chair really is beautiful. You like to work with wood? Have you built other things besides that? It's a hobby, he said. Gives me something to do when I'm not dealing with the animals around here. You built it here on the farm? I did, he said. Hank gave me a portion of the barn for my tools. That chair was the price. I smiled. Nothing like Grandpa's generous heart, taking payment in the form of rocking chairs for renting a space. You'll have to show me sometime, I said. I'd like that. He inclined his head, a little twitch of approval at the corner of his mouth. I'll hold you to it. Good night, Belle. Good night, Luke. I felt him watch me until I closed the door and was greeted by a startlingly empty and unfamiliar space. The piano, the couches, the bench in the entryway. The house was now nothing but an empty shell. They'd left me the chair that had been in the room Luke had recovered in, and it now sat against the wall in the vacant dining room. At least some of the pictures remained on the wall, but the family had scoured through everything like termites. I squeezed my eyes shut and climbed the stairs, hoping what I'd said before was true and that no one had touched my room. Fortunately, it looked exactly as I'd left it, my twin-sized brass bed, dresser, mirror, pictures, and awards. With the closet door left open, I was able to catch sight of a few things inside it. The card-sized envelope Aunt Sarah had given me at the funeral contrasted with the brown cardboard box I'd placed it on. Feet sore, heart weary, I stepped into my closet and picked up the envelope. Not today, Grandpa, I said, staring at his writing on the exterior. I couldn't handle one more thing today, not when I felt as gutted as the farmhouse now was. I glanced at the forgotten things I'd left in my closet, 
and my chest gave a little lurch. The pink cowgirl hat I'd gotten in Texas. Old pieces from Halloween costumes. Mouse ears from our trip to Disneyland the last time I'd gone to visit my dad over ten years ago. Other than the occasional visit, I'd never really had much of a relationship with him. And in the back of my closet were the corners of a box I knew by heart. Everything that reminded me of Eli was in that box. Pictures, our wedding announcements, love notes passed in class, flyers from rodeos we'd attended, dried corsages from dances he'd taken me to. I'd tossed everything in that box and stuffed it in the darkest corner I could find. I set Grandpa's letter on top of the box once more, backed out, and closed the door. Chapter 12 I woke before dawn. Not having anywhere else to set up my laptop, I situated myself the best I could on my bed with my back propped against the pillows and placed my computer on my legs. I checked emails, went over client spreadsheets, and watched the morning's newfound light stream in. Usually, I could look over the specs of a company's product and the brand we'd worked together on and come up with an intriguing spiel to sell their products on whatever online source they wanted, but a dam had erected in my brain, blocking any kind of inspiration whatsoever. This isn't good, I said. I hadn't heard from my boss since our distracted phone call the day before, but as I told him I'd hammer out this blurb today, I was determined to do it first thing and get it over with. Time to prove I wasn't a complete wreck. All I could think about, though, was Luke. The sweet glint in his eyes. The enticing, completely unnerving question he'd posed when he'd walked me to the porch last night. What would have happened if I'd responded openly? If I'd told him I was willing to let him look after me? Knowing the gallant, self-assured man that he was, he would have swept me into his embrace. And maybe we would have gone to his place instead of mine, since my house was so lacking in seating arrangements. I'd said I wanted to see what the shed looked like. I suddenly lost myself in a swirl of fantasy, where his lips would have captured mine, where we would have walked in a tango of kissing bliss all the way to his door, where he would have opened his house without breaking a sweat and guided me to his couch and explored my mouth under more comfortable circumstances. I grew hot just thinking about it. He'd said he liked kissing me, and the truth was, I'd liked kissing him too. I wouldn't mind doing it again, though, if I were honest, it was hard to remain alert whenever he stood that close to me, whether I was drunk or not. I resituated my focus onto my laptop, where it belonged. It was time to stop these thoughts in their tracks. Which is exactly why it's good you didn't give in last night, I told myself. I had the feeling that before we parted, I'd made Luke feel unwanted. The opposite was true, however. He was definitely wantable. Even so, nothing could come of a fling between Luke and me. How could I allow anything to happen when I didn't know what tomorrow would bring? I was leaving. Starting anything between us now would be unfair to him. It would be unfair to both of us. My concentration was a little better as I proceeded to make my way through the product blurbs. But even after I'd made a few attempts, I could tell what I'd written wasn't up to my usual standard. I might as well type, Hey, buy this, it's good, for all the effectiveness my words had. This isn't getting me anywhere, I said. A break might be what I needed. And possibly some breakfast. I dressed by the light of my bedside lamp, slipped into an oversized hoodie I hadn't worn in years, stuffed my feet into the boots I used when the animals were my daily task, and headed down the stairs. Though I knew we'd emptied the house of its furnishing the day before, knowing and seeing it were two very different things. The bareness was as astonishing as if I'd strolled onto a nude beach. Nothing was there anymore, and the lack made the rooms appear larger and emptier than the openness of the Grand Canyon. 
I trudged straight through the dining room to the kitchen, rather than angling around the table as I'd done my entire life. At least they left me some dishes, I said with sarcasm, and poured myself a bowl of cereal. The milk I'd purchased at the mercantile was still in the fridge, an appliance that was too dated to be worth much notice, according to Uncle Thomas. That suited me perfectly. I guess that was the style now. Antiquated furnishings and updated appliances were the way to go. I stood at the counter to eat, watching a few broadcasts of the news on my phone and scrolling idly through social media, but by the time my cereal was finished, a low ache had settled into my back. I'm not staying, I argued with the voice that told me it was time to hit up the furniture store in neighboring Burley. Why would I buy furniture for a house I'm not keeping? Houses sell better when they're staged, a voice responded, which was true. Many people went to great lengths, even hiring a designer to stage the homes they were trying to sell. People liked places to look lived in, and they often pictured their own belongings easier in a space if they could see a different setup situated there. And you can't spend the rest of your time here standing. I could, I supposed, but it wouldn't be nearly as comfortable. Worst case scenario, I could take the new furniture home with me once the house sold. My couch in Portland was secondhand. My apartment could use some fixing up. Even if I purchased the furniture set here, I could rent a moving truck like Uncle Thomas did and drive it back when it was time to go. Besides, what else was I going to do with my time here while I waited to figure things out? At least this way, I'd feel like I was accomplishing something. Maybe if I had somewhere comfortable to sit, I could concentrate enough to get my work up to its usual level. Aunt Sarah had taken her car back yesterday, so I needed to see what the situation was with Grandpa's truck. I cleaned my breakfast dishes. Going outside meant I might end up bumping into Luke. My heart fluttered in anticipation of seeing him again. The air was cool and damp. Wind rustled through the leaves, and the rooster's crow was both alarming and gratifying at once. I hadn't wanted to admit it, but I really loved this place. I hadn't allowed myself to remember just how much. The garage was positioned about ten feet away from the house, probably something that had been built at a later date. Hands in my pockets, I trudged along the gravel toward it, but before my feet reached the structure with its swing-out oak doors that showed wear and had started to warp, clanging noises sounded from the barn. I peered in its direction, expecting to find Luke tinkering around, perhaps pushing the wheelbarrow again or bending to retrieve a tool he dropped while fixing the fences, but he was nowhere in sight. The sound of heavy machinery whirring followed. I peered through the garage's side windows enough to catch a sight of Old Blue, Grandpa's 1970s pickup with its classic blue exterior interrupted by a thick horizontal white stripe. The sight was enough for me for now. Furniture shopping was all well and good, but I'd need some help getting it here. An employee at the store could undoubtedly help me load the pieces into Old Blue, but what about when I got them here? I entered the barn through its pedestrian door and inhaled the mixture of manure and wood. Grady peered at me as I passed his stall. Hey there, boy, I said, stopping to rub his nose. Sweetie didn't respond more than a few pricks of her ears but Walnut's nose drifted over the stall as if he sensed I was there. I'd seen my horse a few times, mostly the morning Bex and I had cleaned out their stalls, but I hadn't stopped by to pay my old gelding much attention. Hey, boy, I said with a twinge of guilt. Grandpa wasn't the only one I'd walked out on. He nuzzled my cheek, giving me a welcome I didn't deserve. I rubbed his neck, leaning close and pressing my forehead to his, a strange prickling taking place inside of me. I'm sorry I left you, I told him, straightening. He eyed me with a peaceful, knowing glance. His dark, nutty color was my favorite. I scratched his mane a few times, something I used to do for him regularly. I wanted to assure him that I was back for good, but much as I wanted to, I couldn't make an empty promise. He wasn't like the furniture I was hoping to get. 
I couldn't take him back to Oregon with me. Maybe we'll take a ride, I said, sticking to something I could follow through on. We used to love our rides, didn't we? He glanced in my direction, and not for the first time, I wished there was some way to communicate more directly with him. I imagined soaring on his back across the wooded land just past the barn, a brief stretch of trees among the otherwise flat, rocky land that wedged between Havenwood and the cemetery. After my chores were done, since I had nothing else to do, I'd saddle up Walnut and take him surging across the wooded area, the wind blowing through my hair, the feeling that I was in the air as I rode astride his back. The genuine connection I'd felt with him had been like nothing else. Surely, before I left again, I could make time for one more ride. I patted him again and turned toward what sounded like metal scraping on metal. The barn opened into its second section, which used to be a storage area for Grandpa's tools, equipment, and whatever he wanted out of the house but couldn't yet face getting rid of permanently. The distinctive scent of wood shavings eddied through. Though the lawnmower, cabless tractor, and other lawn tools were in their usual places, an entire area had been cleared to make room for other tools I didn't recognize quite as easily. Several saws were placed on a cabinet that had once been storage for animal feed boxes Grandpa didn't want to deal with, and tools. A lathe took the back left-hand corner, looking like a metal dog. Luke stood before it, wearing a fitted t-shirt and jeans, cowboy hat flicked high onto his forehead, as though its brim had been in his way. His hands rested on his hips, and he stared down the piece of wood in his hands as though contemplating its existence. I was surprised he'd have his wood shop here, so close to the horse's. Perhaps the loud sounds from the equipment didn't bother them. Hey, I said, making myself known. Luke pivoted, still holding the long piece of wood in both of his hands. The action made his biceps bulge impressively. This is it, huh? The space Grandpa rented to you? Yep. What are you working on? He placed the board onto the counter and removed his phone from his back pocket. Luke searched for a few seconds and then, finding the sought-for image, turned the screen to me. A beautiful, narrow table befit for an entryway was on display, serving as a perch for a vase of flowers on a lacy table runner. That's beautiful. My mom's birthday is coming up in February, he said. She's mentioned wanting something nice in her entryway for a while now, but says she's never found anything that's the right fit. So I've done some looking. I took pictures of her existing furniture and figured this might match the style exactly. I was impressed that he would go to such lengths to please her. If she doesn't like that, I'll be surprised, especially since you're taking the time to make it for her. Yeah, she's much easier to please than some of my other family. What does that mean? Who was he having a hard time pleasing? And why did he feel the need to? He shook away the frustration simmering behind his eyes and smiled. Never mind. What are you up to today? I considered pushing for answers, but the moment had passed. I might not be the only one with things I didn't want to talk about. I need somewhere to sit, I told him. Sounds like a personal problem. He stuffed a few tools into one of the drawers and closed it again. You know, it kind of is but it's more so a reason why I didn't ask you to stay longer last night. He paused and peered over his shoulder. Oh? Heat flared at the admission. Yeah, we wouldn't have had anywhere to hang out. I'm good at sitting on the floor, he said. He retrieved the broom from its place in the corner and began to sweep, collecting a small mountain of wood shavings in a short amount of time. I don't doubt what you're good at, I said but when it comes to floor sitting, I'm not. Not for long periods of time, anyway. I prefer something a little softer. I retrieved the dustpan and offered it to him. He took it, and we both held onto the metal piece, lost in one another's gazes for a moment. Long periods of time, huh? A twinkle flickered in his eyes, adding a glimmer of mischief. The look was one meant for inside jokes and conversations behind closed doors. Just how long were you planning on me staying if you'd have had seating arrangements? Warmth surged through me at the implication, 
and the twist he'd added to my words. My earlier fantasies of cuddling and feeling his lips on mine replayed with acute clarity, and it took every ounce of effort I had not to allow my eyes to stray in the direction of his. Chapter 13 It was time to get this conversation back on track. My point is that I wonder if you wanted to come with me into Burley to pick out a few things. Make a man choose his own seating arrangements, he said in playful displeasure. Or I just want you there to help me carry stuff, I added, although the furniture company had movers for a reason. He quirked a grin, an unspoken assumption crossing between us as though he knew exactly what I'd pictured us doing from the instant I awoke this morning. He tapped the dustpan into the garbage, returned the broom to its corner, and dusted his hands. I'm just about done here, then I'll shower and pick you up. Pick me up? I'm the one who offered. You're not driving that old blue hunk of metal, he said, pointing in the direction of the garage. I'll drive. I folded my arms, offended on the pickup's behalf. What do you have against old blue? Nothing, he said, turning his back to me and flicking the power switch on the bandsaw. He then adjusted several of the boards lying flat on a lower shelf and looked over a few more of the machines to ensure they were off. Nothing? I wasn't buying that. Was he one of those guys who insisted on driving the nicest vehicles on the market? I didn't know what year his pickup was, but it certainly didn't look brand new. I'll have you know, that is the truck Grandpa taught me how to drive in, I said as Luke gestured for me to precede him toward the horses. I'm glad to hear it. I greeted Grady, Walnut, and Sweetie while Luke checked the lid on the horse feed and waited for me to step outside so he could lower the hatch over the barn door to keep critters out. Then would you care to elaborate as to why you're too good to sit in Grandpa's classic vehicle? Another thought crossed my mind. Perhaps it wasn't the truck he took issue with. Perhaps he didn't want to ride with me, though I couldn't fathom why not. He sniffed and removed the gloves from his hands before peering in the garage's direction. It's a fine pickup, he said, and I'm sure it's quite suitable when it's got an engine under its hood. My mouth dropped. I was flummoxed. That was what I got for not venturing all the way into the garage to inspect the truck myself before discussing this with him. What happened to its engine? I tore it out about two months ago. Luke said. Good thing I didn't need to take it anywhere, I said with just a hint of sarcasm. Aunt Sarah had let me use her car until after the funeral. She must not have known Old Blue was out of order. What if there had been some kind of emergency? Are you planning on replacing the engine anytime soon? I've been waiting for the right parts to come in. Leo down at the steel shop in town ordered it for me, but he says they're back-ordered. I even looked it up myself. Guess they don't make carburetors and other parts for 1970s models like they manufacture everything else. Imagine that, I said, waiting for the embarrassment of my ignorance to subside. Okay, then. If you're up for it, I'd love your help going into town. Happy to oblige. You just go on and give me a minute to clean up. He indicated a finger toward the farmhouse. I have nowhere to sit, remember? Luke examined the house as if searching out a solution. I don't know. That porch is looking pretty friendly. Or you can come with me. Sit at my place. Sit at his place? Sure. While he showered. Either the same thought hadn't crossed his mind, or it didn't make every single one of his nerves fire off like cannons the way it did mine. He sauntered toward the shed without waiting for a reply. I followed, crossing the gravel to where the shed with its welcoming porch awaited. Luke ambled up the steps and twisted the knob. He peered back long enough to see that I was coming and waited until I entered before closing the door behind us. The awareness I'd experienced earlier heightened monumentally, being in this confined space with only him. I sensed every one of his movements, the step he took past the love seat in front of the window, 
the way he scraped a hand through his blonde hair, the tension in his body as he gestured toward his unmade bed and the mess of dishes in the sink. Bed's not made, he said. I wasn't exactly expecting company. But you're welcome to sit at the table, the couch, or any of the fine accommodations you see before you until I get done. Fire blazed in his eyes as they locked with mine. I searched for a witty comeback, but I didn't sit. I remained by the door, uncertain how to hold myself, let alone how to maneuver through his space as though I belonged here. He retrieved a few items from his drawer and then crossed to the bathroom and stepped inside. With the light on, he shucked out of his shirt just before closing the door behind him, giving me a glimpse of the fine shape of his toned arms and back. Heat slammed into my cheeks. I hurried to turn away, and it took more than a few minutes for me to resume regular functions like thinking without picturing the sight of him shirtless. Okay, then. I searched for something to occupy my time, meandered to the sink and cleaned the few dishes he had there, then straightened up a bit. The smell of ivory soap filtered through. I drew in a deep inhale when singing chorused through the walls as well, stopping me short as I placed a plate in the drying rack beside the sink. Luke belted the familiar words about beautiful mornings from the musical Oklahoma. A giggle escaped its way up my throat, and I bit my lower lip to harness it. Not only did Luke sing in the shower, but he had a boisterous, lively voice bursting with tone. He hit just the right pitches as he finished the song and jumped to a more popular country tune, a song I loved that Josh Turner happened to make famous. When he opened the door and released the steam from his shower, I held my breath. He wore what looked like a fresh pair of jeans and a graphic t-shirt with a Star Wars logo on it. His hair was deliciously tousled and wet, and he must have freshly sprayed on some cologne because the scent instantly struck me like a well-aimed arrow, making my mouth water. You're standing, he said. I'm disappointed in you, Miss Bell. You know, I didn't sit once the whole time you were in there, I said. How could I when he'd given me the image of him shirtless and a chorus to go along with it? So you did my dishes? I needed a distraction. Your singing was, let me guess, swept you off your feet. I was impressed. Luke placed his towel on the back of the only chair at the small round dining table and sauntered toward me. I froze in place at the ardent fixation on his face. Awareness fissured over me. Heat climbed up my throat as I lost myself in his eyes, in his enticing smell, and in the way damp locks of hair tumbled over his forehead. See that couch? He must have gestured to it because his body shifted, but I didn't take my eyes from his. I moved toward it. What about it? His hand slid around my waist, fastening me to him. Nothing. Just thought you might like to try it out. Isn't that why you came over here? To have a place to sit? I... I had no thoughts whatsoever. He saved me the trouble. His lips crashed over mine, and we tumbled onto that couch, him sitting, me practically landing on his lap while our mouths worked together. Everything about him drew me in closer. The way he smelled, the fresh feel of his rough fingertips against my cheek, the fervent movement of his lips against mine. Something told me Luke Holden was the kind of man who was good at everything, no matter what it was. Moving furniture, tending animals, singing in the shower, holding me with just the right amount of direction and confidence. He kissed with urgency and languor, as though this was all he wanted to do at that moment, but he wanted to make the most of it at the same time. For the record, I said while his lips coaxed their way along my jawline, this is not why I came over. Isn't it? His mouth made its way back and worked its magic a little longer before he pulled away. See what I tell you. The couch is perfect, I said, placing another kiss on his mouth. You need one, too. Definitely. 
Several more kisses ensued, driving me to the point where I sensed something shift between us. A kind of settling, where if I didn't move, we might end up taking things farther than either of us was ready for. Which means we'd better get going, I said, easing my lips away from his. His eyes were still languid and hazy, half-lidded with desire. He lifted his chin, directing his attention on my mouth. I gave him a final, drawn-out kiss, relishing the feel of his hands on my ribs, holding me close. You taking me or what? My voice was still breathless. You're still talking about furniture shopping, right? He said, giving me another distracting kiss. And chairs? A dining table, maybe? I need enough furniture to stage the house. The statement jarred him. He blinked the dreaminess away completely and met my eyes with more calculation this time. With his hands on my arms, he held me at enough of a distance and looked directly at me. Stage the house, he repeated. You mean you're still selling it? Regret soured the moment we'd just shared. That kiss was completely intense and world-rocking, and by all rights shouldn't have happened at all. I hadn't meant to kiss him like that. I'd resolved not to. I'd resolved to do the right thing and be fair to him, but obviously my self-control only went so far. I, yes, I'm selling it. A knot formed in the pit of my stomach. Luke lifted me from his lap as though I weighed hardly anything at all. I adjusted my shirt, wishing there was an easier way to slow my rapid heartbeat. Luke stood as well, smoothing a hand through his hair. His forehead had a granite set to it, brows firmly cast over his hazel eyes. My offer still stands, he said. Embarrassingly enough, it took me several moments before I related the mentioned offer to what he was actually talking about. My mind was still wound up in that kiss, and my breath hadn't yet slowed. Why do you want the house? I asked him. The embers from the fire in his eyes had lost their luster. His voice was no longer flirty and inviting, but brusque and irritated. Does it matter? I'm a ready buyer. I have the funds. I've been saving everything I could since I got here. If you're so eager to get out of town, why not take me up? Sell me the house, Bell. His suddenly confrontational manner got my back up. I don't want to. Why not? What's keeping you here? I heard the rest of his unspoken question, if not me. I couldn't care for him that much, not when I'd only known him for a few days. To keep the house just to be closer to him when we'd known one another so briefly was ludicrous. The image of Grandpa's letter flashed through my mind, but I wasn't going to mention that to him, not when I didn't yet know what it contained. I think you'd better get someone else to drive you into town, he said, going to the door and opening it. The signal was completely clear. He wanted me gone. I'm not helping you if all it's for is to list the place. Luke, I said, not knowing what I was going to add. What else could I say? I wasn't going to stay. I couldn't bring myself to say it, though I also couldn't bring myself to explain why. The fury in his expression was just as passionate as his kisses had been. He scowled at me, something deep, something impenetrable, and I couldn't shake the notion that I'd hurt him again. So I did what he wanted. Head high, I stepped out the door, and without a word, he closed it behind me. He didn't slam it, though he had every right to. Chapter 14 Sunlight struck my skin, glaring in my vision. My eyelids drifted shut. Regret scoured through me. It seemed ironic that part of my problem in returning here was that everyone in town knew. And yet, I faced having to tell the story to the one person who didn't. Why shouldn't I tell him, though? Keeping the details to myself was unkind, especially after what Luke and I had just shared. I touched a finger to my lips. 
they were still swollen, and I was still haunted with the traces of his pressed against them. It wasn't only the kiss, though. Luke had spent his day yesterday helping my family, helping me. He'd expressed concern for me, and though we hadn't known one another long, the attraction that flared between us any time he was around wasn't the only notable change. He felt like someone I was becoming friends with. He deserved to know, to understand. Bolstering my courage, I lifted my fist and hammered it against his door several times. He didn't answer. I knocked again, harder this time, and the door flew open. I think we've said all there is to say, he snapped. I'm sorry. The tension in his expression slackened. He clearly wasn't expecting that. I went on. That wasn't said, and it needed to be. Clearly, he'd been ready for another confrontation, for more excuses, or heck, even for me to ask him to drive me into town again. The contention in his face drained, and his shoulders relaxed, shifting into something that almost looked like worry. Luke stepped out, closed the door, and sat on the single-step porch. When are you going to tell me what's going on with you? He said, patting the empty space beside him. The abrasive edges in his tone were gone. His question, his expression, both teemed with compassion. And though he didn't come right out and say it, I felt it. Luke cared about me. He wanted to know because he cared. I lifted my chin and prayed for courage, for the ability to speak without losing it completely or having my anxiety take over like had been happening so often lately. I took his invitation and bent to seat myself at his side. Luke's warm body beside mine was bolstering, his gaze letting me know he was there and listening. Everywhere I go, everything I see reminds me of him. Your grandpa? I shook my head. For some reason, it wasn't as painful talking about this with Luke as I thought it would be, probably because he didn't know the truth like everyone else in this town did, that I'd been the one behind the wheel, that I was to blame for Eli's death. I rested my hands on my knees and stared at the side of the barn, grateful to have somewhere to look away from Luke. A bird flapped its way across the sky. I fell in love when I was 14 years old. Loved the same boy all through high school. He and I were the same age and in the same grade. We made plans. And as we planned, he proposed to me about a year after high school ended. Talking about Eli had a physical effect over my entire body. But I found I could breathe easily enough through it, so I went on. The wedding was slated for a year later, though what we were waiting for, I've never figured out. We coordinated, scheduled the church, made arrangements. I went to dress fittings and ordered the cake and the decorations, addressed the invitations. Finally, the time had passed. The wedding was a week away. He and I liked to go for drives and just talk while taking in the scenery. One night at dusk, with the orange sun blazing right in my line of sight, we were out driving up by the cemetery, you know, where Grandpa was buried. That seems a little morbid, but the drive is pretty. The train bridge is up there, too. It was secluded and one of our favorite places to go and talk. Kissing went on there, too, but I wasn't going to mention that. Luke indicated his understanding, inclining his head for me to continue. I wiped moisture from my palms, gathered a breath, and did so. During harvest time, trucks are all over these roads, going back and forth from fields to the dump sites, hauling their loads to be dropped off. A potato truck was hauling its way toward us. I didn't see it. I hung my head. My throat grew as thick as a toffee. I couldn't go on. Luke didn't need any more details. I'm so sorry, he said voice low, genuine, and rumbling in his chest. My body trembled at the recollection, but I went on. His name was Eli Combs. My name would have been Bell Combs, 
Isn't that a lovely combination? It would have been, yes. Would have. My heart had been drowning in would-haves for three years. The weight was becoming too much. I knew I had to shed some off or they'd take me under completely. I blinked away the tears and pushed to my feet. My shoes flattened the grass before his step. But it's my fault he's gone. It's my fault I'll never have the future we dreamed of here at this house. Luke's forearms rested on his knees. He watched me pace with estimation and consideration before speaking. You can't keep blaming yourself. I doubt he would if he were still here. Did you pull out in front of the truck on purpose? I stopped pacing and stared at him. My mouth hung open. Most people gave simpering replies or argued away my guilt immediately. His response caught me up short. I, no, I would never there's a reason they're called accidents. He rose from the step, came toward me, and placed a hand on my shoulder. Our gazes collided, and I felt seen and heard. I felt understood. I placed a hand on his, my own way to acknowledge that fact. It wasn't a conscious choice you made, Belle. You didn't do it out of spite. You weren't vindictive or driving while emotional. Sometimes, as sad as they are, accidents happen. Moisture pricked my eyes. I blinked it away and stared at the barnyard, at the goats in their pen ducking their horned heads through the grates to reach the hay Luke had spread for them earlier. The farmhouse loomed in its place across from the barn, giving me its gentle, uplifting presence. Luke's body next to me was reassuring. More than that, the simple kindness, devoid of judgment he offered, acted like a home space, like any room in the farmhouse, allowing me to settle that way for as long as I needed to. Others I'd spoken with about the accident had argued away my feelings, told me the way I felt was wrong, that I was deluded for blaming myself. But Luke's approach was different. Though he essentially said the same things, he was circumspect and logical. I wanted to lean on his shoulder but forced myself to stay where I was. I saw him in you the first time we met, I said, not sure why. Oh, do we look alike? Not at all. That's how deranged I am. He brushed his thumb across my cheek, a tender expression in his gaze. You're not deranged. Most people have a hard time with loss, but you experienced something far more traumatic. You didn't just lose your fiancé. You were affected by the accident, too, with your own injuries. Hank told me. That's not an easy thing to deal with in and of itself. I wonder if you weren't able to fully heal and cope the way your body and soul needed because you've been so derailed by his loss. He was right. He was so right. I hadn't given myself permission to fully heal and cope. The shame I'd felt had held me back. That's why I left. I was in the hospital during his funeral, and I skipped town the instant I was well enough to. I couldn't escape the shame. Eli died because of me. It was my fault. I couldn't bring myself to go to his grave. I didn't want the visible proof of my mistake not when there were so many others constantly in front of my face every time I looked in the mirror. So you left. With my own injuries, I wasn't able to attend the funeral. I was bedridden and out of it for so long. I couldn't handle much with my concussion and resorted to lying in bed for months. But as soon as I could, I got myself on a plane. Like a coward, I bolted. That's not cowardice. But it was. I should have joined everyone else. I should have honored him. I should have stayed to help Grandpa. Then he wouldn't have died alone thinking I wanted nothing to do with him. He never thought that. My jaw began to tremble with emotion. Speaking my shame aloud emphasized what I'd been trying to hide from since I'd arrived in Bridgewater. Bex and Tyra had tried talking me out of feeling this way, 
The drinks they'd convinced me to indulge in had only numbed the pain. They hadn't alleviated it. He called me after I left. I didn't answer. I must have scared him half to death, then and there, when he came home to find me gone. Finally, when I'd made it all the way to Portland, I called to let him know where I'd gone. He told me to take the time I needed, but to not stay away too long. I faced Luke, needing him to see, to understand. How could I say what I needed to? How could I help him understand why I both wanted to get rid of the farmhouse and hold it as tightly to me as I could? I promised Grandpa I'd come back. But I never did. He died thinking. I wasn't sure what he'd died thinking. That I hated him? That I didn't need him? That I wanted nothing to do with him? He loved you, Luke said. He knew you needed time. Knew how painful things had become for you after that. I sniffed, blinked a few times, and then rotated to meet his face. He told you that? Luke and Grandpa had been friends. Had Grandpa confided in Luke about me more than Luke had let on after all? We talked a lot, though he never gave me details like you just did, Luke said. I know he missed you. I know he hurt for you, and he wished he could take your pain away. I don't think he ever held anything against you, Belle. After my rodeo accident, your Grandpa helped me. I had nowhere else to go, but he told me this old honeymoon cottage had room enough and to spare, and that I could stay here as long as I needed. His words resonated. <laughs> that sounds like something Grandpa would say. He gave me room, Belle. And I know it's not the same, but I'm giving you room, too. Room to feel what sounds like you've been pushing away for too long. You had your whole life ripped from you in a single moment. I'll take you to that cemetery if you need me to, if that's what it takes. He gestured to the hill in the distance. I wasn't ready for that yet. Thanks, but no thanks. Anyway, I don't know if that helps you understand me at all. It's not that I don't want to sell the house to you, Luke. And I did have plans to stage the room so I could list it. But I think that's just something else for me to do while I'm here, I said, realizing the honesty in the words as I spoke them because it serves a purpose toward the house and also buys me some time until I can figure out what I really want. If I took you up on your offer, that's too quick. I'm not sure I'm ready yet. I don't know if that makes any sense at all. I hung my head. With strong hands, he guided me to his chest and wrapped his arms around me, keeping me together. Thank you for telling me, he said, rubbing his hand on my back. His heartbeat reverberated through his chest. The sound was like a life source to my own. I promise, I won't pressure you about the house again. I hugged my arms tightly around him, grateful for his kindness and his steadiness as well. We stood together in the barnyard, locked in one another's embrace, while my pulse gradually slowed to match the slow, comforting thump of Luke's heartbeat. The train bridge up there is the reason this town got its name, I said, needing a break in the conversation. I needed a lighter tone, to let Luke know it was okay to talk about something else. I pulled free and tucked my hair behind my ears, then smoothed my hands over my cheeks. Hopefully I didn't look like as much of a basket case as I felt. But Luke hadn't rejected me. He hadn't run screaming from the sight of my patheticness. That was a start. It is? I wondered. Wondered why it wasn't called cattle graze or tractor land or something like that. I laughed, appreciating the release. He slipped his arm around me, not quite a full embrace as before, but steadying nonetheless. His touch was so warm, so complete, and signaled the fact that I wasn't as unwanted as I imagined. I didn't know when I needed a reassuring touch so much. I leaned toward his shoulder. I'm sorry I didn't show you the respect you deserved the night I first kissed you. We all do stupid things sometimes. I can't say I minded our second try earlier in there. He tilted his head in the direction of his house. I laughed, and it felt so good. So freeing. 
Me neither. With my head on his shoulder, the warmest balm filled my chest. I leaned into him, trying to process everything that was taking place inside of me. He held me like I needed it, held me like life support, held me, resting his chin against my hair, rubbing circles on my back, and offering soothing words. And only then did I realize I'd started crying. Tears cascaded down my cheeks and soaked into his shirt. He was right. I hadn't allowed myself to process and heal from the trauma the accident had on me. Not just the trauma of losing Eli from it, but the way it had completely altered so much about me. The way I thought about myself had changed. The sound of his voice was a lullaby, a proficient nurse, a bandage to my invisible wounds. I had lost someone special to me, a profound life that I'd built all my hopes on. More than that, I'd blamed myself and felt the bullseye aimed at me from everyone, whether they knew the truth of what had happened or not. I hadn't pulled in front of the potato truck on purpose. Truth be told, I hadn't seen the truck until it was too late. I hadn't meant for Eli to get hurt. In grieving for Eli, I hadn't given myself time to process. Though the injuries I'd sustained during the accident had healed physically, they'd left mental and emotional scar tissue in spite of the therapy sessions I'd tried. I'd forced tears away, hardened myself, drove memories to the deepest corners of my subconscious, worked myself to the bone because I thought ignoring the pain was the surest way to make it go away. But this tender permission from Luke wasn't tearing me apart like I thought the memories and the grief would, like the anxiety attacks had continued to do. He was keeping me, holding me together, even while my broken parts manifested. The assurance of his stable hold said he was there. He'd help me stay together. He wouldn't let me lose a single broken part of myself. I could heal and become a fully functional person again. Eventually, my tears slowed, though I couldn't say how long I cried. He settled his cheek on my hair, linked his fingers around my waist. We resumed our positions on his porch, staring at the farm I'd left. Chapter 15 Weather like this gave me permission to slow down. Every sight was a work of art. Picturesque blue in the sky, trees that had been green now standing out with vibrant orange courage as if they'd found their true selves. The leaves they shed speckled the grass in the fields. Fields were lazy with straw bales deposited every handful of feet, waiting to be stored. Luke and I sat together, more comfortable in the silence than if we'd known one another all our lives. The moment expanded itself, granting us enough space to exist as we both needed. Just as all good things eventually spinned out, so did this. Luke's hand slipped from my shoulder to my side, and he knocked his knee into mine. You ready to go? Luke asked. I stretched my arms before me. Not yet. I need just a few minutes to collect myself. Then I'll hitchhike into town. I slid him a smile. Hitchhike? I don't exactly have a carburetor or other engine parts for Old Blue hidden up my sleeve. Unless, did you change your mind about taking me? He had offered to take me before, but things had shifted so rapidly I needed to pin down what his feelings were now after our chat. I think you could talk me into it. What do you want to do in the meantime? Was that hopeful curiosity in his tone? Shrewd. I could imagine that getting swept up and kissing Luke again would be all too easy. Might need to avoid either of our houses. Let's go see the llamas, I said. They're one animal I don't have experience caring for. You got it, he said. Luke rose and offered me a hand. Once I was on my feet, he didn't let me go, but instead led the way past the goat pens where a horde of at least ten goats bleated and scratched in the hay. Several corrals were situated behind the barn, and the field just beyond, visible from the driveway, 
was a portioned off segment of lawn where a white llama with a long neck and thick fur stood chewing something over in his masticating jaws. On the opposite end, near the fence that bordered Grandpa's apple trees, stood the black llama. Which one is Hector and which one is Berlioz, I asked. And why did Grandpa choose those names? The white one is Hector, Luke said, resting an arm on the top of the fence and hitching his boot on the bottom rung. He pointed toward the black one. And that one there is good old Berlioz. As for the names, he never quite told me where they'd come from. Did he have the llamas when you started working here? Not from the start, no, Luke said. After I'd begun healing enough to walk around a bit, he mentioned getting something new, changing things up. He asked what I thought could be a good addition to the farm. So you suggested llamas? Yes, ma'am, I did. You named them, didn't you? Luke lifted his hands in surrender. I didn't. I can tell the names bother you, though. Why does it matter? Because I can't make sense of them. Grandpa's not a classical music kind of guy. And you are? I lifted a shoulder. I majored in the arts. One of my general ed classes was on classical music, and for our homework, we had to expose ourselves to a variety of pieces by classical composers. Berlioz happened to be one I liked. Beethoven, too. Luke gazed at me as though I'd just revealed a facet of myself he'd never seen before, and he liked what he saw. Well, well, Miss Bell, you like classical music. Yes, I do. In fact, a thought occurred then, something I had forgotten. Grandpa and I had had one of our weekly chats while I'd been taking that class, and I'd told him what I'd just told Luke. I liked Berlioz and Beethoven. Grandpa had laughed. I've heard of the last guy, he'd said, but Berlioz? Hector Berlioz, I'd said. There's a name for you. There is indeed. A soft spot manifested itself in my chest. I clasped my hand to it. I think it's because of me. What's because of you? That he named these llamas what he did. I was telling him about that class and the composers I liked. He made a comment about the name Hector Berlioz. Luke swept his arm over the fence as though showcasing the llamas. Then they're an homage to you, he said with a knowing twinkle in his eye. These llamas were for you. Silly as it seemed, I was moved. Grandpa, I wish I'd known. Lord, please let him know how glad I am he went with those names. How glad I am to know he was thinking of me. What about you? I asked. What music do you like? I heard you singing in the shower, remember? You like musicals? Luke strolled a few paces down the fencing until he stood across from Berlioz. The llama's black hair was coarse and wiry in the sunlight, and his funny expression brought a smile to my face, warming me at the thought that Grandpa had chosen their names because of something I'd told him. Luke's earlier words came back to me. He never held anything against you. He wanted to take your pain. Grandpa had missed me just as much as I'd missed him. I cast a glance toward the sky, wishing I could tell him what that meant to me. My mom loves musicals. I caught wind of a fair few of them here and there. Enough to sing like that? Luke swung a dismissive hand in my direction. That was nothing special. Nothing special. I was no musical expert, but I had heard enough of it to tell when someone was talented or not. You have a good voice, Luke. Did you take lessons? Are you kidding? That was natural talent. He smirked. My brother, on the other hand. The way his voice drifted off was more than a simple segue into another train of thought. It was as though he'd mentioned something he hadn't meant to. Luke hadn't talked about his family much, and I found myself wanting him to. I wanted to know who he'd grown up with, the people who were a part of him as much as Grandma and Grandpa were a part of me. Your brother? I asked, letting my hand rest on his arm next to mine. He sings? He shifted. Yeah, Colton sings. Colton. Luke had a brother named Colton. Is he older or younger than you? How many siblings do you have? There's five of us altogether. Colton's older than me. Five? Wow. Where do you fit in? I'm in the middle, Luke said. Too older, too younger. 
And where do they live? Are you all around here? Where did you grow up? Burley, he said, still watching the llamas, still not looking at me. These one-word answers weren't like him. I pressed my lips together. What's that look for? I asked. Hmm? You just, you're awfully quiet all of a sudden. His throat constricted as he swallowed. You ready to go into town now? Luke! I placed a hand on the second rung on the fence. Why am I getting the feeling you don't want to talk about your family? The corners of his lips twitched, but not in amusement. Sorry, he said. I shouldn't have brought them up. A few of my brothers and I have all been pretty estranged. That's all, he said. It's been hard to fix that breach. Estranged? What happened? Luke stuffed his hands into his pockets and stared at his boots, kicking at a few dead weeds at the base of the fence separating the barnyard from the llama's pasture. It's just, I don't know, it's stupid. Please, tell me. I just feel like I'm on the outside looking in. You could call it the Holden pride, I guess. And maybe you'd say I've done it to myself. I just feel like I don't measure up, so it's easier to keep myself at a distance from the others. The concept seemed implausible to me. Luke seemed confident and self-assured, like the kind of man who could take on whatever life threw at him and give it a dose of its own medicine in the meantime. What would make him question himself around those who should have loved him best? We grew up in a pretty nice home. My dad is a farmer and has done really well for himself. Naturally, the rest of us boys wanted to follow in his footsteps. Most of us, anyway. Mom and Dad owned horses, and so we all grew up riding. We've each dabbled in rodeo, but Dawson and I were the only ones who really stuck to it. Dawson, I said, acknowledging the name. Another brother. Is he older or younger than you? He's only about 11 months younger than me, so naturally we were pretty close growing up. In fact, I'm closer to Dawson than I am to any of the others. He took up rodeoing around the same time I did, but he's taken it a lot farther. The side of Luke's jaw twitched. Did the fact that Dawson had done more with the rodeo bother him? It was hard after my parents were divorced. Our mom fell into a slump of her own that she couldn't dig herself out of for some time. Colton's gone and started farming. Dawson hasn't really settled down. He's on the road a lot, driving to where the rodeo takes him. Bryce and Kyler are all still at home. I found I was having a hard time following his answer to my question about the estrangement taking place among them. Is that what bothers you about them? I asked. Partly, Luke said, fidgeting his boot on the bottom step. Mom might actually move on if we would leave her alone. Kyler is still in high school, so he has a good excuse. Bryce and Colton farm together. They say they're just trying to build up enough capital to buy Mom a new place— She's moved out since the divorce and has had to tighten her belt quite a lot. But mostly, I didn't want to go home because Bryce and I don't get along too well. I feel like he's been mooching off my mom too much. I did a mental recap, trying to keep all the brothers straight in my mind. Bryce was the oldest, but was still living at home when it sounded like Luke thought he shouldn't be. Colton had started farming and was doing well for himself. Dawson was a drifter, coasting along wherever the next rodeo led him and Kyler was still in high school. Maybe Bryce still needs the help, I suggested, trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Not likely, he said. He's 30. He should be living on his own. He's got a job working with Colton. Doesn't he pay your mom rent? I certainly hope so. She never gives me a straight answer on that, which makes me think she's letting him use his savings for a place of his own. Is that the only reason you keep your distance from him? Luke sighed, but not so much out of annoyance at my questions. It was more like the weight of whatever was really bothering him about Bryce was more than he wanted to address. Since you grew up here, you probably know Natalie and Chelsea Brown, Luke said. He shifted, as though the topic made him uncomfortable. My thoughts strayed in their direction. I knew the Brown sisters, but wanted to clarify that we were referring to the same people. You mean here in Bridgewater? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know Chelsea. She was in my graduating class in high school. Her sister Natalie is a few years older. She was in Bex's graduating class, I think. 
I wondered if they were still around. The Browns' parents ran the post office and lived in the apartment space above the old stone building. As an after-school job, Chelsea had run mail from the hospital in Burley to us and back every single day. Luke faced the pasture and rested both of his forearms on the top rung of the fence. With the autumn breeze teasing his blonde hair, he looked tempting, to say the least. And it was almost like he was meant for the outdoors. He seemed so at home, so self-assured out here. Chelsea and I dated my first year living here, he said. Bryce had come to visit me after the accident and hit it off with Natalie. He and I thought it was perfect. We went on a double date, brothers and sisters. I really liked Chelsea and thought things were going well. Only after going out to dinner one night with Bryce and Natalie, things turned south. A gentle breeze swept the scent of the farm over us and swirled my hair. I brushed a few stray locks from my face and listened, not wanting to interrupt. Natalie's foot had gotten caught somehow, and I'd stayed in the booth because there was some mix-up with my credit card while paying the check. Bryce was nowhere in sight, so I helped his date with her boot. Once we got the check misunderstanding cleared, we walked out of the Elkhorn to find Bryce and Chelsea kissing. He had her pressed against the side of Natalie's car. I gasped. They cheated on both of you right then and there? Right in front of you? Yeah. Natalie's heart was broken. She broke down and began to cry. Bryce tried apologizing to her, but I was livid that he would stoop so low. Not just that he would backstab me, but that he could do something so selfish to her. So I punched him in the face. My hands flew to cover my mouth. You did? Tension rippled from Luke's body, torrenting the air around him. His forearms were flexed. No man should treat his lady like that. He left town and we haven't spoken since. I stopped visiting home once I learned he was living there, and I have no idea what garbage Bryce spread about me to my brothers, but none of the others wanted much to do with me after that either. I've never had siblings, so while I witnessed sibling rivalry in my cousins and on movies and TV shows, I'd never experienced it for myself. I couldn't grasp that brothers would let something so petty create a barrier between them. That sucks, I said. That's why I'm so grateful Hank took me in. He insisted I move into the big house so he could help me if I needed it. I tried to decline, but he insisted. I hadn't had anyone do that for me before. He stopped in to visit me multiple times a day, brought me books to read, talked to me about his kids, his late wife, you. He lowered himself from the fence and slipped his arms around my waist, stirring awareness over every inch of me. If you had just told me your name the day we met, stubborn woman, I would have felt like we were already friends. I leaned my head against his chest. I was a wreck when we first met. I'd been a wreck for much longer than that, but coming back here had only intensified what I'd been repressing. The anxiety attacks were proof. Don't even worry about it. Hank saw the best in me. He treated me like a son, like I belonged, like my brothers never really had. That's really special, I said. We stood together, holding one another, basking in the newfound knowledge we both had of each other. I felt like I understood him a little better now. Do you want to know something? Luke's voice was low. He turned his face so his nose rested against my cheek. The truth is, I felt a connection with you the minute our eyes met, whether I knew your name or not. You did? His arms enclosed tighter around me, fixing me to him. Yes, ma'am. I couldn't help wondering who this beautiful woman was and why she was walking around with her eyes closed. I chuckled and leaned closer into him. The memory of our meeting from his perspective and the fact that I hadn't completely repulsed him was heartwarming. I guess I was trying to dip myself into Bridgewater slowly, like the first time getting into a hot tub. Bex was being gracious, allowing me time to reintroduce myself a step at a time. All the while I was fighting it, I didn't want to reintroduce myself anywhere. I only wanted to get in, get the funeral done, and get out again. That was why I was so instantly against giving you the house. If you bought it, it'd be too quick. I think my mind and my heart weren't aligning in that. Luke stroked my back a few times before settling his hands at my waist. 
Sounds to me like you've been focusing on all the reasons you want to leave. Have you thought much about the reasons you should stay? This startled me enough that I reared back to meet the directness in his eyes. Wait, it sounds like you're trying to talk me out of selling the house to you. Not just me, but to anyone. I just want to make sure you're not going to do something else you'll majorly regret in the future. What if you kept the house, Bell? What if you reintroduce yourself to it, to the town, remembered what you loved about this place? I saw how rattled you were when your aunt and uncle cleaned things out. And I don't think that was only because you missed your grandparents. You love this house. Tell me I'm wrong. Luke. His arm slid from around me and he took my hand. Let's go. Go where? Reintroduce you to the town. Then maybe we can get us a nice couch to sit on and test out. He waggled his eyebrows. I waited for a ready argument to surface, but his inference and positive outlook steered me away from arguments and left surrender as my only viable option. You want to make out at the furniture store? I pictured the scandal we'd present to the people working there, and my body flushed with a warmth that I couldn't tell was embarrassment or anticipation. I wouldn't say no, but we'll stop at a few places in Bridgewater first. What do you say? I'd seen people I've known my whole life, but while they'd been kind, I hadn't wanted to talk to any of them. My standoffishness had been a defense mechanism, I now realized, something I told myself I didn't need to do because I wasn't staying. They'd been kind to me. I hadn't returned the favor. What do you say we head to the Elkhorn and mingle? We could grab a burger and see who we run into. The Elkhorn. I expelled a breath. I haven't been back there since that first night. His fingers scaled the sides of mine. That night was memorable. That's what I'm afraid of. He laughed and squeezed tighter. Towns have long memories, I said, as if that explained it all. Our feet greeted the gravel with the typical crunching sounds. People do tend to be judgmental in a small place like this, but they're like that anywhere you go. But it goes both ways, doesn't it? Don't you know more about some people in town than you probably should? I'd give him that. I thought about the Brown sisters, about the time I'd caught Chelsea shoplifting from the mercantile when we were 12, about Emily Stone, how when I'd stepped into the real estate office, I'd done to her exactly what I'd accused everyone else of doing to me. What if she'd changed too? What if she wasn't the same busybody gossip she used to be? I think people are friendlier and more accepting because of that too. Ask yourself what's the real reason keeping you away. I'm afraid they blame me for what happened with Eli, I said, being more honest than I'd been in a long time. The admission brought a huge surge of relief along with it. I think you're the only one who feels that. I'd bet they're just excited to see you again. They know what you lost. They want to make sure you're okay, that you're happy. I doubt a single person in that town blames you. Have you spoken to Eli's family since you got back? A block inserted itself into my chest. My fists tightened. I don't dare. You can cross that bridge later, I suppose, when you're ready. But for now, let's go get a burger. People knew what a hard hit you took, and if you left town to mend yourself as far away as you did, my guess is there are still some around here who didn't get a chance to show how much they cared at the time. I supposed he was right. I was planning on leaving again, but I cared about people around here too. Maybe it would help mend more inside of me to get that closure. The stubborn refusal to face anyone for fear they'd bring up the accident didn't make me dig my heels in this time. Something instead spoke of courage, the small part that Luke had released. The wedge in my chest loosened. Instead of stubborn mulishness, instead of the barrage of resistance and the recap of reasons why I wanted to keep my distance, an open road lay before me, clear and crisp and accessible. I could do this. Just the Elkhorn. One step at a time. Chapter 16 The Elkhorn at lunch hour was packed with people. Either Luke had picked the perfect time to come with me or the most ludicrous. Either way, the pastor, Mark Metcalf, his wife, Deborah, Lucy Martinez from the bank and Etta Miles all raised hands in friendly waves and greetings, 
and this time, I wasn't a spooked cat on the lookout for intruders or falsehoods. This time, I was able to see the situation for what it was, a friendly gathering of people out to have their noonday meals. Tyra waved to me from behind the counter and sauntered over. Hey, y'all, she said. Sure is good to see you two together again. Again, I said. Tyra had encouraged me to sick myself on Luke the night we'd come for karaoke that we hadn't sung, but I wasn't aware that she'd seen us together, really. Unless she'd been the one who'd told him who I was after all. It's thanks to her I knew where to take you after you passed out that night, Luke explained. Oh, great. Don't remind me, I said, smiling and meeting the level of his amusement with my own. Though I was ashamed, I could either hide my head in the sand or choose to see it as it was— a stupid mistake we could laugh about after the fact. Tyra laughed and brushed a hand against my arm. You two staying for lunch? We are. Saddle on over here. If you're okay sitting at the bar, I can take your order from there. Tyra wove through the tables and we moseyed in her wake. Several more lunchgoers lifted their forks or nodded in greeting, including Natalie Brown. She was pretty, with brown hair similar to mine, though hers had more natural curl in it. I was glad he'd told me what had happened with her and his brother Bryce. Otherwise, the stilted, frozen, deer-in-the-headlights look she gave him would have been confusing, to say the least. The awkwardness between them had been riper than food gone bad in a fridge. Hey there, Natalie, Luke said kindly as we passed. Good to see you. You too, she muttered, though I deeply suspected she didn't mean the words in the slightest. Then it was Luke's turn to stop in his tracks, so quickly I nearly barreled into the back of him. What are you boys doing here? Tyra had arrived at the bar and waited, watching with confusion at the reason for our slow progress. I lifted a finger to her and was ready to push Luke forward when I saw who he had spoken to. A handsome man with short-cropped brown hair sat across from an equally good-looking teenage boy at the table closest to the bar. They both had similar features— though different in their own unique ways. I could tell they were related. The teenager's face broke into a grin. He rose from his seat and lifted a hand in the air. What's up, big brother? I wondered for a moment if Luke was going to reject this greeting, but he clasped the boy's hand and pulled him in for a one-armed hug. They slapped one another's backs a few times before stepping back. You just stopping through? Luke asked, turning an almost scowl on the older brother the one with his hair buzzed close to his scalp. He set his fork and knife down and grinned, too. Tried to call you and invite you to come with us, he said. You did? Luke checked his phone, then pocketed it. Must have had it on silent. Or you were distracted. The brother winked at me, and my face heated. He'd definitely been distracted. I thought back to the passionate kisses we'd shared while in his house. Could the brothers read the guilty look on my face? Was that why they kept grinning like fools? You going to introduce us to your friend? Luke cocked his head to one side as though he were irritated. Was this Bryce, the older brother who cheated with Luke's girlfriend? Was that why Luke was acting so distant? He cleared his throat and lifted his hand to my low back and began leading me forward. This is Bell Toby. Bell, these are my brothers. Kyler? He gestured to the teenager who lifted his chin at me. And Dawson. The rodeo cowboy, I said, more for myself than anything else. I was still trying to keep track from the story he told me earlier. Four brothers were a lot. Nice to meet you. Dawson and Kyler guffawed at this, catching one another's eyes. You told her about us, Kyler said. She your girlfriend? Everything inside of me cinched like a pulled seam. I wasn't sure what Luke and I were, but we were certainly more than friends. What are you doing here? He said, avoiding the question. Chances were, he didn't know how to answer it either. That was okay with me. I'm in town, brother, Dawson said. Burley's got a harvest rodeo, last one of the season. I got invited to ride it, so I made my way here. I asked how you were, and no one could really tell me, so Kyler and I thought we'd stop over. That's nice of you, I said, elbowing Luke. He'd given me the impression the estrangement he felt went both ways. But from the sound of things, the brothers had sought him out. They wouldn't have done that if they didn't want anything to do with him. That meant Luke had put the barrier between himself and his brothers in place. 
which then led me to question why. Was there more to the situation that he hadn't told me? You two eating? Kyler asked. We sure are, I said at the same time Luke said no. I raised a brow at him. Kyler and Dawson exchanged glances too. Whatever happened to reintroducing ourselves to the town? It seemed like I wasn't the only one who had some reintroducing to do. Seconds passed before Dawson kicked out the chair next to him. Come on, join us. Have a seat. That pretty waitress will be back around. She can hit you up. I waved to Tyra and indicated we'd be sitting. What would she do if she knew this handsome cowboy had called her pretty? The muscle in Luke's jaw twitched again. I waited for him to sit first, but he didn't move. Instead, he tilted in, gracing me with the silken strands of his whispered voice. You okay with this? Sure, I said, smiling, hoping to ease some of the tension cascading around the Holden brothers. There we go. She's a good one, I can tell, Dawson said, pointing to me with a shameless grin. She is, Luke said, sinking into the seat he'd kicked out. I slid in beside Kyler. All three of the Holden brothers had their attention on me, and it was disconcerting to say the least. Talk about a good gene pool. Was it legal to have this many handsome men in one family? I wished I had a drink of water or something to do to dispel their attention. The irony wasn't lost on me that we'd come to town to reintroduce me to people, and yet more of that was taking place for Luke than for me. So, Belle, Dawson began, resting his hands on either side of his plate. He was already halfway through a steak and what looked like steamed broccoli. Are you from Bridgewater? Sort of. I grew up here but recently stopped back into town for a few days. Sweet, Dawson said as Tyra approached our table with a small pad in her palm. Looks like you found a seat, she said, swinging her long hair twisting into hundreds of small delicate braids behind her shoulder. Sorry, we got sidetracked, I told her. Didn't quite make it to the bar. Tyra waved it off. It's all good. Here is just fine. What can I get for you? Luke and I both ordered cheeseburgers and fries with lemonades. Tyra smiled, received a flirtatious wink from Dawson, and strolled off to turn our order over to the cooks. Luke looked miserable. Texting was a perfect way to have a private conversation while others were around, and I suddenly wished I had his phone number. Why was he so hesitant to join his brothers for lunch? Was he that bothered that they were here? You must have been fairly close by if you agreed to rodeo here. Luke said. Where have you been these days? I hit up Southern Circuit this summer, Dawson said. It seemed as though he and Kyler were both waiting to finish their lunch until we got ours. Very courteous. Got to rodeo in all kinds of cities I've never been to before, which is pretty cool. That is cool, I said, smiling as Tyra appeared with our drinks. I took a grateful sip of the cool, stinging lemonade. I don't know that much about rodeo, do you ride on a team of some kind? And you all travel together? You join an association, Dawson explained, taking a sip of his beverage. Right after rodeo school, I joined IPRA and have been hitting up everything I can. You enjoy rodeoing, then, I said with assumption. I live for it. He set his glass down. I glanced at Luke, wondering if his situation had been similar. Had Luke been part of an association as well? Did he miss rodeoing? Or did he have plans to pick it up again? Several minutes passed, interrupted only by Kyler staring at his phone and Dawson smirking at me as though my presence here was amusing. I smiled in relief as Tyra brought our lunch plates. The burger looked juicy and inviting, bulging with cheese, lettuce, and tomato. My stomach grumbled. I lifted it, eager for a bite. What about you? I turned to Kyler. His eyes were strikingly like Luke's the same shape, the same brown color that spoke of afternoons wandering through freshly turned fields. Do you rodeo? Nah, he said, but I like to ride. Our dad's got some horses we take out regularly. I love to ride, I said once I finished chewing. You ride? Dawson's question had surprise and delight. Luke's fork clanged on his plate. His dill pickle was already half gone. Only my grandpa's horses, I said. Girl's got her priorities straight, Dawson said with approval, bringing his drink to his lips. He nudged Luke. One of the horses Hank had was yours, wasn't it? He asked. 
Luke's interest was genuine. Though we'd spent some time together on the farm, we hadn't yet gotten around to discussing horses. Walnut was mine, I told him. Beautiful horse, he said. We'll have to go for a trail ride. I'll take Grady. I bet Hank would like that. Kyler held a hand between us, jerking me away from the delightful image Luke was conjuring of being astride my horse, wandering the trails behind the barn, and being the opposite of hurried as we spent some time losing ourselves in nature. Hold up, Hank. He's the old guy you work for, right? Luke nodded his answer. Belle is his granddaughter. Dawson and Kyler released another round of guffaws, earning both bemused and annoyed attention from others in the cafe. My back instantly went up. What's so funny? Sorry, Dawson said, passing his fork between Luke and me. It's just so coincidental, like something from a danged movie or something. Him working for your grandpa, you being the gorgeous off-limits granddaughter, like some version of dating the farmer's daughter. Does. Her grandpa passed away last week. Luke's tone was informative, but not unkind. Talk about a buzzkill. All traces of laughter left Dawson's and Kyler's faces. He passed away? Dawson said. I'm sorry to hear that. I swallowed down the lump in my throat. These two didn't mean anything by it. Hearing Dawson's perspective on how Luke and I met helped me grasp where his humor had been coming from, and I didn't want him to feel bad. It's okay, I said. You didn't know. Yeah, we hadn't heard, Kyler said. There's a story for you, I said, desperate to lighten the tension. I never would have met Luke otherwise. I came back into town for the funeral, and he spoke at it. Luke muttered under his breath. Have you not wanted me to divulge that little detail? You spoke at the funeral? Dawson acted shocked and disappointed. I didn't want to make a big deal out of it, Luke said. The four of us mulled the conversation over in silence for a few more moments before I decided to try breaking the ice once more. This is delicious. It's been so long since I've had a burger this good. That spurred the conversation in a more relaxed direction, including some of the best restaurants Dawson had tried out along the circuit this summer and some I loved back in Oregon that I hadn't found anywhere else. From then on, lunch passed in civil camaraderie and conversation. We paid our checks and prepared to leave. Don't be a stranger, Dawson said, placing his cowboy hat on as we rose from the table. Why don't you two come to the rodeo? When is it? I asked. This weekend, he said. Friday and Saturday night. That's the pumpkin walk, I said, not meaning it as anything other than a statement. Sounds like we'll be busy. Luke's reply carried finality, as though he wouldn't brook any argument or encouragement that we made other plans. I narrowed my eyes at him. That wasn't what I meant at all. I opened my mouth to say as much. Even if we went to the pumpkin walk, it lasted a few days. We could make it to Dawson's event, too. But Kyler cleared his throat. Nice to meet you, he said, placing a darker cowboy hat on his head. It was nice to meet you both as well. I moved out of the way so he could get past me on the way to the door. Once we were outside in the sunlight, the brothers hugged Luke. Then, to my surprise, they each pulled me into a hug as well. You keep him in line, Dawson said in a jokingly commanding way. I'll do what I can, I said, smiling. They stalked to the black pickup parked outside a few spaces down from Luke's, waved one more time, and then climbed in. They seemed nice, I said, breaking the friction. The tightness still hadn't eased from Luke's neck and shoulders. He kept his hands in his pockets and still stared after Dawson's truck, even when it was no longer in sight. They are. I waited for him to elaborate, to explain why he'd seemed so reluctant to join them, to explain why he hadn't told them about Grandpa's passing, or maybe why he hadn't wanted to attend his brother's rodeo, even after we'd been invited. They didn't act estranged, I said, unsure how to point out the obvious in any other way. He grunted. That's because you were there to smooth things over. You ready to go? I considered pushing the issue, but Luke was entitled to his own business, just like I had been entitled to mine. Maybe if I eased up about it, he'd open up to me. And it was probably true. I wondered if Luke might have elaborated about the reasons for his distance if I hadn't been there. Sure, I said, 
making my way around his truck. Let's go. I'd let the matter go for now, but when the time was right, I hoped he would explain why he kept himself at a distance from his family. Chapter 17 The drive from Bridgewater to Burley took about 20 minutes. We passed golden farmland speckled with rounded bales of freshly harvested grain and other fields with harvest still in full swing. Sugar beets had been topped so only the sliced-off peaks of the beets themselves were visible along the effortlessly straight rows. Combines and tractors trundled up and down those roads with dump trucks alongside them, ready to catch the newly excavated produce. Seagulls swarmed, pecking out the mice who had nowhere to hide now that the green tops were gone. With the blue sky overhead, the colors of gold and brown and green, it was inviting and earthy and productive and made the countryside blaze with energy. Burley felt like a big city compared to Bridgewater, but was still relatively small. We passed the bridge that crossed the Snake River, and Luke pulled into the furniture store, offering his hand to me before we stepped inside. The smell of new everything struck my nostrils. New fabric, new textiles, new adhesives and adornments. We were greeted by several placements of furniture as though each were in an actual home, and the family members would be around to utilize them any minute. Looks like we're in the right place. Luke said. A middle-aged sales associate with tied-back blonde hair and a floral blouse greeted us and asked if we needed assistance. I told her we were just looking, and she left us to let us do just that. Luke and I took the left first. A handful of impressive-looking living room setups passed inspection, but nothing jumped out to me yet. Do you ever talk to Chelsea much? I asked, pausing to admire a particularly pretty floral arrangement on one of the end tables. I'm assuming you broke up with her after you punched your brother. Part of me was glad Bryce hadn't been there for lunch. Something told me Sparks would definitely have cascaded then. Yeah, things between Chelsea and me ended that night, Luke said. She moved to Pocatello to go to school, but Natalie stuck around and helps out at the post office with her dad. Has Natalie picked up with anyone since her sister kissed your brother? Now look who's interested in other people's business, he said, smirking. I felt the blush paint my cheeks. You got me. But I can't help but feel sorry for her. I want her to find someone. Everyone deserves a second chance. Very philosophical of you, he said. As far as I know, she keeps to herself. Sometimes she helps her brother out on the Bureau of Land Management. He stopped to examine the next setup. This one had an impressive entertainment center with a fireplace built into the base. The couches were a light-colored leather, not something I was looking for. Her brother is a firefighter who works on restoration. We had a bad set of fires out in the South Hills a few years ago, and he's been helping monitor growth and animal life, tracking herds, that kind of thing. Interesting. What do you think of this one? We moved on to the living room situated across from the leather couch setup. This one had striped couches with an accent chair that had what looked like French script across it. I gestured to the couch. Luke sank down, pulling me with him. I think we'd better try it out. Before I could protest, he lured my mouth to his, indulging in a long, sultry kiss that made my mind turn hazy at the edges. So? I asked a little breathlessly. Good choice. You haven't even looked at the couch. You're right. He kissed me again, making my toes curl in my shoes. I pounded him on the shoulder, only slightly irritated. Luke, I brought you to give me an opinion. He hovered his mouth over mine. I'm pretty sure I just gave you one, but if you'd like another... I laughed and rose. Though she'd left us to ourselves, who was to say the sales associate wouldn't come around the corner? What would she do then? Fine, in that case, I'll keep looking. He slung his arms across the back of the couch, looking smug. Let me know when you find another. I'll give you my thoughts on it, too. Shaking my head with amusement, I sauntered past ordinary couches, a brown setup that was more contemporary than I was going for, the farmhouse had to have something modern but classic, too. It needed... I wasn't exactly sure. 
but I hoped that when I saw the right one, I'd know it instantly. I stalked past living room setups that had darker microfiber seating around a low coffee table bedecked with a potted cactus. Another setup had Victorian-style seating with wood for armrests and lining the backs. This is pretty, I said. It looks like it'd fit the house. Not at all, Luke said. Veto. You have no veto rights. What's wrong with this? You're not just going for pretty, he said, inching in to graze his nose along my cheekbone. He swept me in a whirl against him, a fancy kind of two-step, before landing us both on the couch. Imagine the things you use couches for. Relaxing, watching TV, reading books. There is no kicking back and relaxing on this, he said, resting his head on the wood lining the upper back of the fancy couch. I mimicked him, reclining my head back, to discover for myself what he meant. Sure enough, the wood slab was a hard interruption to comfort. It was like lying on a long rock. Good point, I said. Even reading a book on this thing wouldn't work to my full satisfaction. Exactly. Reading, kicking back to watch a movie, other activities. He slid in, grazing his hand along my jaw, but his mouth didn't even make impact. See, it gets in the way of everything. I released a defeated sigh. So this is a no-kissing couch, I said. That definitely scratches it off the list of possibilities. Only if that's what your main interest is. Might be good to have in the front room for teenage kids, maybe. Assuming you grow up to be an old control freak mom out to ruin everyone's lives. You act as though you speak from experience. I waited for him to elaborate. He'd mentioned his mother before, but only that she'd had some emotional issues of her own. What kind of a relationship did he have with his mom? I'm just saying, this is not the couch you're looking for. He waved his hand mysteriously in front of us, and I laughed. I get it, Obi-Wan. My gaze drifted to the set-up kitty corner from us. I gripped Luke's knee with sudden delight. Look there. The future? Shut up. Look at that one. I rose and crossed from the decorative rug to the French country-style setup displayed along the back corner of the store. A cream-colored sofa with tufted armrests and slathered with decorative pillows awaited our arrival. The end tables were elegant, of a lighter, almost gray wood, with antiqued finish and coordinated with the coffee table. I love everything about this, I said, instantly enamored. Luke sank in the center of the pillows and released a contented moan. He lay his head back, fanning his fingers for me to join him. I may never leave, he said. I cozied in beside him, and Luke's arms enveloped me. He buried his face into my neck. Mmm, even better now. As we sat together, snuggling and getting buried in the couch's luxurious comfort that also matched perfectly the aesthetic I was hoping for, I began to picture it in the rotund parlor. The couch could face the fireplace. The coordinating chairs would offset it. And even this rug was ideal to provide some warmth on the wood floor on cold mornings. Luke inched in closer, his breath stroking my ear. I think I'll hold off on testing this one until we get it back to the cottage. I may never want to stop if we start something now. I think this is your winner. My stomach tingled at his insinuation. I think you're right, I said. And I'm pretty sure we've scandalized the staff enough as it is. One of the salespeople passed with an affronted look after I pulled away from Luke's almost kiss. It took effort to pry myself from the cavern of cushions, but with Luke's help pushing from behind, I wedged myself free and found an associate. And two hours later, Luke and I were hauling it up the farmhouse's porch steps. Together, we maneuvered the new seating arrangement into the parlor. It took some time and coordination, along with shifting pieces right and left and trying tables in one place and another, but eventually I was satisfied. Luke arranged a few of the vases with her plastic floral collections I'd picked up on the end tables. He had a good sense for style, I'd give him that. The furniture gave an entirely different feel to the space than the one that had been here before, and I remembered Aunt Sarah's parting words. This was an opportunity to make this house my own. 
and I had to say, I was pretty pleased with the mark I'd left on the place so far. I was beginning to grow more and more attached to this furniture, too. I wasn't only wanting to use this to stage pictures for selling. No, I wanted this to be mine. We spent the evening testing out the furniture and talking long into the night. The next day, I found Luke in the barn brushing Walnut's coat and bringing out a shine. The horse was hooked to the line between the stalls and stood patiently while Luke, cowboy hat in place, ran the comb over his hair over and over again and muttered soothing words in a low rumble. You look hard at work, I said, smiling. Luke peered over his shoulder. A dazzling grin overtook his handsome face, and he gazed at me as though I were the reason for the sudden light in his eyes. And you look better in person. What does that mean? He combed the horse and then paused. Just that I've been thinking about you. You're amazing in my head. But now? He skimmed me over, making my skin hum as his gaze traveled from my boots to my face. Yep, definitely better in person. My stomach released a series of flurries. You were thinking about me? He resumed combing walnut. The horse gazed at me with his amber eyes. It's all I seem to do lately, he said. Luke made a few noises at the horse and then unlatched the rope and guided him into his stall. He closed the door, set the comb in its place, and then I found myself between him and the door to Walnut's stall. The tack to the right of my head swayed. Good morning, beautiful, Luke said, his lips at my throat. I giggled and put my arms around him. Good morning to you, too. What do you have planned for today? He asked. I found it hard to concentrate on anything else with his body pressed to mine, his hands on my hips, and his mouth making its trail along my jaw. Do you expect me to concentrate with you around? Luke chuckled and pulled back. His brown eyes danced. I'll tell you what I was thinking. Do I want to know? My heart rate hadn't quite recovered from his last suggestion. I think we should take the trail we talked about yesterday. Let's saddle up Walnut and Grady, pack a lunch and go wandering. What do you say? Was that why you were combing Walnut? A shrug. I remember you saying how much you liked riding that horse of yours. How sweet was that? I think that's a great idea. Much better than hanging around the farmhouse waiting for who knew what. The heyday pumpkin walk was that night. Maybe Luke and I could paint the town red and see what the carvings were like this year. Luke grinned. I'll get the horses saddled up. I'll pack a lunch. Perfect. See you in a few. Giddy with each of my steps light, I dashed back to the house. Grandpa didn't have much by way of food, and I hadn't gone back to the mercantile for anything else since I'd bought the soup and the milk. But he'd had bread around, at least, and peanut butter. Hope Luke likes PBJs, I said, delving the raspberry jam from the fridge and slathering it onto the bread. In short order, I had a few bags of trail mix, some water bottles, sandwiches, and chips in a bag, when a knock sounded on the door. Luke waited on the porch, one hand on his waist. I'll have to get used to waiting for you to answer when I come now. You ready to go? He gestured behind him to the horses tied up at the stump. Ready, I said, placing my pink cowgirl hat on my head. The corners of Luke's lips tweaked. Pink? Why not? The hat was from the pageant I did in high school. I didn't normally wear the thing, but I didn't have many other options, and I couldn't go on a trail ride without a hat. I placed our lunch in Grady's saddlebag and approached Walnut. You ready for this old boy? I said, patting his nose. Luke mounted. I held on to the pommel, placed my foot in the stirrup, and did the same. A shudder of delight rippled over me. You look at home in the saddle, Miss Bell he said, guiding Grady around so he could face me. So do you. I meant it. Luke was handsome as it was, but the sight of him on a horse? Somebody hand me a fan. Where to? I glanced in the direction I used to take, between the goat pen and the line of apple trees. Let's go this way. Walnut responded to the click of my tongue, and I let out. Feet above the ground, my body fit the saddle like it always had, though I could tell I was a little rusty. Luke probably was too. 
As far as I knew, he didn't ride around much anymore either. Tell me about your rodeo days, I said after we passed over the stream that slithered through Grandpa's property. I held back so I'd level up with him beneath the quakey's trembling yellow leaves. There's not much to tell, Luke said. I got into some bronc riding in high school in Burley. I was on the team and thought I'd make a career of it. Like Dawson has? He squinted. Yeah, he has. Why does that bother you? Who said it bothers me? You close up, I said, letting Walnut wander alongside Grady. Is that why you didn't want to go to Dawson's rodeo tonight? Why you didn't want to see your brothers at lunch? They seem to care about you, Luke. He frowned. The horse's hooves crunched through the brush until they found a smoother place for stepping again. It's just hard, Luke finally said. What is? He glanced at me as if wondering how much he should say. I get the reason you want to keep your distance from your oldest brother, but the rest? Tell me. Hand on the pommel of his saddle, the other on his hip, Luke glared ahead for several beats before returning his gaze to me. This isn't easy for me to talk about. I'm good at keeping secrets. I considered mentioning something about how I was as good to talk to as Grandpa had been, but that probably wasn't the same. Grandpa had been a father figure to Luke, and our relationship was significantly different from that. It's not a secret. Then what? I'm not enough, he said on an exhale. I frowned. Not enough what? You're going to think I'm shallow. Come on, Luke, try me. He seemed to fight with himself a little longer, and then, just as I was about to tell him it was okay, that he didn't have to say anything, he went on. Every one of them had a successful launch to their lives, and I didn't. I don't fit. I tried to wrap my head around what he was saying. Did he mean they had careers? Families? That couldn't be the case. As far as I knew, none of his brothers were married yet, and his oldest brother moving back home didn't sound like a successful launch to his life to me. But you said Bryce moved back home. He doesn't count. I stopped counting him the day he stabbed me in the back with Natalie. But Colton's farm is going strong. Dawes succeeded in rodeoing where I failed. And Kyler's going places. The kids got scholarships in tow, and I... What am I doing? I'm 25 years old, and I don't have a place of my own. I work someone else's land. I care for someone else's animals. I know I shouldn't complain. I've been happy at the farmhouse. But I can't help feeling like I'm drifting. Or like my family thinks so. I'd just feel better if I had a little more stability under my belt. Luke, I couldn't believe this man I admired so much viewed himself in such a poor light. Were his brothers or his parents overtly critical or something? Did they stand around and brag at their success stories in life and bash Luke for his supposed lack thereof? Dawson and Kyler hadn't seemed to be that sort of men. They'd been fun-loving and a little silly. Another piece slid into place, though. This was why Luke wanted the farmhouse. Perhaps it wasn't the only reason, but a contributing piece of the puzzle at least. It could also explain another reason Grandpa had had such a big impact on Luke. He'd given him somewhere to settle, somewhere to call home, as he had for so many others. Luke had also mentioned Grandpa's ability to see the best in people when they couldn't see it in themselves. Had Grandpa done that for Luke, too? You're not drifting, I said. This farm, the animals, none of it would function without you. I wanted to seem competent, but I called Bex for a little extra help the day you left the chores to me. I think it would take me twice the time it takes you to care for everything, and I'm sure I don't even know half of what you do around the place to keep things going. You are the backbone of Havenwood. He hung his head, shaking it as if to argue. Sudden remorse struck me. I was wrong to deny you the chance to buy it. Bell but I won't make that mistake twice. I'll sell you the farm, Luke. You can have it. Havenwood Farm is yours. No. I'm serious. So am I. He reached for my hand. 
The horses strolled along, keeping pace with one another, keeping us side by side. Thank you for offering, but I can't take it now. Not like this. Like what? He released my hand and a scoff along with it. You, pitying me, offering it to me like this only makes me feel that much more pathetic. I can't take what belongs to you, or more importantly, I can't take the place where you belong. I was speechless. I hadn't meant to make him feel worse about the situation. I had only meant to do what was right now when I hadn't before. As far as belonging, did I belong at the farmhouse? That came across wrong, I said. I didn't mean it like that. I know you didn't. More silence filled the space between us. The horses slowed, and I gazed around the clearing and the quakies. I couldn't leave it there, though. I doubted Luke's brothers perceived him as a failure, as he thought they did. I didn't know more about them than what I'd witnessed at lunch, but from the sound of things, they'd sought him out. They'd wanted his company. And they didn't seem like the kind of people who would belittle someone that way. Are you sure you don't want to go to his rodeo tonight? I asked. I'm sure. It might be good for you to see your family again. I wasn't sure when the last time was that he'd willingly spent time in their company. I suspected doing so might help repair the rift that had come between the brothers. Won't your family be there? My mom and Kyler probably will be. Then let's go. I'll come with you. I can't remember the last time I went to a rodeo. And maybe it'll give you a bug, get you to try again if that's what you want. I wasn't sure he wanted to rodeo again. He'd only said he hadn't succeeded at it like he'd wanted to. Luke patted Grady. I'm doing as much as I ever want to do on a horse again, riding calmly like this. With you. He gave me a vulnerable smile, almost as if he was no longer sure where he stood with me. That wouldn't do. I reined Walnut to a stop and dismounted. This looks like a good picnic spot, I said. It wasn't exactly lunchtime yet, but I was done talking across a horse to him. Luke slipped down and led the horses to the edge of the clearing, securing their reins by a lead rope to the trees. I retrieved the picnic lunch as he pulled the blanket he'd packed free, and we searched out the flattest plot we could find. The autumn breeze turned colder, and I inhaled a breath. I wasn't about to head back yet. Not until we got to the bottom of this, and I let him know exactly how I felt about what he'd told me. We sat together on the patchwork blanket and stretched our legs. The afternoon was cast in gold. With the luster of the leaves and the goldenrod sunlight spilling around, it was rich. You know what struck me about you? I began, retrieving a sandwich for Luke from the sack but leaving mine where it was. He took it gratefully. My rugged good looks. Your confidence in everything you do. The way you carry yourself. The way you step in and help wherever you're needed. The way you've been like a bedrock for me. That's so enough, it's not funny. You're more than enough, Luke. I think your brothers see that. And if they don't, then they're the ones who are lacking. Not you. He set his unopened sandwich aside and placed his hands on my face. I didn't miss the fact that his fingers trembled or that a vein pulsed in his neck. The look he gave me at that moment was indescribable. Susceptible and admiring, disbelieving but wanting to believe, vibrant with realization, and it seeped into my bones. I've never met anyone like you, Belle. You have the sweetest heart that's so loving and thoughtful. You've taken over me. All my thoughts are of you. Every second I have, I want to be where you are. And the more time I'm with you, the more I get to know you, the more I fall. My entire being grew light and fluttered like the leaves around us. Half hanging on, half wanting the fall he spoke of, I was trapped in his gaze, in his words in the feel of his calloused fingers on my cheeks. He tipped forward and kissed each of my eyelids, my eyebrows, the tip of my nose. He traced the shape of my bottom lip with his thumb, and I fairly melted. I never had anyone gaze at me like this, like every part of me was cherished, 
and unbelievable all at once. Are you going to kiss me? A statement like that deserves a kiss. His lips quirked at the corners. Because that's why I said it. Of course. I meant it, Belle. This time I lifted my hand to his face and placed it over the prickle of stubble that was beginning along his jawline. I let my finger jag along the sandpaper of his skin, watching its progress before returning my gaze to find his eyes cemented on me. I thrilled at the softness of his lips beneath my fingertips, at the way he pressed a kiss to them, never taking his eyes from my face. He caught my wrist then, gently but with insistence, and turned my hand to place his mouth on the soft skin there. My eyelids fluttered and a little noise escaped. I gasped, not meaning to have said anything. Luke's expression radiated as if he knew the power he was having over me. His eyes glinted with a little glow of victory. He slipped his hand to my waist. Yes, Belle, I'm going to kiss you now. Luke, I said on a breath. I welcomed the feel of his hands at my back and succumbed to his lips there with the scrubby dead grass prickling through the blanket beneath us and the sun serenading us with streaks of gold. Our kiss had segued into a slower rhythm when my phone pinged from my pocket. I didn't want to move on from this, from the flurrying thrill of the moment we'd just shared, but the vibrating noise was hard to ignore. Chapter 18 The call could wait, though I worried it was from Rodney. I still hadn't gotten to those blurbs. I hadn't thought to check my email either to see if those two clients had agreed to meet via Zoom rather than in person as I'd offered. Luke released a disappointed little mumble, but I broke away and peered at my phone, swiping to answer when I saw who it was. Hey, Bex, I said. I'm going to kill that man. He said he would help me, yet what do you know? He has a camping trip planned with his buddies that weekend. I struggled to keep up with her rant. What are you talking about? Rock? Yes, she blurted. He knows how long I've been planning this event, and last minute his friend got a brand new toy hauler camp trailer, and now I'm left high and dry. I tried not to get hung up on what a toy hauler was and stuck to the matter at hand. She'd mentioned the heyday pumpkin walk a few times, so I figured that was what she was referring to. It was starting tonight, after all. What do you need? You're leaving town, she said, not unkindly, but pointedly all the same. I can't expect anything of you. With the moment Luke and I had just shared, I wasn't ready to leave anytime soon, but this was Bex. She was trying to sound noble, but I couldn't accept her attempt to divert me. You picked me up from the Twin Falls airport. The least I can do is help you with the pumpkin walk. Besides, I'm not leaving as soon as I thought I was. You're not? How come? Luke had broken into his PBJ during our call, but he peered up at me at this pronouncement. The same question lingered in his gaze, though he hadn't heard her voice it. Though my boss likes me to come into the office, I technically don't have to. I can work from home, I told her. I can work from anywhere. Except at some point, I needed to actually do that work. Another twinge of guilt struck, and I made a mental note to give the blurbs another shot. Your boss isn't going to can you? He'd be a fool if he did. I was the best on the team. His call on the day of Grandpa's funeral wasn't unusual. Customers constantly left ratings and requested that I be the one to write their marketing spiels. In fact, I had a few more for a sports shoe company I needed to work on this evening. And after how much I'd spent on this furniture and the other pieces I wanted to get after Luke and I toured some of the bedroom sets and dining furniture, I needed the job. What do you need? She blew out a long exhale. I've got people lined up to man and set up different activities. Miranda Gomez is bringing her taco truck. Britt Terrence will have a cocoa stand all ready to go. And the Elkhorn is also going to provide some food on location like they've always done. So food is covered, I said. That sounds good. What else? People are already starting to ask where they can bring their pumpkins, so I've been having them start to put them on the street. 
but I need help with the props for the pumpkin walk. I can't carry these massive backdrops to the square myself, and they won't fit in my van. I mean, I could move one at a time, but do you know how long that would take? I darted a glance to Luke, who was watching our conversation with interest. Luke has a truck, I told her. I'm sure he loved me volunteering him like this. He rested a hand on the blanket behind him and watched me curiously. Something told me he wouldn't mind helping her, with the way he'd dived into assisting at every other instance that had been presented to him. Oh my gosh, really? Would he be willing to pick up these backdrops and help me get them to the square tonight? Hang on. I paused long enough to tap my screen. Might as well include him in this conversation. You're on speaker. You need some things hauled? Luke asked without preamble. She explained the parameters again. Of course, Luke agreed. Just tell me where and when and I'll be there. We'll be there, I corrected. Rather than continuing his expression of concern for Bex, Luke's attention was on me, fixed and unrelenting and completely distracting. We, he whispered in my ear. He slid his hand to my waist. I inhaled his husky scent feeling it fill the empty spaces inside of me so much I had to shake away the strands of the web he wove around me in order to concentrate on my friend. I like the sound of we. Hard as I tried to focus on her instructions, I couldn't ignore the strength of Luke's arms around me or the fact that when I looked his way again, I saw only him. Blonde hair, chiseled features, Warm eyes sending shards of awareness and desire spearing through me. You're the best, she said. I've got people bringing in tables that we need to have set up in the park, along with chairs for seating. We need to hang up the banners marking off parking, and I need someone to help monitor the setup for the pumpkin carving stations. Rock said he would help with the tables. I can do that, Luke said. He grazed his lips along my jaw. My lashes fluttered, and I pushed him away. I couldn't go where he wanted to go right now. And I'll oversee the setup for the carving, I told her, clearing my throat and hoping I didn't sound as flustered as I felt. Bex made a noise, and then her voice resonated with gratitude. You're seriously a lifesaver. I can't even tell you how much that will help me. My internal temperature had reached new heights. My mouth was dry and I had to turn away from Luke to finish my conversation. What about the others on the committee? Aren't any of them doing some of this too? They are. They're amazing. I just bit off too much and thought I'd have more help. I could tell this really bothered her. I suddenly wished Luke wasn't around so I could ask more about Rock. Every time I talked to Bex, it seemed like things got more and more amiss, that he was caring less and less for his responsibilities as a husband and father. The concern in Beck's eyes whenever she mentioned him in person suggested the same thing, too. But I wouldn't bring it up in front of Luke. What would I do without you two? Beck said. There she went with the whole concept of we again. Tyra had lumped us together earlier, too. And I found I liked it. I liked it a lot. Especially with the words he'd confessed and the way he kept looking at me. It was just your intuition. Somehow you sensed we would be there for you, I told her. We're out riding, but we can head back any time. Give us a few and we'll finish what we're doing here. I glanced to Luke for confirmation, but from the hazy look of desire in his eyes, something told me he wasn't even close to being finished with me yet. The call ended and I rounded on him. You're fired, I said. Are we finished here? He said, easing a smoky look in my direction. He bent in for a kiss that enveloped me. His arms, his mouth, everywhere our bodies touched was complete wholeness, and every touch seemed to seep straight through my skin and impact my soul. I gave in, kissing him every bit as much as he wanted, as much as I wanted, and it struck me that the entire time spent with Luke at the Elkhorn, at the furniture store, and again during our trail ride today, I hadn't thought of Eli at all. Chapter 19 Once we returned and got the horses situated, 
Luke and I climbed into his pickup to head into town to help Bex. His hand claimed mine the instant he shifted into gear. The moment should have felt perfect, but two things interfered with perfection. Once our kiss ended, at the recognition that I hadn't once thought of Eli, my thoughts were apparently making up for lost time. They began guilt-tripping me for moving on and wanting a relationship with Luke. I was happy with him. Happier than I'd been in a long time. And the jostling my emotions had endured seemed to abate when he was around. At least, since I had confessed the truth about my past to him. I felt like a future free from anxiety and guilt was possible with him by my side. So why couldn't my guilt meter get on the same level? The second thing was Uncle Thomas's name dominating the screen on my phone. Luke's periphery veered toward the phone vibrating in my hand. You going to answer that? No, I said. Luke slowed at the end of the drive that led out from Havenwood and onto the main road into Bridgewater. Okay, then. It's my Uncle Thomas. Did he forget something? Last I checked, he and that cousin of yours picked the bones clean. I smirked at Luke's sardonic view of their treatment of the house and the items in it. You're not the only one who wants the house, I said. I see. That was why he pulled you aside while he was here, wasn't it? I fidgeted, and I didn't fail to notice Luke's fist tighten on the steering wheel. He wants to turn it into competition for Tisha at the frontier, I said. You know, I think Hank mentioned something like that, Luke said slowing at the indicated speed limit on the outskirts of Bridgewater. More traffic than usual bustled along the sidewalks leading up to the park that marked the center of town. Every parking space was claimed, and there was a renewed energy in the air, as though the entire town was wired with excitement and purpose for the upcoming festival. He passed the square and turned toward the high school where Bex had said the backdrops for the pumpkin walk were located. You're not considering it, are you? Luke asked. Selling him the house? If I'm having a hard time selling it to you, I definitely don't want to sell it to him. Yeah, I saw the incredulous look on your face when he pulled you aside the other day. Bridgewater High was a fraction of the size of the high schools in Oregon. It had no formal gym, no lunchroom, only classrooms, and a few offices for the administrative staff. There was a series of storage sheds out back, however, and that was where backdrops of plays that were performed at the park or other items used to decorate the town for holidays were stored. Bex was already there, wearing a Disneyland hoodie, her blonde hair pulled into a messy bun. With one hand on her hip and one at her mouth, providing nails for biting, she peered around with an apprehensive expression. We stepped in her direction, and the worry on her features smoothed over with relief. You're here, she said. We are, I said. What's up first, boss? The backdrops are in here, she said, gesturing to the shed nearest to us. Removing a set of keys from her pocket, she approached the large door and unlocked the lock in the ring, swinging the door wide open. A stifling smell of wood and stale air greeted us, along with the sight of several large black totes stacked one atop another to the left, what looked like a parade float with excessive amounts of paper mache edging the sides, and several boards standing upright and painted in shades of flaming orange, darkest blue, and ghostliest green. Are these the same ones the art classes have been painting every year? The very same, Beck said. The art teacher here sponsors a new backdrop every year, she explained for Luke's benefit. He slipped a pair of gloves over his hands and approached the lineup. They're going in the truck? he said. Yes, to the square. We've got to set them up along the walking path where people will know to bring their carved pumpkins to light up the street for others to walk along and enjoy. Got it, he said, grunting and lifting the first large display. Here, I said, hurrying over and offering him assistance. We all but barreled into Jensen Higgins, the art teacher himself. Sorry about that, he said, darting out of the way and then followed with a smaller display to Luke's truck. The next 20 minutes consisted of traipsing back and forth between Luke's and Jensen's pickups and the shed until all five of the massive backdrops were loaded. To the square, Luke clarified, slightly breathless and arms impressively strained. Yes, please, Beck said. 
Luke and Jensen gave nods of acknowledgement and then made for the driver's sides of their vehicles. I stayed behind with Bex and linked arms with her. How's it going? Looks like the whole town has turned up to help. I indicated the crowds of people hauling folding chairs from another pickup toward the spot where the pumpkin carving would be. The taco truck was already in place, and several families were gathered at the park on the south end watching their kids play. Yeah, they all come together for this, she said. I watched a toddler at the park nearly get hit by another older child on a swing and cringed, relieved when an adult swept the little boy up just in time. Who's got your kids? I asked. Cambry Bennett, Beck said. She lives just down the street from us and loves babies, so it's a perfect setup. Plus, she's only a freshman in high school, so her life isn't full of massive demands yet. A few more years, and I'll have to find someone else. I can't believe she's old enough to babysit now, I said. The last time I saw Cambry, she was that annoying kid who followed us around asking us who we liked. Bex laughed. I forgot about that. She throws a mean softball, though. Her family is pretty sporty, I said. I can see that about her. The walk from the high school to the square didn't take more than five minutes. Bales of straw had been placed at the entrance of the pumpkin walk on Delford Street just across from the square, along with a wooden sign painted with the words, Start Here. Several carved jack-o'-lanterns had already begun lining up along the road to the dead-end overlook that peered toward the train bridge and the cemetery on the hill in the distance. Looks like I'll need to get a pumpkin carved, I said. Bex angled her head back. So you're staying for tonight. What have you decided about the house? Are you sticking around a little longer? For good? I don't know what I'm doing, I said honestly, the admission tearing at the same streak of guilt that had flared earlier. I had every intention of packing up the house and selling it the instant I could. But when my aunt and uncles came and cleaned the majority of the furniture out, that changed things more than I was expecting. Seeing the house so empty just really hit me, you know? Sometimes a change in perspective helps clarify things, Beck said. Yeah, it's caused me to really reflect and think. I chewed my lip. She and I crossed the street, heading closer to the square. Luke offered to buy the house. He did? Yeah. Beck stopped. But... I took in the bustle of people. The tables that still needed to be set up stood next to a backed-up truckload of uncarved pumpkins that had been donated by the Hutchinsons, who had a huge pumpkin farm where they let people pick pumpkins. Confessing everything to Luke had been so relieving. I hadn't opened up to Bex about everything yet, though she knew a lot of my struggles as it was, but I didn't want to bring it up again. I just wanted to move forward with the newfound equilibrium I'd had with Luke. We can talk about this later, I said. Let's get to these tables. Or we can talk about it now, Beck said. Jensen knows where those backdrops need to go. I could use the distraction. Okay. I met her gaze and planted my hands on my hips. I'll tell you what's been going on with me if you return the favor. Tell me what's going on with Rock. Nothing's going on with him, she said too quickly. And you can't be okay with that, I said. It's bothering you. So what I'm saying is, I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Her shoulders sagged. Okay, but you first. Bex made for the first of the tables that were situated on the north corner of the square. The wooden post with painted words indicating this is the pumpkin carving station, and she and I set about pulling the metal legs from their folded position under the tables, and standing them into place. So Luke wants to buy the house, she prodded, leading into the topic. That's interesting. He must like it there. He and Grandpa were good friends, and his time at the honeymoon cottage with Grandpa was special, I guess, I said. He came to love the house and its land and said he's been saving up for it since he moved here. Although I can't help but wonder how he managed to do that. Maybe he didn't mean he had the full price saved. Maybe he only has a down payment, Beck suggested, which was an excellent point. I wasn't sure how much the farmhouse would sell for by itself, but the house and the land too? Grandpa paid well, but I doubted he paid that well. 
Luke had rodeoed. Maybe he still had some money from that. What did you tell him? She asked. Before he offered, I tried going to the real estate office, but I couldn't bring myself to list the house yet, I said. And the instant he offered to buy it just got my back up. I've been so emotional, and the house has had an emotional effect on me too, one that I didn't understand completely until Luke got me to open up to him about it. Bex paused as she situated the chair. Oh? Then her expression shifted into something a little more intuitive and amused. Oh, you and Luke, huh? I couldn't fight my smile either, not with the way thoughts of him and recollections of our most recent kisses made my heart flurry. Yeah, I said. That was fast, she said. You have no idea. I thought back to his brother's question on whether we were dating or not. That might be something Luke and I needed to discuss, especially considering the way I looked forward to breaking in my new couch some more with him. When did he start showing interest in you? What does that mean? I mean, did he seem like he wanted to get to know you before or after he said he wanted to buy the house? I know you took him outside the Elkhorn that first night, but did you end up kissing him then? Is that when his interest began? I... The question stopped me short. I didn't like what she was getting at. Do you think he's only acting interested in me because he wants the house? I don't know, she said. But Luke has been pretty reclusive since he moved here. He and Chelsea Brown had a short fling until something happened to break them up, though I'm not sure what that was. Since then, he's kept to himself up there on that property. I just... Just make sure you know what you're doing, that's all. If he wants the house, make sure that's not his incentive for getting close to you. I didn't like her words of warning. I scanned the crowd to find Luke standing along the path that would become the pumpkin walk. He and Jensen were chatting, and from the gestures they made, I suspected they were discussing where to place the backdrop at the end of the street. I feel like there's more to him than that, I said. It's just, he knows you're leaving town, right? Yeah. A stab of conscience twisted my insides. And how far into things have you gone? You don't have to tell me. I'm just saying, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy to invest in something that isn't going to last. So if he's showing you much attention and offering to help you with stuff, she jutted a thumb in his direction. Make sure he's not just trying to get what he wants from you. I moved a few of the chairs that had been situated there up to the table and helped Bex lay out plastic tablecloths, all while her warnings chewed at me like mice gnawing wiring and insulation in the attic. Was Luke's attention to me only a result of his end goal? Did he really think me shallow enough that I would give in to his wishes because he was a good kisser? I suddenly regretted accepting his help so much, even though it was the most fun I'd ever had picking out a couch. Your turn, I said. Rock is gone a lot, Bex began, tucking her bottom lip into her teeth. Farmers work long hours. Once planting begins in March, he's gone from before the sun comes up, and I'm basically a single mom all spring and summer. It's the same thing in the fall, only worse and more demanding. Harvest adds a lot of stress for him because he also has a field crew he manages. He hires out drivers for his trucks to haul the beets from the field to the dump and back again, and sometimes they're a little rough with the equipment. So then, rather than just being able to get in and get the beets dug, he has to pause all operations in order to fix equipment. Can he hire a mechanic? I asked. Yeah, but that costs money, you know? Plus, he's got this mindset that no one can fix things as well as he can, so he insists on doing it himself. I'm surprised he trusts others enough to drive the trucks. I know. So anyway, that gets him in a bad mood, and when he comes home, kids are kids, you know? They're noisy and rowdy. They're excited to see their dad. But he's tired. He's got a headache. He's been working all day, and the last thing he wants is a bunch of chaotic children around. So then I feel all this pressure to keep the kids quiet and happy. Because that's how you keep your husband quiet and happy, I said. And that's not even to mention the companionship you need that you're probably not getting. 
she sniffed and crinkled her nose as if warding away emotion. I'm okay. I'm used to it. Used to handling everything yourself? Used to being pushed aside? He's got a lot on his plate, she said again. That doesn't make his bad attitude okay. We're getting by. I helped her bend for a few pumpkins to place on the tables, ready and waiting for the first comers as soon as the festival began. She retrieved a set of knives and other utensils that would be needed, along with patterns people could use to place over their pumpkin's round sides. I've never been married before, I began. She paused and met me with a glisten in her eyes that struck me to the core. Bex was a fighter. She always had been. And I'd never seen her cry, not since the time a softball hit her in the neck as she'd been running for home base during the final game of her senior season. She looked desperate for whatever I might say. I've never been married before, but I almost was, I repeated. And I know a relationship can only survive for so long on life support. It sounds like your marriage is in a coma, Bex. Like you're both plugged into an outside source that's getting you by, but isn't the internal functioning you both need. When was the last time you got away together, just the two of you? You guys need some CPR, and no one else is going to give it to you. See if Cambry will keep your kids overnight. Or if I'm still around, I'll watch them. You two take a weekend and get to know one another again. A tear escaped the corner of her eye. She chuckled at my metaphor. You're right. Once harvest is over, I'll talk to him about it. How long until harvest is over? Though I'd grown up here, I'd never been invested in the actual timeline. I only knew dump trucks frequented the roads from late August through the end of October, but it varied crop by crop. Beets will be dug by next week, she said with a new tone of hope in her voice that hadn't been there. I won't bring it up until then. He won't be able to go anyway, not when every day is precious. You're the one who's precious. She stared directly at me as though I'd spoken a concept she'd never heard before as though she hadn't been told how valuable she was in far too long. Chapter 20 I'm serious, I told her. Look at all you do for this town. I doubt this pumpkin walk would still be happening if it wasn't for you. And your kids, Bex, you are the reason they're thriving. They're well-behaved, they're fed and happy, and it's because of you. Laughter cut through the solemn moment. Luke and Jensen were making their way back to us. Jensen tucking a wrench into his pocket and Luke removing the work gloves he'd used to haul the boards. Thanks for your help, Jensen said. It's good to see you around town lately. No problem, Luke said. I know, I tend to keep to myself up there. Well, don't, Jensen said. You hunt? I, not for a few years. We should go sometime, Jensen said. You won't be able to get enough of it once you go with me. Some of us will be out for some geese here once December hits. Sure, Luke said. Hit me up. Great. See y'all later, Jensen said, waving to each of us in turn. Bye, Beck said, traces of emotion gone. She was a master at hiding her feelings, that was for sure. That wasn't something I was ever good at. All set up, Luke said. What else can we do? I think that's it, Beck said, dusting her hands and acting as though we weren't just having a conversation that tore at her heart. Hey there, said a voice. Emily Stone strolled past the sign labeling this as the pumpkin carving station. Belle, you're still here. It sure is good to see you around. Thanks, I said. And then I added, you too, while warmth stirred in my heart. I could do this. I could see the good in others. And who's your friend? Emily smiled flirtatiously at Luke before lifting a hand to stop the answer. Oh, I know you. You're Hank's assistant up there. Beck shot me a look that was just shy of an eye roll. You were at the funeral, she said, calling Emily out. You heard him speak. Pink flushed Emily's cheeks, but she recovered quickly. My bad. It's just I don't see you around much. Must be something in the air. She turned to me expectantly, as though calling me out as the reason. 
Luke slid his arm around me and pulled me close. Must be. A sliver of satisfaction coursed through me. Emily sniffed and lifted her chin, stalking away. It was to her credit that Bex waited to laugh about it until Emily was out of earshot. She didn't show any indication that she doubted Luke's motives the way she'd voiced. In fact, if I didn't know her as well as I did, she would be a hard person to read. That made her the best secret keeper. With the sun hanging lower at the edges of the fields and the sky in orange that rivaled the pumpkins around us, the street lamp's glow became more evident. I wasn't sure if they'd been on before or had only just been turned on, but either way, the darkness was discernible. Looks like the town's lighting up, Beck said. Families will be coming out. The square will be filled within minutes. Need anything else? I asked her. I think we're good. Cambry is bringing my kids, and then she's up first to man the carving booth. Why don't you two ramp up the first pumpkins of the night? I'm assuming you haven't carved one to set out for the walk yet. We haven't, Luke said, turning to me. What do you say? Sounds good to me. I stuffed a few dollars into the donation jar and selected a particularly plump pumpkin, hugging it on my way to the closest table. Luke did the same, though the pumpkin he chose was quite a bit taller than mine. We retrieved knives from the boxes at the end of the table and sat. The last time I carved a pumpkin was the last time I came to the heyday pumpkin walk, I said, taking a breath and stabbing the blade into the top of the pumpkin. Oof, Luke said in response. Remind me not to get on your bad side. I've got nothing against this pumpkin. Just need to give it a new face, that's all. I smirked and followed the circle around with my knife, slicing and sawing until the top was loosened enough to remove. As I pulled it free, a stringy orange mess attempted to maintain its hold, so I had to pull harder to wrench the top loose. I'll have you put the innards here, Lula Reynolds, the cook at the Elkhorn said, bringing a large stainless steel bowl to the ground by our table. We'll be plucking the seeds free and putting them to good use. I began scooping out the slimy innards and disposing them into the bowl. Why does pumpkin carving get such hype, I asked, when it's so disgusting? The end result is worth it, Luke said, concentrating. He'd gotten more of an amount excavated from his pumpkin than I had, and soon he had the knives in his craftsman's hands, his handsome face pinched in concentration. While I barely managed to saw out mismatched triangles for the eyes and wonky wedges for the mouth, so my pumpkin ended up being a goofy representation of cliched jack-o'-lantern faces, Luke was still concentrating, dividing out particular lines and carefully cut intricate designs. You are definitely putting more effort into yours than I did mine, I said, staring back at the cheesy grin my jack was giving me. Luke had the same look on his face that he'd had when he'd shown me the portion of the barn Grandpa had rented out to him, the part he'd turned into his wood shop. Just trying to get it how I want it, he said. What are you carving, exactly? That would ruin it, he said, giving me a wink. You'll just have to wait and see. I hate waiting. Too bad. I folded my arms and sank into my chair, watching him work without breaking a sweat. He began to angle his hands and make sweeping motions with the knife, bringing the pumpkin out in ways I didn't expect. He put this much effort into a pumpkin carving? Into something he wasn't even going to enjoy for himself? A feeling told me Luke paid attention to detail no matter how seemingly insignificant the project at hand was. When I was 14, my mom gave me a whittling kit for Christmas, he said, explaining as he went. I learned a few strokes there and began to carve little owls and other things, you know, canoes and spoons and things. I was hooked from there, and soon I began carving into every bit of stick I could find. And it transitioned into building things with wood from there, I asked. It did. I took a woodshop class in high school and would often stay after class to ask the teacher additional questions. I ended up building twice the projects that others in my class did. Like what? What did you build? A bookshelf, he said. I gave it to my mom. And a nightstand. That ended up being a gift for my brother, Colton. Do you ever keep any of it for yourself? You were at my place. My dining table. I lowered my knife. Stop. You did not build that. I did, he said. 
It was one of my favorite projects. The rounded table had been immaculate, and it looked like something we might have stumbled across back at the furniture store. Luke, what are you doing working as a farmhand? Why not go into business? I had intended to, he said. Thought I would once I was done rodeoing. But you know something funny? He paused, settling the gooey knife in his hand on his leg. I got into that accident and it flipped my whole world. I don't want to build and sell furniture for a living. I've been saving up to buy a farm of my own, maybe even a ranch. There's plenty of land out there and I want some of my own. I never would have realized that if it hadn't been for Hank. Grandpa talked you into it? Not exactly, Luke said, resuming his carving. He turned his head to the side so he could get the knife at a different angle. But he exposed me to it and made me see the beauty in working the land and caring for animals. This job I've been working at up at your place isn't permanent. I've always known that. Even though Hank told me more than once I could settle there as long as I liked. It's what I told you before. I want to have a good start. I want somewhere that's my own. He began removing the pieces he'd meticulously carved from the pumpkin, including a larger chunk at one time than I'd realized. As he removed pieces, an image began to take shape. Luke, is that? I took in the line of the remaining pieces, the shape of a structure, and the jagged edges indicating bushes in front of it. Did you carve the farmhouse? Maybe, he said. Not necessarily yours, but a farmhouse. I want a place just like it, Belle. I want land I can work with, animals I can care for and tend, cattle to wander the range. I cannot believe you did that without a pattern, I said with amazement, examining the precise lines. In comparison to the chunks I'd hacked into my pumpkin, he might as well have taken a ruler to his, or perhaps a miniature saw. The work was flawless. Oh, I've got a pattern, he said sinking back and admiring his handiwork. Knife handle still in his hand, he grinned smugly and pointed to his temple. Had it in there for a while now. I hope you get your farm, Luke, I said earnestly. Lula appeared again and bent for the bowl we'd put our pumpkin goo into. Smiling, she bent for it and tottered toward the tent. Luke placed his knife down and glanced around. What do we do with these knives? Do we leave them here or should we take them to Lula? I peered to find the pleasant lady dumping the bowl of seed goo into a plastic bag, presumably so she could clean the seeds and use them later. While I enjoyed eating pumpkin seeds as much as the next person, that was a cause I wasn't anywhere near dedicated enough to. Hey there! Cambry strolled toward us with Cody on one side of the stroller and Paisley on the other. She used to be about as short as Cody in my mind's eye. Now she was tall and thin, filling out the way girls growing into womanhood did. Her features had matured quite a bit, and she was very pretty, with long, styled chestnut hair. I want to carve a pumpkin, Cody said. Me too, Paisley added, jumping up and down in place. Can we, Camby? Can we? You'll have to wait for your mom before I agree to put knives in your hands, she said. Hey, Belle, long time no see. You too. You grew up fast, I told her. How old are you now? Fifteen she said. Is Bex around here? I was supposed to meet her. I'm here, Bex said, coming up from the direction of the pumpkin walk entrance. She still wore the same Disneyland hoodie, but she seemed to smile much more easily than she had when Luke and I had seen her before. It's really filling up. You guys will have to take a stroll and check out the road. Luke and I were about to head over and place ours there, I gestured to my empty place at the table. Looking good, she said, taking in our pumpkins. I could tell it was a casual statement because she did a double take on Luke's pumpkin, her eyes widening. Looking really good. Holy cow, Luke, where did you learn to do that? Here and there, Luke said, unaffected by her praise. I can't wait to see that all lit up, Cambry added admiringly. Cody and Paisley were running in circles around Sophia's stroller, and the baby laughed and pounded her little fists on the stroller's tray, showcasing her few teeth. Speaking of, Beck said, Jensen's going through and lighting all the pumpkins now. It's quite a sight. You'll have to go add yours so everyone can enjoy them. Sounds like a plan, Luke said, cradling his pumpkin under one arm and glancing at me. Ready? 
I hugged my little squash with the cheesy face to my side. Ready. Bex turned her attention to her kids and Cambry. Little Paisley bounced up and down. I want to carve, Mama. I want to carve. Luke and I strolled out from the pumpkin carving station that had obtained a significant amount of patrons since we'd first started carving ours. The sun had set completely now, and sure enough, the strand of pumpkins lined up along the road was a glowing orange trail. Luke and I walked down the street, slowing to admire the pumpkins and the various imprints on each face. Look at that one, Luke said, pointing to a face that looked like Elvis. Impressive, I said. I like that one. I pointed out a pumpkin that had swirly eyes. Another looked like a wolf howling at the moon. Yeah, these are really creative, Luke said. We reached the end of the line and placed our pumpkins at the end of the ever-increasing line. Jensen greeted us and lit our pumpkins. I wondered who was going to light them all this year, I said, standing hand-in-hand hand with Luke and admiring the wobbly triangles I'd not really painstakingly carved. It was no work of art, but the sight of my pumpkin's happy, glowing face still passed some of its glow to me. Thanks, Jensen. It's my job, he said, but I admit, I get a sense of satisfaction seeing them all like this. All the years I've lived here, I never made it down for this, Luke said. Really? Jensen took in our joined hands then, his brow flicking with interest. And, I prodded. He considered. That's a crap load of pumpkins. Imagine how much pie you could make. Jensen and I laughed, and Luke added, I bet it'd taste gourd. gourd delicious. Jensen said. More laughter ricocheted among the three of us, and Luke's hand remained firmly in mine, even as people passed and sent us sideways glances. I considered pulling away, but I was too happy. And really, why should I worry about what they thought? At this point, people were going to guess we were together, so I didn't see any point in hiding our public display. I did wish so many of them would stop staring, though. You'd think we were the ones on display. I muttered once Jensen stalked up the street to light the new pumpkins that had been added to the walk. People are curious, Luke said. I don't usually come down from Hank's, and they're seeing the two of us together. Of course, they're going to start to wonder. Besides, are you dating anyone else? My mouth bobbed a few times. What do you think? I guess I should have clarified before now, he said with a chuckle. But it's probably something they're all wondering about. You've made it clear you're not staying, and yet, here you are. A twinge folded my stomach in on itself. Here I am. We approached the dead end. A sign marked it as such, as well as a line of tall pines towering into the stars. Soon, once enough were carved, the pumpkins would circle around, and the two sides of the street would meet up here. Though the road ended, a path meandered on through the trees, and led to a beautiful park barricaded by log railings. Squirrels liked to skirt the railings and search for food dropped by picnickers. A bench was placed at the perfect angle to take in the view of the train bridge, and, though you couldn't see it clearly, the cemetery beyond. Luke and I followed the direction of the street, pivoting to make our way back to the square. A woman around Bex's age smiled at us and slowed her steps. I heard you were back in Bridgewater, Tisha said. She was shorter than I was and had put on a few more pounds since the last time I saw her, but her smile was as vibrant as ever. I've been wondering how you've been doing. Your grandpa's funeral was a beautiful service. Thank you, I said. You still running the Frontier Inn? Still running, she said. Business isn't what it used to be, but we're still hanging in there. Once winter kicks in, we'll get people stopping by to ski and snowmobile, so... I'm betting things will pick up soon. I hope so, I told her. Good to see you, she said, passing by on her way to the overlook. You too. Before we reached the square, we bumped into Geraldine from the mercantile store, who waved and offered to stop by because she wanted to bring me a plate of something. Jill Owens, who was in my graduating class and now worked as a waitress in the cafe, suggested I stop by for some lunch to catch up. Kyle Wakefield, Bex's brother at the insurance company, laughed and joked with Luke, and I began to see the town in a way I hadn't allowed myself to in so long. I had loved Bridgewater as a kid for this reason. It seemed like even though my mom had died, 
And after Grandma passed, all I had was Grandpa. I had so much more than that, too. A whole handful of people who lived in the tight-knit community day in and day out, who had one another's backs, who showed care and concern. You and Jensen seem to pal up fast, I said, once we'd stopped greeting people. Have you guys been friends long? Actually, tonight is the first time I've really talked to him. Oh, how come? The square came into view. People laughed, kids played. Country music blasted from a speaker system that had been set up, and Luke's steps slowed. It was almost as if he wasn't ready to immerse himself with people just yet. I know it may not seem that way, but the fallout with Chelsea was hard. I've kind of kept myself at a distance from people here since. Bex mentioned you didn't come into town much. She's right. It's nice, though. Nice talking to Jensen. And he invited you hunting. He did, which is cool of him. I haven't had friends in a long time. But thanks to you, you got me out and mingling again. I'm glad. People should know you. They need to know how fun you are, how good at things you are, how you're willing to dive in and help anybody. Shh, don't spread that around too much. I'll never get any rest. I laughed at his discreet manner and leaned my head on his shoulder. I guess we're helping each other then. I probably wouldn't be here walking through if it wasn't for you either. I wouldn't have ventured to the Elkhorn again. You would have come for Bex. True, I would have come to help, but I wouldn't have stayed for the walk. You got me here, Luke. He watched me, eyes gleaming and inquisitive, but I couldn't answer the unspoken question. Would I stay? At this moment, I wanted to. I wanted more nights like this, and the day preceding it, too. Spending time with Luke had been invigorating. Having someone I could talk to, someone who would listen to the deepest thoughts of my heart and not condemn me for them. Having someone who would share things about himself, too. Someone who took time to help not only me, but my friends. Someone who kissed as though he were a spark plug to my dead battery. I couldn't stop thinking about the way he'd held me, the way his lips felt against mine, the way he made me tingle in the aftermath when we just held one another's heartbeats. He'd given me a new perspective I hadn't had in so long, a sense of wonder and purpose. He'd allowed me to find myself again, and I didn't want to lose her a second time. If I stayed here and made the farmhouse my own, if I pursued a happy life with Luke, was that a betrayal of Eli's memory? It didn't seem fair somehow that I could have this much happiness and normalcy again. I'd held myself back for so long, thinking I deserved to feel bad. But what if I didn't? What if I deserved to be happy? Chapter 21 Bex ambled down the walk with her kids. She pushed the stroller where Sophia had nodded off to sleep, while Cody held on to one side of the stroller and Paisley held on to the other. It was a lovely image of her out with her kids. I was struck with sadness at how much Rock was missing. Did he miss his family? Was that the reason he was so cranky all the time? The night was growing colder by the minute. I was ready to suggest Luke and I head back to the farmhouse, when my phone buzzed again. An ice cube slid into my stomach. It was Uncle Thomas again. This time, I didn't ignore the call. He was going to keep calling me until I answered. Might as well see what he wanted. Uncle Thomas again, I told Luke. Hang on. Luke nodded. My hand was colder without the warmth of his, but I stepped through a group of laughing kids to where the statue honoring veterans from past wars was situated in the center of the square and held the phone to my ear. Hey, Uncle Thomas. Bell, how are you? Listen, have you thought any more about my offer? I haven't, I said, though in all reality, I had thought about it. And my main thoughts leaned toward rejection. I couldn't hand the house over to him and watch him commercialize it. Then again, if I was going back to Oregon, what did it matter? I would know. That was why. I peered at Luke, watching him shoot the breeze with Emmett Hillard. Unless I sold the house to Luke. 
What did he want it for, though? Did that matter? The thought of him settling down and starting a family there with someone else presented a possibility I didn't like much either. The more time we spent together, the more I started picturing that kind of future with him. But I couldn't get ahead of myself. We'd only known one another a matter of days, and that was a serious commitment. That's all right, Uncle Thomas said, a little too brightly. That's all right. You've had a lot on your mind lately. Just wanted to put a bug in your ear. My partner and I are ready to move forward with the investment. So how about we put a deadline on things to hurry them along? A deadline? He had a business partner? I don't want to rush the decision, I told him. I understand that. You're a smart girl. Of course you are. Of course, you'd like to take your time, and that's commendable. He spoke fast and methodically, impersonal, as though he were a salesman in a car lot instead of the uncle I'd known all my life. But we've got it all cleaned out. I got a housekeeper all lined up, and we're ready to get things converted over. I even have a listing all ready to go, Belle. Things are in place, and the only thing holding us back is you. My brain spun for a moment, hardly able to keep up. He'd gone from a smooth talker coercing me into joining him in the venture to a pushy salesman persona who already had a business partner. Why was he in such a hurry? That's a little premature, isn't it? I said. Why would you get things put together to market a property you don't own? Frustration began to build inside of me. How cocky could he be? I'd witnessed Uncle Thomas behave this way before, though. There'd been one night he'd come by to talk to Grandpa about giving him the money for an investment. I'd been excused from the room, but I'd heard the entire conversation from the top of the stairs, and Thomas had bullied Grandpa in the same smooth-as-butter, aggressive way. Grandpa hadn't given in that night, and Thomas had left in a rage. I wasn't about to give in either. I'll let you know when I'm ready to decide, I told him, raising my glance to the crystal clear sky and the twinkling spread of stars overhead. So you might want to put a hold on all your plans. His fake tone shifted to something a little more real. Just like that. A chill swept over me. Just like what? I told you we got plans in order. And I said to put them on hold. I'm not ready yet, Uncle Thomas. I didn't like how confrontational he was becoming. It ramped up my pulse and my defensiveness, kicking in my fight-or-flight mode. All right, he said, voice tense. You just call me when you are. Boy, that sounded like a threat. Have a good night, I said, trying to keep things civil, though they felt like anything but. My hands trembled as I ended the call, and the night's cold started to seep into my bones. Where had that come from? I couldn't understand why he was in such a hurry. What was the rush? What was it that made him desperate enough to threaten me? I should just decline outright, and in fact, in hindsight, I wished I had. Everything okay? Luke asked as I returned to his side. We fell into place together and began strolling toward the food stands. A delicious aroma of cooked pork and beans emanated from the taco truck, and my stomach grumbled. Although, with how cold it was, I wouldn't have minded some hot chocolate. If you call needing to throw something okay, then sure, I'm okay, I said. I couldn't stop my hands and chest from trembling. How about this? Luke indicated to the set of hay bales that were stacked and marked with targets. Orange and yellow leaves rustled to create a backdrop and clash with the typical green the grass offered. Kids dashed through the mounds of leaves that had already fallen from trees. I wished I could join them. Axe throwing is new, I said, gesturing to the large painted target made of wood situated at a distance from the standing point for people to stay and attempt to throw their axes at the bullseye. Standing guard at the opening of the straw bales and ready to pass out the weapons to those who wanted to try, was Chris Bodily, the resident axe expert. I think I'll give it a shot. What do you say? Chris handed us each a set of three lightweight axes. They were special hatchets that were balanced appropriately for throwing, with their silver blades and taped handles. 
I wasn't sure how to go about this. Do I hold the handle? You hold it like this, Luke instructed. You ready to get your butt whooped? The only butt whooping will be yours. What will you give me if I win? Why should I give you anything? Because it's more fun that way, he smirked. When I win, you owe me the answer to a question. I intended on asking him what he really wanted with the farmhouse. I couldn't buy into Bex's suspicions that Luke was only interested in me because he wanted the house. But I had to ask. Is that all? It's a big deal, I argued. I'd answer your question without any kind of bargain, though. Even so, this answer seems like fair payment, because you have to be completely honest. He eyed me. I could tell my request got his suspicions up. All right. And if I hit the bullseye? I held my breath. I wasn't sure I was ready for whatever he might ask. I suppose I could dig out a secret dirty enough for his liking if it came to that. My mind began searching for possible confessions when he stopped me short. He leaned in close. You. Me. Your couch. I nibbled my lower lip to fight a smile, but it didn't work. You don't have to bargain with me for that, either. He lifted a shoulder. My lungs stilled, and I was held captive by his intense eyes. And I found I didn't have the capacity to deny his request. He could have said anything. He could have brought up wanting the house. But he didn't. He just wanted me. You have to win first, I told him. Oh, believe me. If your lips are on the line, they're all mine. I imagined kissing him while drowning in pillows and cushions. I thought back to our first kiss, the one where I'd made a complete fool of myself. I was so glad he wanted more with me after I'd acted so foolish that first night. Do we have a deal? He asked. Kisses or secrets, I said. Suddenly I knew which of the two options I preferred. I wanted a kiss from him. I wanted to get lost in a sea of pillows to have him take my breath away. But I wasn't about to lose on purpose. Have you done this before? I asked him. Bet with a beautiful woman? Ha ha, I meant axe throwing. Have you? What do you think? I think the odds of going against me are fairly even, he said. I'm betting you've never had the opportunity to chuck a sharp piece of metal attached to a handle at inanimate objects. And neither have I then I like our odds. That meant this was a first for us both. We throw at the same time. Agreed, he said. Are you going to count us off? I think we'd better give that pleasure to someone else, just to make things fair. He asked Chris if he would count us off, and he agreed with a fervent nod. I stood at the precipice of my line, several feet away from where Luke stood. My hands trembled. So much was at stake for this. And though I wanted to win, I also wanted Luke to get his prize rather than mine. It came down to one thing. I'd have to just give it my best effort. I waited for Chris's countdown. When he got to two, Luke peered over at me and offered a wink. Scoundrel. I wondered if he wanted to win as badly as I wanted him to. Except my curiosity to see how well I could manage this also elbowed into the battle. Nerves tense, fingers tingling. I gripped my axe and eyed the bullseye. What was the best tactic for hitting the center? I needed to aim high. Gravity would certainly play a part in this, and the axe would only sink as it streamed its way toward the target. Three was called, and Luke's axe flew before my managed to. I gave a final heartfelt perusal and flicked my wrist, adding as much force behind the throw as I could. The axe spun through the air and hit the target with a dull thud. We then continued with our other two, aiming and chucking them toward the targets as well. I won, Luke called out, boots stamping down the straw. You don't know that yet, I argued, hiking over the line to retrieve the axes with him. He walked with me toward mine first. Not bad. He indicated the axe's landing point with a long finger. 
Mine landed in the third ring rippling away from the bullseye. Now yours. We walked together the few feet to where his target lay. Excellent, he muttered, hands on his hips in obvious pride. My pulse went ragged. His blade had landed between the bullseye and the first outer ring. Beginner's luck, I told him, swatting his arm. He nodded his thanks to Chris for his help with the axes and pried his free. I wrenched mine out, my nerves buzzing in full awareness and anticipation. I couldn't keep the smile from my cheeks, though I fought hard to keep him from seeing how pleased I was with the results. We placed our axes on Chris's table, expressed our thanks, and then Luke's hand found mine. I don't mean to gloat, he began. Of course you do. You're right. I won. And I have to say, this is a first, I said. Not used to losing? I looked him square in the face. Actually, I'm not used to being glad about it. His left brow tweaked just enough. His eyes flicked to my mouth. Are you? Interesting. In that case, when should we carry out your payment? My stomach did a little flip. Who says we have to fulfill it right now? I do. It was in the fine print. I laughed and then trapped my bottom lip in my teeth and glanced around. Activities were in full swing. Families were gathered in the carving area while others hauled their pumpkins to be placed in line with the others. Other children were playing at the park area, and the night was full of laughter, light, and life. I don't think Bex needs our help anymore, I said. We could head back to the farmhouse. Then that couch is all ours. His grin turned wolfish. He seized my hand and dragged me away from the square, from the pie-eating contest, the lineup of jack-o'-lanterns, and the spread of space situated for dancing. The song with the bluegrass tunes twang resonated in the evening air, and though the air had turned cold, heat shot through my veins. I hoped he wasn't going to wait until we got back to the farmhouse. I was gratified and blazing with unsteady limbs. His truck? Would he drive me somewhere and wait until we were alone? Luke nodded to people as we went, and many acted surprised to find him so friendly and sociable. We passed the fire pit where several families gathered to warm their hands, and before I knew it, Luke tugged me between a shed and the stack of straw bales that had been spray-painted to announce the festival's exit. My heart thrilled to share this private space with him, to act so clandestinely and have something so intimate so only ours in a public place. Shadows crowded us in and blocked everyone else out. What happened to the couch idea? I said. You said you wanted a secret, he began. I didn't win. I lingered close and soaked in the heat of his body in the shadowed nook we'd sequestered ourselves in. Doesn't mean I can't share. What did you want to ask me? I opened my mouth but couldn't find the words. I didn't want to ruin this charge between us. Accusing him of only wanting to be with me because he wanted the house would certainly do that. Before I worked things through, Luke's phone rang. Are you going to get that? I asked. That's your question? I'm disappointed in you, soldier. Still smiling, he lifted the phone. I'll just slap this on silent. But he froze mid-sentence. What is it? Sorry, I think I'd better answer. It's Kyler. He never calls me. Kyler, your brother? Luke swiped, and as the conversation carried on, the light gradually dimmed from his face, so that by the time he ended the call, he acted as though he was in a daze. He placed a hand on the side of one of the straw bales, blocking us in as though he needed stability. What's wrong? I asked. Had he given him a hard time for being so standoffish at lunch? He sounded so urgent, Luke said, shaking his head as he spoke. Kyler lives at home, so I thought maybe something had happened to my mom. Oh my gosh, Luke, is she okay? He gestured, lifting his shoulders. She's all right, but Dawson isn't. Dawson? What happened? The worry in his face was unmistakable. He was in a rodeo accident. Luke said. Chapter 22 I lifted my hands to my mouth. 
This was all the worse because Luke had had a similar experience during his rodeo days. He told me he'd been bucked from his horse and kicked in the chest, which left him with a few broken ribs. What happened? Is he okay? A dozen horrible scenarios drifted through my mind. It had been a long time since I'd gone to a rodeo, but I knew the kinds of accidents that could happen to the cowboys and cowgirls who participated in such fast-moving activities while riding broncs and even bulls. Getting thrown? Getting trampled? I sent a silent prayer heavenward. Please, God, let him be okay. He's okay, for now. He got kicked in the head. He's pretty out of it. Head injuries were no laughing matter, that much I knew. Where is he? They took him to the ER in Burley. Luke remained where he was, unmoving, as if he didn't know what to do with himself. I froze in place for the moment as well. The ER. Logically, I knew Luke needed to be where his brother was. He needed to show his support. And I wasn't going to leave him alone in this either. But the hospital? The edges of my skull began to tingle, reminiscent of my earlier injury a sure sign that my anxiety was rising. Any ER would have been challenging to face again. But this one was the same emergency room I'd been taken to. I couldn't go back there, could I? Luke still wasn't moving. While I wanted him to take action, it was clear he was too stunned to do much of anything. This was no time for cowardice. I mustered my courage and grasped his hand. Then let's go. I... I'll drive. Luke met my gaze. Are you sure? The tingling edging my skull increased, but I fought it down. I refused to let it win this time. I drew in an inhale, held it, and then puffed it out again, hoping he read the motions as being completely normal. Of course. Give me your keys. He still didn't move. Luke. Your brother needs you. This statement wasn't only for him. Saying it aloud helped me too, and the fuzz lining my skull abated just enough. He let me take his hand, and we marched to his pickup, which was parked close to the opening of the pumpkin walk. He stopped at the driver's side, one hand on the handle, as though he'd forgotten my offer. I intercepted with a hand on his arm. He startled again. I tiptoed up to press a kiss to his cheek. Really, I assured him. I've got you. I'm giving you room. He bobbed his head and stalked to the other side of the truck. I climbed behind the steering wheel. With the thought of the hospital as our destination, my hands began to quiver, the same stupid anxiety I'd battled for so long manifesting itself. But as I'd done before, I used logic to push it down. I can't let Luke down now. He's clearly not up to driving himself. That means he needs me. I concentrated on him, on making small talk and getting him there. The drive through farmland and into Burley took its usual 20 minutes, and then the hospital came into view. The side attempted to take its usual effect over me, the panicking irritation that swept across my skull and clouded over my airways, but this time, I didn't let it. This time, I was here for Luke, and he kept me grounded. I kept the steady mantra going in my mind. I'm here for Luke. 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 Besides, enough time had passed. I needed to get over this, and if facing my fears was what it took, so be it. I do it for him. I pulled into the parking lot and found a space, shifting into park. I hurried over and offered my hand to Luke as he stepped onto the pavement. I'm right here, I told him. And your brother will be okay. Let's go see him. Luke gave me a fleeting glance, then a nod. Then his hand. I locked his truck and we hurried inside. I swore I'd never come back here. I told him as we approached the entrance, trying to get his mind on something besides his own worries. And admittedly, I was trying to alleviate my own as well. Why? he asked. Except I suddenly realized how bad of an idea it was to talk about my accident now. 
but I had brought it up, and there was no going back. Bex's words on PTSD rushed to me. I've heard facing your fears helps to ease them. Making yourself face this could be the best thing for you. I was facing this. For Luke. Luke. I was doing this for Luke. After my car accident, I was brought to this hospital in an ambulance. The whole experience was extremely traumatic, and I've been fighting anxiety since it happened. Even with the therapy I've had, it's still a struggle. That anxiety tends to flare up when I bring myself to the places associated with the ordeal, and the whole thing was hard. I'm sorry, Luke said. He had one hand on the door, but he lowered it. You shouldn't have come then. You want to wait out in the truck? I tightened my grip on his hands. What I'm saying is, I'm not struggling with any of that right now. For the first time since it happened, I'm able to beat that fear thanks to you. That realization was monumental. I was at the door. I was about to go in. And it was okay. Me? He seemed lost for words, so I patted his arm and reached for the door he hadn't yet opened. And with an uninhibited breath, I stepped into the hospital with Luke. The ER waiting room had several occupants, but we headed to the desk to tell the receptionist who we were there to see. Certainly, she said. I'll let them know you're here. You should be able to head right back. Thanks, I told her. And then Luke and I found a seat and he turned to me for further explanation. It's because of you that my anxiety isn't all over the place, I told him hardly able to believe I was sitting here without any conflict inside. I was sitting here just like any other person. That was saying so much. You got better, he said. I did, but with a brain injury, it rewired something in my head. I had all kinds of panic attacks after the accident, Luke. It took me a long time to even handle going to the grocery store or church, other places with multiple people. Even a situation like this used to make me feel like the walls were closing in on me. I gestured to the waiting room. It's not me, he said. You've made progress, that's all. Not completely, I said. You should have seen me when I first returned to Bridgewater. I'd gone to therapy and thought the panic attacks were past me, but coming back into town made them start up all over again. Yet since I've been spending time with you... They seem to have stopped again. Even now, things would be flaring off the charts. But I'm here with you. You help me be strong. Luke placed his other hand over mine, so he was now encompassing them both. Then we're helping each other, he said, turning his attention to the nurse at the desk. She announced that we could head back, and so we stood to follow her. Luke's fingers crushed mine. I held tight and we approached the curtained area beyond the nurse's station. My heartbeat ratcheted while memories of the aftermath of my car accident with Eli flared, but I kept my calm, my focus on Luke. I could do this, for him, and maybe for me too. I was affected for a completely different reason with that thought. How many hours had I prayed for help in overcoming this fear? How many times had I pleaded that God would remove this obstacle from my life? Who knew it would have taken facing it to give me the strength I needed? I couldn't have done this without Luke. I only felt bad that it came at the cost of his brother's well-being, and I sent another prayer heavenward in Dawson's behalf. He'd been kind and welcoming when we met just earlier that day. Please, Lord, let him be okay. Dawson lay in the bed, his head lolled to one side. He looked as though he were sleeping, and with his hair buzzed as short as it was, signs of the injury were purpled and blatant on the left side of his head. A clip was situated on his finger, its line connected to the machine at his bedside tracking his vital signs. Lines of his heartbeat appeared on the screen, and the steady beeping noise reflected those lines. An older woman with graying brown hair tied back into a ponytail and wearing a light jacket, sat beside Kyler, who held the rim of his cowboy hat in his hands. He nervously turned the hat in small increments at a time. How's he doing? Luke asked, interrupting the quiet. Luke, 
the woman said, rising and going to him. Luke's arms enveloped her, and he rested his cheek on her head. Hey, Mom. How's he doing? He asked again. He's alive, she said into his jacket, her arms wrapping around his torso. It feels like you all over again. You boys and your recklessness. Luke hugged her tightly as she began to cry. I'd never pegged Luke as being reckless, but then again, I'd never seen him astride a horse in a rodeo either. This must be a terrible thing for a mother to witness, seeing her children injured and being unable to do anything to help them. The bronc bucked him off, she said, pulling back and wiping her tears. He landed hard, bruh, Kyler interjected, speaking for the first time. Like Luke, he towered over their mother. He and Luke shared the same sturdy chin and straight noses, yet Kyler had his own look, too. He inclined his head at me with tenderness in his eyes. I pressed my lips into a grateful smile, hoping he could read my condolences in it as well. The machine beeped a steady rhythm, marking every beat Dawson's heart made. But Dawson still hadn't stirred. So the bronc corkscrewed and stomped on him when he came off? Luke asked. I wondered how he'd gotten that information, but it must have been what Kyler had relayed when he'd called to let Luke know what happened. They said it's a concussion, a fairly severe one at that. His mother returned to her seat, and Luke moved in closer to Dawson's side. Don't you worry. It'll be all right, Mom. He's still got some fight in him, Luke said encouragingly. He does, his mom said. The space around us quieted except for the machine's monotone beeping. Luke's mom wiped her cheeks and smiled. Luke, you brought someone with you. Hi, I said, feeling all kinds of awkward. Did she mind that I was here? Maybe it had been a bad idea to come and meet his mother under such tragic circumstances. I hadn't given it much thought. Luke returned to my side. This is Belle Toby, Hank's granddaughter. Belle, this is my mother, Deborah Holden. Belle. Deborah rose and came to me, pulling me into a hug that surprised me. Her arms were warm, her embrace steady. Hank was such a godsend for our boy. It's nice to meet you. I only wish it were in better circumstances. Me too, I said. Another awkward pause lingered. I wanted to offer some comforting words, something that might help. I had a head injury, I said. I know how difficult they are to deal with. You poor thing, Deborah said. It was hard, I said. Brain injuries are serious, but I healed. You had a brain injury? I nodded. I was down for months, bedridden for at least four. After that, even the most menial activities like sweeping the floor or going upstairs drained me of energy and caused my brain to flare up. I had to rest after the smallest tasks and the slightest movements made me extremely dizzy. It took over a year for my brain to fully heal, and even then, sometimes, the dizziness flared up again. Her face fell, and she cast a forlorn glance in Dawson's direction. I hurried to ease her. I wasn't sharing all of this to rob her of hope. The opposite, in fact. The point is, I healed. He will, too. Now, I barely notice I had the injury at all. I'm still able to function, to read, to drive, to work. Sometimes watching movies is a little rough, but even that isn't a huge setback. What I'm trying to say is, he'll come out of this and be okay. Thank you, Deborah said. I hope you're right. Dawson moaned. His head lolled as his eyes opened. Mom, he said groggily. I'm here. She scurried over to take his hand. Luke's here too. Dawson's head lifted. His clouded gaze lifted, sweeping the area until they landed on Luke. Hey, he said. Thanks for coming. Hey, man. Luke touched Dawson's arm. The resemblance I'd noticed at lunch wasn't quite as stark as that between Luke and Kyler, but it was still there in the lines of their brows. Sounds like you got yourself into a bad box. Luke said. That won him a weak smile from his injured brother. I sure did. Don't you know you're not supposed to take on the hooves? They'll win every time. 
Dawson managed another smile. Should have stayed on my horse. That's all right, Luke said, patting his hand. You're good now. Now you just concentrate on healing. Thanks, brother, Dawson said, eyes drifting closed. The machine continued beeping, and Deborah brought fingers to her lips in a nervous reaction. Luke kept his eyes on Dawson's steady breathing for several more beats before turning to her. Where's Bryce? he asked. He's on his way back from delivering a load to Jackson, Deborah replied. And Colton? You told him? He said he'll keep Dawson in his prayers. He can't get away right now. Luke nodded. The side of his jaw flexed, and I wondered what he was thinking. I was surprised he'd asked after Bryce, after he'd told me of the contention that existed between them, but glad as well. I am only grateful God gave my boy a second chance, Deborah said. He could have chosen to take him, but he's still here. A second chance. The words struck me with physical force, and though the trip to the hospital hadn't been as difficult for me as I'd expected it to be, this concept was. Still, as before, now was not the time. I cast it aside, close to my heart, saving it for later. We stayed a little while longer until the doctor came again to check Dawson's progress. To everyone's relief, he was released from the hospital's care with several instructions and a prescription for medications Dawson would need in the coming days. My heart went out to him. Though I'd had a head injury and had lost memories of the incident itself, I remembered my time in the hospital and the moments that followed. The difficulty moving. The incredible, terrible spinning brought on by vertigo. The sense of being trapped and that I was going to lose myself because my brain had been affected so badly. The dead quiet in the hospital due to the late night hour was stilling. Kyler pushed Dawson's wheelchair along the linoleum hallway, past closed doors, and a darkened gift shop, with Deborah at his side chewing on her nails. The night had turned colder, the stars speckled overhead. We accompanied them to Deborah's car and helped Dawson climb into the front seat. Take it easy, Luke told him. Dawson stared blankly as if he weren't completely comprehending things. Not giving him a chance to answer, Luke closed the door, and then he turned to his mom. You got things from here? We can come to the house and help you get him inside. We'll be all right, Deborah said, patting Luke's shoulder. Kyler can help, and Bryce may already be there. At the mention of Bryce, that muscle in Luke's jaw tensed. Okay, then. Call me if anything changes, and I'll be right there. We will. Then she peered around him. It was good to meet you, Belle. I hope to see you again sometime. Thanks. Good luck. Hope all goes well with him. Kyler did a chin nod and climbed into the back seat. Luke and I waited for her to back out and head toward the parking lot exit before he released an exhale. I slipped my arms around his waist, and he hooked his arm around me, keeping me close, and we stood there in the chilly night. I can't believe he's hurt, Luke said. I know. I had no idea your injuries were that extreme. It must have been difficult for you to be back here. Yeah, it was. We walked toward the other end of the parking lot, steps silent, lost in our own thoughts. You can say it, you know, Luke said, opening my door. He'd opted to drive this time. I climbed in and waited for him to do the same before answering. Say what? Luke didn't do more than insert the keys into the ignition and turn the key. Warm air gusted gently from the vents, and I welcomed its contrast from the cool night. Whatever you're thinking. In fact, I'd guess I know your thoughts right now. Okay, then. What am I thinking about? Eli, he said. Chapter 23 Luke's gaze was unapologetic. My brows lifted. At least Luke had seemed to regain himself after being so affected by the news that his brother was hurt. Maybe he needed something else to focus on. So I went with the topic he introduced. Does that bother you? I asked. If I admit I was thinking of him? 
Why should it bother me? I had a ring, Luke. We were engaged. The invitations were sent out. So? I wasn't sure how to say this, not when Luke and I hadn't yet shared our feelings. I mean, I know you like me. Like was putting it mildly on purpose. I wouldn't put words in his mouth, not when I didn't know the depth of his feelings, such as they were. Caught, he said, quirking a handsome grin that added an additional flurry to my heart. So this can't be easy for you to know I was in love before. He considered for a few moments before turning to face me in the cab. I want to know everything about you, Belle, he said. Even the hard things. This isn't like Chelsea, where she cheated on me with my brother. Your relationship with Eli happened before I knew you. It's a part of who you are. He is a part of you. He is, I said. I loved the validation his words were giving me. He wasn't expecting me to suppress my feelings as I'd tried. As he'd done before, Luke was giving me permission to feel them. I never... Was this going too far too soon? I'd already started. Might as well finish the thought. I never thought I'd find anyone I could love again. Is that what's holding you back? He asked. His voice so gentle it wouldn't startle a feather. From me? From staying? I stared out the window at the empty parking lot. He's everywhere, I said. And he was. Every part of Bridgewater, of Burley, and the roads in between were shrouded with reminders of him. But I'd also had points in time where my feelings and focus had all been for Luke. Was there a chance I could let Eli go for good? How could I do that when it felt like such disloyalty to his memory? You can't avoid that, Luke said. Like I said, he's a part of you, and hiding from that won't change it. But you can heal from this. Your heart can heal. You can still have a good life after the one you lost. How? I asked, uncertain. I don't see how I can deserve love after that. I've had so much fun with you these past few days, and you've made me think it's possible. But then when I'm alone, my guilt settles in, and I feel like Eli is frowning at me from wherever he is. I feel like I'm betraying him, that I don't deserve love or happiness again. You deserve love, Luke said. We haven't talked about religion much, but I believe Christ made second chances not only possible, but real. I mean, look at Dawson. A kick to the head from a bucking bronc could have killed him, but it didn't. I believe he's still here for a reason, just like I believe I'm still here for a reason. Look at me. My eyes had planted on my hands in my lap, which were trembling under the impact of his words. I lifted them to find Luke's earnest face. My chest was nearly crushed in by a horse. By all rights, I shouldn't even be breathing today. And if that horse had kicked me on the right side, it could have stopped my heart. Then why didn't Eli get a second chance? The question came out with more emotion than I intended. Why does God let people we love die? I don't know. I don't claim to speak for him. But I think sometimes it's not part of his plan. Though the words were simple, I could feel in my bones that they were true. A warm stirring offering the peace I'd searched so long for settled through me, giving me rest. So you think it's God's plan that I got a second chance at life? I asked. I think that's something you'd better ask him. I hadn't prayed in years, not a real prayer, not aside from the little straying thoughts or pleas on another's behalf. The actual act of falling to my knees and imploring my Heavenly Father for answers hadn't happened since I'd first left Idaho, because I'd felt like my prayers only went as far as the ceiling. If God had a plan for me, I needed to know what that was. Maybe then it could help me as I tried to decide what to do about the farmhouse. 
and about my feelings for Luke. I'd been trying to navigate my path alone for so long. It was time I turned to the one who could give me the direction I'd been seeking. Why are you doing this? I asked him, sliding closer to the center of the cab. I wanted as little distance between us as possible. Why do you even care about me? I couldn't account for it in my mind, not when things had happened between us so quickly and when I'd been so awful to him. Yet we had chemistry. Even now in the cab, I felt the awareness begin to hum, the energy and attraction that pulled me to him like a magnet. Was that all it was between us? Attraction? I tucked my ankle under my other leg, and Luke's hand settled on my knee. You say that like you find it hard to believe that I do, he said. But I've liked you since the night you dragged me outside of the Elkhorn. That didn't compute at all. My behavior had been wretched. Why? I was a complete dolt that night. You were adorable. I was drunk and stupid. Your heart was on your sleeve. You were showing me a part of yourself I didn't think you meant to. That I was an idiot? That you want to be charmed, he said, tilting toward me and brushing his lips against my cheek. His proximity sent my pulse into a flurry. I tilted in, inhaling his woodsy scent, feeling my body begin to tremble. I wouldn't have let just anyone lead me out of the Elkhorn like that, he said in a silky tone. He kept his voice low, but its low timber trickled straight through me like a drink of warm cocoa, melting me, turning me supple. I went because I wanted to know more about you. I wanted to know your name, to put a finger on why you completely enchanted me with a single glance, and why I craved your company when I didn't even know who you were. His hand trailed to my neck, and he rubbed his thumb along my jaw. His eyes were genuine pools in the darkened cab, and I couldn't take mine from them. I knew if a woman could have that much effect over me without speaking, that I could only imagine how amazing it would be once I got to know her. You kissed me that night because you wanted to get to know me? I settled my hand on his arm. Yes. He slipped his hands to my waist and guided me closer. My heart climbed to a trot. And I like everything about you, Belle. Not just kissing you, although that's been amazing. But you're extremely thoughtful, and you feel things from the bottom of your heart. Your eagerness to preserve Hank's memories. You're willing to face the most difficult things you've ever had to face. That takes strength and courage. And I see that strength when I look at you. Why are you doing this? You know I'm planning on leaving. I am hoping to convince you not to. He gave me a mischievous little grin, quirking his lips just enough to draw my attention to them. Is it working? His thumb continued stroking my jaw, and my body responded with a shimmering tingle. I resisted the urge to press my lips to his. I hadn't yet told him about my phone call with Uncle Thomas, and we were discussing things that needed to be said. I don't know. I told him. I didn't get a chance to tell you, but my uncle Thomas called earlier and he was pretty insistent on moving forward with his plans for the house. And I... I lowered my head, feeling his hand slip away as I did so. I don't know if I want to stay, Luke. This admission brought shame along with it, a feeling I couldn't quite understand. Luke's hand found mine again. He stroked his thumb across my skin. What do you have waiting for you in Oregon? What about the letter your grandpa wrote you? My head lifted. How do you know about that? I didn't think I'd told him about it, had I? Luke's smile turned soft, almost remorseful. He told me shortly after he wrote it, actually. We were talking one day, about you. He told me if anything were to get you to stay, it would be that letter. Did your aunt get it to you? The strongest feeling of warmth swept over me. I felt no judgment, nothing but love from Luke. And strangely enough, 
from the memory of Grandpa he'd shared. I'd been wishing for the chance to speak to Grandpa one more time, and yet the letter he'd written me would give me that chance, wouldn't it? Why had it taken me so long to realize that? I haven't had the courage to read it yet, I admitted, and suddenly I didn't want to do it alone. Will you come with me? Luke lifted my hand to his lips. You bet. Chapter 24 The drive back to Bridgewater and the farmhouse was blessedly silent. Not only was he probably just as tired as I was, seeing how it was nearly one in the morning, but I think Luke and I both needed that time to think and attempt to sort through our thoughts. I stayed in the center of the cab so I could bask in his warmth and keep my hand in his. The light from his headlights startled a few sleeping goats in their pens, and he pulled to a stop in front of the porch. Hand in hand, we entered the quiet house. The new furniture we'd placed in the parlor looked as perfect as it had before, but I passed it by and tugged Luke's hand toward the stairs. Climbing them together felt strangely intimate. It's in my room, I told him. He said nothing, just maintained his hold on my hand as I took the first steps, leading him up. We stopped at the landing where a seating area used to be alongside several built-in bookshelves that still, amazingly, held a few of the books no one had wanted to take. My heart pounded with every step. I'd never taken a man into my room like this, in the silent house where it was just the two of us. Even with Eli, Grandpa had always been around. It's just in here, I said, entering and flicking on the light. The dated floral wallpaper, my bed interjecting in the middle, the round window covered by curtains. This was your room growing up? This is me, I told him. Luke circled in the center of the room, taking in the pink cowgirl hat hanging on the wall, the ribbons and pictures and posters that looked as though a 17-year-old version of myself were going to walk through the door any minute and claim the space as her own. I'll get it. I said, gesturing toward the closet. Heat speared through my stomach. Luke and I were in my room. Was this a good idea? Then I'll wait here. He settled onto the edge of the bed. Mustering my courage, I opened my closet door. There, right where I'd left it, on top of my Eli box, was the letter addressed to me. I retrieved it without qualms and headed out to sit by Luke. My finger found the fold, but Luke stopped me before I could swipe my way through it. Are you sure you want me here? He asked. Why not? Because this is personal, he said, his warm hand enveloping mine. It's between you and your grandpa, and I don't want to interfere or make things awkward or... I stopped Luke's protestations with the desire that had been building since we started climbing the stairs. He accepted my lips deepening the kiss as though he'd been waiting for it all evening, and considering our bet while axe-throwing earlier, there was a good chance he was. When I pulled away, all of his arguments fled. I want you here, I told him. His eyes turned solemn. Okay, he said. I situated myself against the headboard of my bed, and Luke joined me, stretching his long legs across my homemade quilt. He slid his arm around me to hold me close while I opened the envelope and pulled the letter free. I'd always feared the unknown, but no matter what, relationships with people, no matter who they were, always constituted a risk. I owed this to Grandpa, I realized. I hadn't kept my promise to come back and help him. The least I could do was read what he'd wanted me to know. Okay, Grandpa. Obstinate as ever, I said, with a heartfelt chuckle hearing him call me that in his loving way. I'm listening. With Luke to study me, I opened the letter and began to read. My Bella girl. You're the most stubborn, foolish, beautiful girl. Then again, you always have known your own mind. You are always determined to pave your own way regardless of what others say. That's why I never pushed my opinion on you, even after you left. I knew no matter what I said, you'd have to make your own way. And I hoped you would keep your word and come back to me, but it looks like we won't get that chance. And that's okay, Belle. 
If you're reading this, it's because something happened to me. I tried talking God into letting me stick it out until you saw sense, but he had other plans. I made sure Luke and Sarah both knew not to let me leave this world without speaking my peace to you. I was very clear in my will that you were to inherit Havenwood Farm and all its property. I knew you'd do some fool thing and let the farmhouse go, thinking it'd be what's best for you. Can I tell you that sometimes it takes years before we can know our own hearts? Sometimes others see us better than we see ourselves. I know what you're thinking. Why would I leave the house to you? Not to mention the land. Thomas has been bugging me for years to sell this old place and turn it into a hotel or something stupid like that. But this house is where I loved your grandma. It's called the Honeymoon Cottage because the house was a gift to us upon our wedding. We filled every inch of this house with ourselves. Our love of books, of Western music, warm company, and every fishing mount I could talk your grandma into letting me put up. I kept the yard full of animals. On that note, what do you think of my llamas? Always wanted some. Their dry expressions always make me laugh. Houses have a way of leaving a mark on people. They raise us just as much as parents do. I'd like to think I had a hand in being a father figure in your life, Belle. I loved you more like a daughter than even a granddaughter, though I'd recommend not sharing that little divulsion with any of your cousins. No sense in telling them you were the favorite. This house raised me to be the best man I could be. I knew I couldn't let so much space go to waste. Grandma and I had all the kids we wanted, and even then, we took in people to make sure the rooms were put to their full use. By the time you came along and your mom had returned to her maker, I demanded you. Aunt Sarah wanted to have you come to her house, and by all accounts, she had daughters close to your age. It might have been the more logical decision, but I had room and to spare, and I wanted you to help me fill it. You brought light the minute you set foot on our step. Your love of the animals, of the land, the view outside, seeing you swing on the old oak trees swing out back, or watching you splash in our little stream, playing outside with you while you admired the dandelions and the slow, blazingly beautiful death of a season during fall. Even though I was an old man, you made me see the world through a child's eyes. The house sheltered you and told me to watch, to listen, to offer a hand as you endured scraped knees, broken friendships, and broken hearts. I wanted the house to help you and I both grow and heal after your Eli died, but we didn't get that chance, Belle. But I'm telling you, it's not too late. Give the house the chance to let you grow in ways you never knew you would. Let its doors open your eyes to new adventures, new heights. Forgive past mistakes. Close other doors on things you can do nothing to change, and instead enjoy your life to the fullest. A woman with a roof over her head is blessed indeed. Better still if she's surrounded by people she loves. On that note, I wanted to talk to you about Luke. I've come to love that boy, Belle. We became two peas in a pod, two friendly souls, though one of us was young and robust and the other old and bent. He's a package deal. Reliable, strong, a great friend and listener. He's been through hell and back, and the boy deserves to grow, too. I hope you'll continue to let him rely on this old honeymoon cottage for that, too. You mean everything to me, girl. Don't dig in your heels and go your own way regardless of what I've said. Hear me out. That's all this old man of yours asks. Until we meet again. Grandpa Toby. I cried all the tears toppled onto Luke's chest, let the letter drift behind him, and drooped. Every emotion burbled and sputtered, and tears streamed down my cheeks while I clung to Luke like a lifeline. Grandpa was right. This house had raised me every bit as much as he and Grandma had. I was a part of these walls. I had my hand in some of the memories they'd shared if they could talk. Shh, Luke soothed holding me while my tears wet his shirt. I'm not ready to let it go, I told him in a wretchedly weepy voice. I know, he soothed, rubbing circles on my back. Why did it take me so long to figure it out? As I clung to Luke, the words of a prayer I hadn't dared uttered before now flowed silently and relentlessly in my mind and heart. 
Please forgive me, Lord, I begged, and help me to forgive myself. Luke held me until my tears ceased, until my body, so drained of energy, dozed off into a succumbing slumber in his arms. The remnants of sleep lifted from my lashes. I blinked a few times, feeling warmer and more secure than I had in a long time. The feelings could have something to do with the fact that Luke's chest rose and fell in a steady, slow thrum at my back. His arm was strung on my side, keeping me warm and holding me close. Grandpa's letter began chorusing through my mind, along with the realization that after reading it, I'd fallen asleep in Luke's arms. And rather than waking me, he'd settled in and slept beside me. I was grateful not to wake alone after that. Although the more sleep left my senses, the more urgency I felt to take care of something I'd been putting off for far too long. Hoping I wouldn't wake him, I carefully slid free of Luke's embrace. I widened my step to avoid the notoriously creaky boards situated in the path to my closet and retrieved my shoes and coat from the closet. Then I tiptoed down the stairs and out into the dawn. The rooster crowing alerted me, and I wondered if I shouldn't wake Luke before I went. He typically started early on the chores, but I didn't want to tell him or anyone else what I was up to. I just needed to fly. Before long, I was in the barn. It took no time at all to give some food to Grady, Sweetie, and Walnut. I saddled Walnut as he ate and then mounted him and led him into the yard. Walnut ran like he needed the release as much as I did. Undoubtedly, Luke saw that the horses got the exercise they needed. I guided him on the old trail I had taken so many times to visit my mom's grave, past the stream Grandpa had mentioned in his letter. The cemetery was familiar and visible on the hilltop, headstones spoking through like gray teeth. I knew the way to Mom's headstone. Grandpa's wasn't far off. I knelt on the grass and stroked my fingers across his name. Hank Harville Toby. Father, teacher, friend. His big heart had room for everyone. Enough and to spare. I read it, Grandpa, I told him, tears starting anew. And I came to say I'm sorry I didn't make you feel like you could tell me something so important. I'm sorry I didn't come back. I stared at the words, room for everyone, feeling them to my bones. Luke had promised to do the same for me as well, to give me room. Losing the house would devastate him too. The house that allowed him to grow, had provided a place for him to find friendship, love, and family when he'd been deprived of it as well for so long. I couldn't take that from him. I'll keep it, I told him. Uncle Thomas is going to hate me for this, but I'm going to keep the house. I'll fill the rooms, Grandpa, I promised. And I was struck with the thought that I hoped Luke might be a part of that as well. And unlike my last promise, that's one that I'll keep. Thank you for raising me, for loving me, for giving me a second chance. I stared up at the sky, getting the sense of what Luke had said about the Savior. Christ's warmth enveloped me, and I felt the same from him, too. He'd given me a second chance, too, probably more times than I'd realized. Thank you, Lord, I said, to the morning's lightening sky, to the clouds dusting across the sky's soft blue, to the traces of pink dabbing at them. Thank you for showing me your will. Warm feelings saturated the cold autumn air, bringing a lightness with it I hadn't experienced in so long. It was as though a huge weight had lifted, as though the blockage in my airways and bloodstream I'd been battling for years had dissolved. With this sense of renewal flowing through me, I glanced around, knowing I had one more stop to make. I wasn't sure where Eli's grave was, but the cemetery was small and it didn't take long to find it. Elijah Robert Combs. I knew the dates by heart. I knew all of him by heart. Can you believe this is where we are? I told him, kneeling to trace his name with my fingers. I miss you, I told him. But I found someone else. 
and I hope you'll forgive me. I hope you want me to be happy, because I think I could be happy with him. I think I love him, Eli. Not like I loved you. Our first love was magical. But the love I feel for Luke is different and has its own magic, too. I waited as if for a response. And one came, though it wasn't anything like the one I had expected. It's good to see you here, Belle, a woman said from behind. Rigidly, I turned to find Eli's mom, Jocelyn Combs, smiling at me. Smiling? She'd hardly ever smiled at me during all the times I dated her son. If anything, I'd only been fed the occasional disapproving scowl. Even after Eli and I had gotten engaged, she'd acted so disappointed, like she had so much in mind for her son and I didn't fit into any of it. Jocelyn was a pretty woman, with hair that had been dyed a shade too dark for her skin tone, thin lips, and studious eyes. Here, I'd been hoping to avoid running into her in town, and we'd met up at the most unlikely place possible. Jocelyn held a bouquet of carnations in her hand, which explained her reason for coming to her son's grave. I wondered how often she came. Really? I was too emotional to hide anything at this point. I pressed a cool hand to my cheek. There was a time I might have deferred the subject or played a polite game of niceties while ignoring my true feelings. But that wasn't going to happen this morning. Maybe it was everything I'd just discovered about myself or the healing I'd found. But I needed this out in the open. I thought you hated me. And I thought you'd hate me even more after what happened. Jocelyn lowered her gaze to the flowers she now held in both hands. She nodded, as though I'd chastised her. Perhaps I had. Then she lifted her gaze to mine. You may be right. I didn't treat you as kindly as I should have, especially after you and Eli were engaged. I thought I'd have time to work through my feelings. I thought you and I could become acquainted, friends even, after the two of you married, but that opportunity slipped away from us. In any case, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too, I told her, amazed by her kindness and honesty. As harsh as it seemed, though I'd imagined plenty of confrontations taking place between us about what had happened, I hadn't thought her capable of saying these things. I'm sorry he's gone. I loved him. I know you did, she said. He's not gone forever. I pressed my lips in silent agreement, and then she turned from me, taking the place I'd occupied in front of his grave. She knelt in front of the slab, head lowered, and placed the flower she'd brought just below his name. She didn't hate me. She missed her son, but I missed him too. The feelings I'd experienced moments ago returned with full force. Freedom, happiness, and peace liberated my lungs and allowed my breaths to come without interference. It seemed as though all the muddled, confused, anxiety-ridden points of my life had been cleared, and I saw my life with more transparency than I had before. Nothing but an empty apartment awaited me in Portland. An empty job? An empty life? I wanted more than hollow emotions. I wanted life and love and a warm house that represented the epitome of family. And I was so close to it. All I had to do was reach out and accept it, rather than push it away. I was going to stay in Bridgewater. I was keeping the farmhouse. And I couldn't wait to get back and tell Luke. Chapter 25 The quaking aspens between the cemetery and Havenwood Farm gave the impression that an entire expanse of forest covered one end of the land to the other, when in all reality, it was nothing more than a lovely copse of trees with a threadbare trail I'd ridden since I could remember. While I wanted to give walnut rain to indulge in the breathtaking yellows in the quakey's leaves or inspect the occasional white barked tree trunk, instead, I urged him to disturb the blanket of leaves that had tumbled from branches and created a carpet over parts of the trail. Now that I'd made my decision, I had to tell Luke. 
If that meant waking him up, so be it. On that note, maybe I should make him breakfast. I bet he'd love waking up to a meal with all that good news. I leaned closer to Walnut's neck. Faster, boy, I said, rubbing his mane. He responded, kicking his heels and stirring leaves as he went. My hair flew behind me, and it was the rush I'd felt in the cemetery all over again. The anticipation and sensation of soaring that had taken place in my heart now galloping on the back of my horse. The farmhouse came into view, and I smiled, urging Walnut to slow his steps. We'd have to cross the small stream at the edge of the tree line, and it was best if he didn't attempt that at any faster pace than a canter. His hooves crossed the bubbling stream, and then there were the apple trees and the goat pens, the llama enclosure, the chicken coop. I clicked my teeth at Walnut, urging him to quicken his pace. He wove through the alley between the goat pen and the llamas. Luke's shed, the farmhouse, and the barn came into full view. The barn doors were open, and Luke was there, ready with his wheelbarrow, wheeling it inside. My smile was stuck into place. If he heard my approach, he didn't show it. I guided Walnut toward him. Luke, I cried, reining the gelding in. He didn't come out. I guided Walnut inside, privy to the sound of Luke's movements, but he wasn't tending the animals like I thought he would be. Wheelbarrow abandoned, he'd gone into his woodshop and was bustling around from the sounds of slamming doors and banging tools. I knew Walnut needed some time to cool down after our run. I walked him a bit before guiding him into a stall, removing his bridle and saddle and patting him a few times. Thanks for the ride, old boy, I told him, closing the door to his stall and sauntering toward the other side of the barn. Luke wore the clothes he'd worn yesterday, the clothes he'd slept in, and he muttered frustrated words under his breath, pulling drawers open and slamming them. I gathered a few of his muttered utterances, but didn't let him finish. Hey, I said, is something wrong? He peered back but didn't face me. My heart rose into my throat. What had happened? Was he bothered that he woke to find me gone? I know I should have woken you before I left, but where were you? he said, giving me his full attention. His forehead furrowed and pain was stark in his eyes. What was going on? I went for a ride this morning. I didn't mean to make you think I didn't want to be where you were. I just needed some closure. And I drew in a deep breath. I've decided to keep the house, Luke. I'm staying. My smile overtook my face once more. Giving him this news had to be enough to lighten his mood. It had certainly worked wonders for mine. The confused furrows on his brow deepened. Then how do you explain the vacate notice nailed to my door? The what? What are you talking about? Luke indicated the direction of his house. I scurried outside for personal confirmation. And sure enough, there on the door of his shed, a white paper hung. The words Notice to Vacate were blasted in bold across the top. I tore it from its place and marched back into the barn, offering it to Luke. Where did that come from? I asked. Didn't you put it there? No, why would I? He rubbed a hand across his jaw. That's what I've been trying to figure out since I woke up and found you gone. Last night had been beautiful. He'd held me, supported me while I read Grandpa's parting words. This morning, I'd been ready to confess everything to him, to tell him how I felt and exactly what I planned on doing with this house. I was planning on staying, and I hoped he might be interested in doing the same. The last thing I would have done was put an eviction notice on his door. The fire in his eyes doused somewhat, reducing down to its usual spark. The tension in his shoulders slackened. He looked defeated, hurt and confused, and I longed to alleviate that pain and confusion and to figure out what had really caused it. I placed a hand on his arm. I didn't put that notice on your door. The last thing I want you to do is leave. Luke gave a little nod. Your uncle said otherwise, he said. 
This startled me. My uncle? Do you mean Uncle Thomas? When had Luke spoken to him? Luke studied me for several moments. Yes, he's here. After another pause, he exhaled and said, When I first woke up, I thought you'd taken off again. Then when I saw him here, when he told me you allowed it and had left something for me on my door, I went out to find that notice. It hurt that he thought I'd leave so impulsively again, that he believed Uncle Thomas. I told him how pushy and untrustworthy he seemed. I didn't leave for good. I just went for a ride. And I was coming to tell you. The sound of wheels inching along the road stole my attention. I held a palm toward him and ventured out again to find a patrol car making its way up the drive. What is a policeman doing here? I asked. First, Luke being angry over a vacate notice. Then Uncle Thomas. Now this? In my excitement to reach Luke, I hadn't noticed Uncle Thomas's pickup. But now, I got a better view of it on the grass where the moving truck had been, parked as though the grass were superfluous. My lip curled. What was he doing here? And why would Luke ever think I condoned the intrusion? I have no idea what's going on, I said, hoping he read the adamancy in my tone. You have to believe me. I didn't put that notice on your door. You mean you didn't invite him over? No, I said, unable to wait any longer. And I need to get to the bottom of whatever this is. Because from the sound of things, he'd given Luke one heck of a story. Luke and I would have to hash this out later. I stormed across the gravel and entered the house. There, on the new couch Luke and I had picked out together, sat Uncle Thomas, with a series of papers spread out on the coffee table in front of him. His handlebar mustache had been recently trimmed, his graying hair looking thinner than it had before. What are you doing here? I asked. Grandpa may have had an open-door policy, but that ends. From now on, if you come to my house, I'd like you to knock and wait to be invited in. Interesting choice of words, Uncle Thomas said with a twist to his lips. I told you I wasn't ready to move forward yet, I said. I'm asking you to please take your things and get out of my house. It's not your house, darling, Uncle Thomas said, leaning back into the pillows as though he owned the couch. My beautiful, beloved couch, and he was sullying it with his revolting persona. No wonder Luke was so angry. Uncle Thomas had barged in while I was gone, slapped a vacate notice on Luke's door, and all but kicked him off the property? It was time to set things straight. If Uncle Thomas thought he could force my agreement by pushing in like this, he'd be sorely mistaken. Are you kidding me right now? This house is mine. Grandpa left it to me, and I'm asking you to leave. Uncle Thomas inhaled and stretched out his legs. I'm afraid there was a mistake in the will, he said. There was no mistake. Aunt Sarah gave me the will and the deed to the house and the property. I have them upstairs. Are you sure about that? I have proof that my daddy left the house to me. My bloodstream spiked. You're deluded. Find that will of yours and we can compare it with mine. You don't have a will. Oh no, see for yourself. He gestured to the spread of papers on the coffee table behind him. Fuming, I strolled forward. The documents there looked exactly like the ones Aunt Sarah had given me. Except, somehow, where my name had been on the documents. Now they showed Thomas Branford Toby as the beneficiary instead of me. The longer I stared, the more spots appeared in my vision. That's impossible. I assure you, it's completely possible. I couldn't wrap my head around this. It didn't make any sense at all. Where's Aunt Sarah? She can vouch for me. She saw the documents first. She's the one who gave them to me. My first day back in Bridgewater, I sat down with her, and she went over exactly what my inheritance was. This can't be possible unless... 
I ran back through the events of the day Aunt Sarah had given me those papers. I hadn't put much stock in them at the time, regrettably. I'd all but cast them aside from the minute I'd arrived at the farmhouse that afternoon. Where had I put the documents? I racked my brains trying to think. I'd come home and placed them on the dresser in my room. And I hadn't touched them since then. Luke had been in here, but he wouldn't have touched them. But Aunt Sarah and her daughters and Uncle Thomas and his son John had come to clean the furniture out of the house. My heart wedged into my throat, and I fixed my most accusatory scowl on my uncle. Aunt Sarah and my cousins would never have tried anything like this. But had he? Had Uncle Thomas gone sneaking things when I was distracted elsewhere? Did you take the documents from my room? I said in a deathly quiet voice. Bell, he said, leaning forward to rest his elbows on his knees. I may be many things, but a sneaking thief isn't one of them. Daddy told me he'd leave me the house. That's why I had such a hard time when you were pronounced the beneficiary. You being so stubborn only confirmed that feeling. So I had my lawyer look into it. Sure enough, I discovered these had been mailed to my lawyer. It's why I was making plans to move forward. That's not true, I said. Otherwise, you would have mentioned that you had them from the start. You wouldn't have bothered trying to negotiate with me or get my approval on your ridiculous project. You wouldn't have bothered calling me last night trying to force my hand. The house belongs to Belle, Luke said, startling me. I hadn't realized he'd come back inside. He wasn't the only addition to our argument. A police officer stood beside him, a look of curiosity on his face. He had a mustache as well, but his was cut short and significantly less of a statement than Uncle Thomas's. Hank and I talked about it before he died, Luke went on. He told me himself he was leaving it to her. Even without the documents, your opinion and fake records there won't hold up in court. These aren't fakes, Uncle Thomas said, gesturing to his papers. Then he lifted a finger, garnering the officer's attention. See, didn't I tell you they wouldn't take it well? You're the reason the policeman's here? I said. I wanted to make sure all my bases were covered, Uncle Thomas said. I knew you wouldn't take the news well, and I wanted to make sure I had a witness on my side, to make this as smooth of a transition as possible. It sounds to me there is more at hand here than you let on, the officer said standing with his hands on his hips, just above the belt holding a generous amount of gadgets and dark boxes. Officer Simon, he added, by way of greeting Luke and me. That's right, Officer Simon, Uncle Thomas interjected. But I have proof right here from these legal documents that these two are trespassing on my land. And since they're not clearing off as requested, I think you need to arrest them. Hang on a second, I said. Officer, when I came to town, my aunt gave me documents from my grandpa, and they had my name on them. They declared me as the beneficiary of this house and his land. If you'll give me a few minutes, I'll run upstairs and find them. Though I had my suspicions, I still wasn't sure Uncle Thomas had done what I'd accused him of. The best thing at this point was to verify the truth as much as I could. Sounds fair to me. Officer Simon said. Luke gave me an encouraging nod, and I dashed upstairs to my room, heart pounding, breath racing. In the process, I shot a text to Aunt Sarah. Any chance you can come up to the farmhouse? Uncle Thomas is trying to claim the property is his. I'll be there in a few minutes, she replied. I also directed a new prayer heavenward that justice would prevail and that I'd be able to find the folder. I dug through drawers, rifled through my closet, and combed through my suitcase. The manila folder Aunt Sarah had given me was nowhere in sight. Cursing my absent-minded treatment of such important documents, I tossed back the quilt, sheets, and even looked beneath the mattress. The folder was nowhere in sight. Where did it go? I said, frantically raking my fingers through my hair. The flutter of something caught my eye. The two sheets of Grandpa's handwritten letter had fluttered to the ground during my search of the bed. I'd left them there when Luke and I had fallen asleep the night before. 
He'd mentioned me inheriting the house there. Was the letter proof enough? I dove for them, hugging them to my chest. Thank you, Grandpa, I said again, praying with everything I had that they would be enough, and darted back down the stairs. Luke, Officer Simon, and Uncle Thomas were in a standoff. No one had seated themselves since I'd left. It seemed almost as though sitting down would be admitting defeat. I didn't find the documents, I said. A streak of glee crossed Uncle Thomas's face. Pity. As you can see, I have proof of documentation here, complete with my father's signature. Officer, can you please remove these two from my property? Hey, Luke exclaimed, and I hurried and lifted the pages of Grandpa's letter so they were visible to all present. Grandpa left the house to me, I told Uncle Thomas. He left me this letter explaining explicitly why. He even shared the words here. I read aloud. I was very clear in my will that you were to inherit Havenwood Farm and its land. Daddy was a deranged old man, Uncle Thomas argued. That letter means nothing. Just the sentiments of an old idiot who couldn't see reason. He left the house to me. May I see the letter? Officer Simon asked, ignoring Uncle Thomas. Quivering with the effort to keep myself in place, I offered the pages to him. The officer took it and perused it. It's addressed to Bell, he said. And there's the line right there. Mr. Toby, may I ask where you obtained those documents you claim to be legitimate? I, they came through my lawyer. Mistrust flashed in his gaze along with something like fear. Another car pulled into the driveway. To my relief, Aunt Sarah climbed the steps. She knocked a few times, and Luke let her in after a nod from me. What's going on here? she asked. Uncle Thomas is trying to steal the house from me, I said. I think he stole the documents you gave me my first day here and had them altered with his name instead of mine. Really, Thomas? Aunt Sarah said folding her arms and sneering at him. I didn't steal them. They're rightfully mine, as is this house. You've heard Daddy and I talk. You know he mentioned the house would go to me. There was the smallest thread of desperation in the statement. Aunt Sarah eyed him, and my breath caught. This was a moment of uncertainty. Either she defended the truth, which would undoubtedly cause a rift between her and her brother, or she'd side with her brother and leave me high and dry. I wasn't sure which side she would take, and my breathing came shallow and fast. Uncle Thomas gave her a direct glance followed by a nod in the officer's direction, as though he were trying to tell her what to do. I was reminded of the first time I'd gone jet skiing. I'd ridden with Lee and Uncle Thomas, and he'd stopped on the water to give Lee and me both a turn to drive. Once my turn was over, Lee attempted to make her way to the front of the jet ski, but inadvertently she'd moved to the wrong side, the side Uncle Thomas and I had been on, nearly tipping the jet ski and us into the water. Fortunately, Lee had corrected, saving us from the splash. I felt a similar precipice now. Each of us seemed to be caught, spinning on this top, hanging on which way the weight of Aunt Sarah's decision would tip us. She was all about order about having everything in its proper place. Her home, her yard, the way she dressed. Everything about her screamed of the importance of linear, disciplined living. She wouldn't throw me under the bus, would she? Aunt Sarah released a defeated sigh, and my heart sank. I saw the documents, Aunt Sarah said. Daddy handed them to me before he died. I was there at the attorney's office when he signed them. I overheard conversations with the lawyers about this. Uncle Thomas lifted his chin in appreciative victory. There you have it, he began. But she cut him off, piercing him with an apologetic but set look before turning to the policeman. The house is Bell's, officer. Uncle Thomas swore. For a moment, I worried he'd upturn my new coffee table or take it out on one of the end tables. But he stood there, fuming pumping his fists. I, on the other hand, swallowed a gigantic breath of relief. Officer Simon stepped toward the parlor. It sounds that way to me. If that's the case, 
The one I'll be arresting today is you, Mr. Toby, Officer Simon said. You can't do that, Uncle Thomas spluttered, his face turning red. Forgery is a third-degree felony, Officer Simon said, retrieving a pair of handcuffs from one of the black boxes on his bulky belt. And if what they're saying is true, you're trying to steal this house from your niece. That's grand theft, Mr. Toby, which will rack up a substantial fine, as well as time in the state prison. Prison? Uncle Thomas's voice cracked. Up to 20 years, though the sentence isn't up to me. Thomas Toby, you're under arrest. Now, hang on a second, he said, darting a desperate gaze first to Officer Simon, then to his sister, then Luke, and finally he had the gall to look at me. My pulse ratcheted. This is my family. You can't arrest me in front of my family. I was just trying to get what's owed me, what should be rightfully mine. The old man had no business leaving all this property to my flighty niece. You have the right to remain silent, Officer Simon said, approaching Uncle Thomas. Hang on, this isn't happening. I assure you, it is, Officer Simon said. I felt almost sorry for Uncle Thomas. The indignation in his gaze had turned to desperation and even fear. Clearly, his plans to storm in and take the house out from under me had gone terribly awry. Bell, he pleaded. Bell, I didn't mean any harm. I didn't mean to steal anything. You can hire a lawyer, Officer Simon went on, or the state will provide one for you. Don't do this, Uncle Thomas continued. Shut up already, Luke muttered and I had to say, I agreed with him. He wasn't paying any attention to the police officer listing the Miranda rights, which were in place to protect Uncle Thomas from doing exactly what he was doing, from giving himself away. But he'd all but admitted he'd forged the documents. This will go easier if you don't resist, Officer Simon said. Luke held the door for him, and Uncle Thomas gave in. His shoulders slumped, and he consented to allow the officer to lead him away. Luke, Aunt Sarah, and I remained in the entryway and watched Officer Simon guide Uncle Thomas into his patrol vehicle. My nerves hummed as though they'd not only been strung tightly, but had then been strummed. I had no idea he'd sink so low, Aunt Sarah said, slicing the pressure still lingering among us. I felt it seep out at her words as surely as if she'd punctured a balloon. Do you have any idea where the original documents are? I think they're what he had on the table, I said. I think he modified them. She lifted the papers. The originals have got to be somewhere, she said. In any case, it's a good thing you had that letter. Yes, it is, Luke added. Good thing she finally read it. He slid his gaze to me. For a moment, I worried he meant the statement as a jab after our uneasy morning but Luke punctuated it with a smile. I suspected it to be an attempt to smooth things over between us. Thanks for coming so quickly, I told Aunt Sarah. I think it helped to have your word against his. I can imagine that was a difficult thing for you, to side against your own brother. Her chest lifted. It is what it is, she said, and he should have accepted that much. I'm only sorry his actions led to this. So am I. I said truthfully. I wasn't sure what would happen from this point on, but I couldn't worry about it. Aunt Sarah gave me a hug, shook hands with Luke, and left. He and I stood in a kind of face-off. We'd been through a lot together in the brief time we'd known one another, but we hadn't had a real misunderstanding before. Not like this. Luke ran a hand through his hair. I'm sorry about earlier. I was out of line. I should have learned the facts of the situation before jumping to conclusions. I tucked my lips into my teeth. You had a rude awakening. Silence ensued. I was suddenly exhausted. I didn't want to talk to him anymore. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I wasn't sure how to let him know as much. My excitement about keeping the farmhouse had been momentarily dashed, so instead I said... Just for the record, I wouldn't do that to you. I know. I just... Belle, I thought... I'm pretty tired, 
I said, not wanting to hear any more. Not now, at least. I made for the door. Thanks for sticking up for me. I think I need some time after that drama. The conflict lingered in his gaze, but after several gut-wrenching moments, he relented. Sure, he said, lowering his head. You know where to find me if you feel like talking. Thanks, I said. His earlier words hadn't necessarily been harsh, but the fact that he'd believed my scheming uncle and then had implied that I'd been selfish enough to not only give him an eviction notice, but that I'd leave again without telling him, cut me. I just needed some time to process. Chapter 26 I spent the next few days making arrangements for moving to Bridgewater. Despite the misunderstanding with Luke, I was still on board with moving here. I talked to my landlord in Oregon about ending my contract. I arranged for a moving company to pack my belongings and deliver them here to Idaho. And I sat on my new couch and spent some time hashing out the blurbs my boss had been waiting for me to finish. I then called to tell him of my plans. But Rodney didn't take them too well. Apparently, my clients hadn't accepted my offer to meet over Zoom and insisted on discussing their brand with me in person. Rodney gave me an ultimatum. Either I come to carry out my responsibilities in person or find a new job. That made things all too easy for me. In all reality, I didn't need my position with that company. Not anymore. I had the farmhouse and grandpa's land. Thanks to Aunt Sarah, who'd contacted me to let me know her lawyer had contacted Uncle Thomas's and gotten to the bottom of the situation, the original documents were returned to me. Luke and Aunt Sarah had both mentioned renting out the land to farmers. Chances were, I'd never need to work another day in my life, though I'd probably find a job doing something or other to keep from getting bored. I still wasn't sure what to do about Luke. He continued carrying out his daily chores, and several times I considered venturing out to help him so that we could talk. But even though he'd apologized, the discomfort of the whole situation lingered. I made my way through the house with a notepad and pen, itemizing which rooms needed furniture next, and the thought of shopping with Luke, of everything he'd done to help me before that, wouldn't leave me. I stood at the top of the landing, picturing a lovely set of armchairs for the space that would be the perfect spot for reading whatever books were left on the shelves, and caught sight of Luke out the window. Did he really think I would stoop so low? I guess he didn't have any other way to read that eviction notice, not with how warped things had been that morning. I missed him so much, it ached. I kept picturing how much more fun it would be to carry out this task with Luke's quirky opinions and kisses. I was sure he had good ideas as far as furniture went, and it also wouldn't hurt to have his feedback on the many updates this house needed. Several rooms needed renovated flooring. Ceiling tiles were coming loose in the bathroom. Linoleum needed to be pulled and replaced, and several balusters on the staircase wobbled, as did the railing leading up the porch into the house. Then there was the dated feel of everything, and how fresh and crisp it would all look with some new paint. It wasn't only the conversations about the house I was hoping to have with him. It was the way he'd made me feel. The way he'd enveloped me and looked at me as though there weren't anyone else in the world he'd rather be with. There wasn't anyone I wanted to be with right now, either. I stared out the window at Luke's handsome form, he stopped and glanced back at the rounded window as if he knew I was watching him. I stood up. Blood pounded inside of me, racing like a horse at the sound of a gunshot. I couldn't leave Bridgewater. The honeymoon cottage. I couldn't leave Luke. I bolted out the door. He jabbed his shovel into the ground as if he knew he'd need both hands for whatever I was bringing, and he was ready to catch me when I threw myself into his embrace. He smelled like the sun, like woods and possibility, and his body radiated the heat of the afternoon. He lifted me from the ground, holding me against his chest, keeping me centered on him while the warmest, most reassuring feeling rivaled the sunlight on the outside 
heating me from within, seconding the thoughts pounding in my brain. I missed you, he said. I missed you. I'm sorry I got so angry. I know why you did. I'm sorry you were caught off guard like that. He held me longer, and I dipped my nose against his neck, breathing him in, sweat and all. He was so handsome, so steady, so everything I needed and wanted all in one. Grandpa was right. Luke was a package deal. In an instant, I settled my thoughts. That left just one thing I had to take care of, and I wanted Luke to be there. Will you help me with something? I asked. He lowered me to the ground. Anything. I beamed at him, gripped his hand for the quickest moment. I'll be right back. Returning to the house, I dashed up the stairs and scurried down the hall into my closet where the Eli box had been nestled. It weighed less than I thought it would as I lifted it into my arms and headed out, taking the stairs as fast as I dared. Luke was wheeling the wheelbarrow out to the dump pile when I returned. I admired his fortitude. He really was a reliable man with a great work ethic and values. Another man might have slacked on his duties if there were uncomfortable feelings between him and the lady of the house, but not Luke Holden. Hey, I said. I hadn't sought him out for days, but I was glad to do so now. I'm back. Luke eyed the box in my hands. What do you have there? I shifted the box. Though it wasn't heavy, it was cumbersome. There's something I'd like to do, and I want you to be there with me. You got it, he said. I'm just finishing up here, and then I'll be right there. I helped Luke finish up the last few things he had to do, including putting away rakes and returning the lids to the bins of animal feed. Without questioning me, we headed outside to Grandpa's burn cage. He had burned weeds and cardboard and anything else that could be disposed of in like manner. I placed the box inside the open bars of the enclosure and stepped back. This box holds my memorabilia with Eli, I explained. It's where I put small treasures, things from dates we'd gone on, notes he'd written me, pictures of us together. All the things I couldn't face after he died but couldn't bring myself to let go. Luke showed signs of sympathy. I can't imagine how hard that must have been for you. It was, I said. But I'm okay with it now. You are? Why? Because, I said, fingering one of the flaps on the box, I think it's time I let myself move on. I think Eli would want me to. Luke eyed the burn cage, the bars scarred black from so many uses. You're sure about this? I wasn't able to attend his funeral, I said. And I need to let him go. I need to move on. It honors him, really. And in some weird way, it freed me to forgive myself, too. Taking a steadying breath, I lifted one flap first, followed by another. The sight of so many memories was heartwarming. I braced myself, worried I'd experience second thoughts or regret. But I felt nothing but peace. I rifled through and dug out our engagement picture and my ring. The only things I'll keep are these, I said. That's the ring, huh? Luke pinched my fingers holding the band in his and examined the single diamond. I stiffened, worried for only a moment but he'd said he accepted that I was in love before, and he didn't seem the least bit bothered by it now. Pretty. He had good taste. I tucked it into my pocket. He did. He and I picked it out together. The base of the burn cage had a few weeds and a stack of branches Luke must have deposited at some earlier time, so I didn't have to reach in quite as far to place the box on top. I lifted Grandpa's blowtorch in a way I'd done so many times as a teen, and set the corner of my Eli box on fire. The flames caught, spreading their heat to my arms and cheeks and warming the cold fall afternoon, and Luke held my hand as we watched the contents of my memory burn to ashes. As the pictures and the mementos burned, something inside of me broke free, and I took in a cleansing breath. I was honoring Eli in my own small way, 
and somehow, I felt wherever he was, he approved. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I basked in the warmth of his approval, almost as if he were giving me permission to treasure his memory and move on. To love someone else while I cherished the time I'd had with him. We watched until the embers burned orange and small ashes flurried in the breeze, until the traces were gone along with the remnants of guilt I'd battled. With Luke standing at my back and his arms wrapped around me, the two of us drinking in the sunlight Luke had mentioned, I truly did feel like God was smiling at me in a way I hadn't thought I'd deserved in so long. Luke leaned in, placing the side of his scratchy cheek against mine. His hands tightened around my stomach. So, what was that you said about staying? I rotated in his arms, placed my hands on his strong biceps, and lifted my chin. I... But before I could formulate the words, a familiar minivan pulled into the drive. Is that Bex? Luke asked, letting his hands slide from me. Yeah, I wonder what she's doing here. I wasn't sure if she'd seen us from our position so far on the edge of the barnyard, so I hurried through the apple trees, inhaling the sweet scent of their fruit that looked fully ripe and the few red specimens that had dropped from their perches, and darted across the gravel to the porch where Bex stood. Hey, Bex, I said to her back. Where are your kids? She pivoted, and the sight of tears streaming down her face made me stop short. Bex! What's wrong? Brock is cheating on me. I took a few steps down toward her. What? I glanced at Luke, who shrugged in confusion. How do you know? She smeared a hand against her cheek. I caught him. With her. In our house. Sorry if I'm interrupting. I just needed someone to talk to. I dashed to her and put my arm around her shoulders. You're not interrupting anything. Luke, I'll see you in a while, okay? Sure thing, he said. I've got a few more things I need to finish up before the sun goes down. See, I said, we're just fine. Come on, come inside. Bex made it as far as the parlor before stopping. Whoa, what happened here? I'll tell you later, I said. We weren't going to talk about my lack of furniture right now. Have a seat. This is beautiful, she said, smoothing a hand across the couch. When did you get all this? Story time can come later. Tell me what's going on. Her shoulders sagged without any hint of reluctance, almost with defeat, as if she'd lost all the fight in her. I came home after picking up the kids from his mother's house, and this woman was there. She was there, in our bed in our house. You caught them? At least it didn't happen while the kids were home. No wonder I haven't been able to get him to help me with anything. I thought his weekends were spent camping with his friends. I thought he was gone all the time because of harvest. But he's been seeing another woman. I didn't know what to say. Oh, Bex, so you, what did you do? I demanded she get out of my house. I packed the kids back up and hauled them to Kyle's. I couldn't stay there, though. I needed to get away. I needed... Her voice broke. You did the right thing coming here, I assured her. Your brother will look after them for now, but did Rock say anything? Did he apologize or anything? He told me he doesn't love me. Her lower lip mashed into a muddle and tears streamed down her cheeks once more. I knelt at her side, rubbing circles on her back and wishing I could fix this for her, wishing she wasn't hurting so much. What a horrible thing to be told. What a horrible, heartbreaking thing. Bex caught her hands between her knees and spoke as she stared at a spot on the new rug. This is just the icing on the cake, though. You know Rock is a jerk, she said. I realized it just a few weeks after we were married, but I tried playing it off, tried being positive, tried not to let him know how much my dream life had become a nightmare. 
other people have noticed things, I'm sure, but I've played that off too. But with you here, bringing it up that day and not letting me argue it away, it just opened my eyes, I guess. My stomach nodded with worry. You said he wouldn't hurt you or the kids. He never has. He's not a violent man. But he's just mean. And now my kids are behaving like that too. You should have heard the way Cody talked to me. Sounded just like him. Have you tried working things out? I asked, wishing I had something to offer her. I should have baked another pie or had coffee ready at least. Counseling, maybe? I can only imagine how hard it is having marital issues in a town this small where everyone knows your every move. Beck sniffed. I've tried, but he wouldn't go, she said. He said there's nothing wrong. He didn't see how lonely I was. And if he did, he didn't care. He doesn't see how he hurts the kids with the harsh things he says. And now? I reached for her hand, wishing there was more I could do. I've always thought, it's bad. But it's not that bad. Not enough to leave or give up. But what if it is? How long do I put up with this? He's cheating on me. You'll have to decide where the line is, I told her. I didn't want to encourage divorce. That was a last-ditch option. And I believed marriage should weather whatever storms it needed to. But not at the expense of a person's emotional or physical well-being and trust. One thing I've learned from coming back here, I told her, is that you might give people something to talk about for a few days, but deep down, they really do care. You deserve to be loved, Rebecca Cutler. She crumpled at that, sobbing as more tears surfaced, almost as if she were a dried sponge and the words were gushing water she'd been deprived of for so long. I went on, telling her nothing but the truth. You deserve to be with someone who treats you with that love, with respect. You do so much for everyone else. It's okay to take care of what you need to do too. Marriage is sacred. God takes our vows seriously and so should we. But that doesn't mean we have to keep ourselves in situations where we keep getting hurt. And if Rock is being unfaithful to you, if he isn't willing to hear what you have to say, if he isn't willing to change and start treating you better? I trailed off. What do I do? She said, her lower lip trembling as she wiped more tears. I placed my hand over hers again. In all honesty, I had no idea what to tell her. I decided to present the two options that were clearest to me. You can keep trying, but if he's not willing to do the same, you'll have to decide if that's a battle you want to fight. But whatever you decide, you know this door is always open. Grandpa Toby always said there's enough and to spare. I thought with a smile and gazed at the beams of sunlight spilling into the windows. Heaven smiles. Even in his absence, I could feel Grandpa smiling down on me too. She sniffed. I can't go back there. She didn't respond to my earlier statement, so I got more explicit. This house has seven rooms, Bex. Her brows snapped together. But I thought you were selling. Not anymore. I promise. I'll tell you everything later. But I'm staying, and there's plenty of space. Come here with the kids, at least for a few days. You are the kindest, sweetest, most giving person I know. You deserve to be loved and treated like you're worthy, appreciated, and special. She hung her head. I rubbed circles on Bex's back and handed her tissues. Eventually, she wiped her eyes. I don't know what I'll do, but thanks for listening, for still being my friend. Of course I'm still your friend. I'm here. And I mean that this time. It meant so much knowing how true the statement was. Though her brother was still in Bridgewater, Bex's parents had moved to Boise, that was far to take the kids out of school and uproot their life. In all reality, staying here made total sense. She could move in with her in-laws or her brother, but their house was cramped as it was. 
She didn't have many other options, not really. Not if she didn't want to remain at home. I stared around the farmhouse, hearing Grandpa, wishing he was here to talk to. You know what he'd say, though, a voice whispered. Enough and to spare. The heart knows what it needs. It just takes the mind a little while to catch up. I didn't need to sell this place. Honestly, I didn't think I could. I loved this house and the stories that lined its walls, the affection and comfort and safety I'd felt here as a child. This was my rearing grounds, my growing up. So many crucial life lessons had been learned here. So many touching moments. Moments filled with laughter, the kitchen swirling with grandma's baking, having her cut me an apple after school. I turned my back on all of that once. Grandpa had always seemed to know exactly what I needed. Was that why he'd given me this house rather than bequeathing it to any of his other grandchildren or even his children? The truth was, I'd been lonely too. So lonely. Even with all the busyness and bustle of Portland. Surrounded by people and yet never connecting to them the way I did here. Sometimes it took less to have more. Less town, fewer stores, and yet more friends than I remembered I had. More connection than I knew I deserved. I could help Bex find that too. Chapter 27 True to an Idaho afternoon in autumn, storm clouds loomed shortly after we went inside. A gentle autumn rain began to beat its drum against the farmhouse windows. Rainy fall days were a balm to the soul. The smell of rain was consoling. The sound against the windows was a lullaby. I stared out the window, wishing I could give my mind the respite it craved and some peace of mind for my best friend. We could kick up our feet, cozy under a blanket, let our fingers indulge in the warm sides of a mug as we each brought it to our mouths to savor the deliciously warm cider inside. While Bex remained on my couch, I rose to peer at the wetness outside. Had Luke finished everything he needed to before this picked up? You know what we need right now, I said, placing a hand on the window frame and admiring the streaks of rain on the glass. I peered over my shoulder to answer my own question. Some warm apple cider. Everything seems better after cider. I wondered if Grandpa had any, or if I needed to make a quick run to the mercantile. Then I remembered Old Blue was out of commission. I really needed a vehicle of my own. Bex chuckled, but there was no humor in it. She rose to her feet and shuffled over to me. Thanks. Cider sounds perfect. But I need to get my kids. Bring them here. I told her, even as she shook her head. I'm serious. There are no beds, but we can figure something out. Stay as long as you need to. Her shoulders had a weary set to them. I can't pay you rent, she said. I haven't had a job since we first got married seven years ago. I almost laughed, but I kept it in. Bex, I don't need rent. I have 300 acres of land. Luke assured me I could get farmers lined up to farm the land next spring. In fact, he told me he'd be surprised if Grandpa didn't already have the arrangements made. Never in my whole life did I think I'd have that much in my bank account without having to work for it. I don't need or expect you to pay rent. Bex's blue eyes were glossy with emotion. Gratitude, disbelief, a desire to argue, and a loss of will for such an argument. So much sadness plucked at my heart, too. I maintained my eye contact, wanting her to know how much I meant what I said. Moments passed, and she adjusted her footing and lifted her head. I'm not staying forever, though, she said. Totally understandable. Nor should you. You'll get back on your feet. You could go back to school, get a degree. You could do anything. The muscles in her throat worked. She gazed out at the drizzling rain, letting its melody serenade us for a few more seconds. I've got to get through court proceedings first. Court proceedings? Did that mean she'd decided to leave Rock for good? 
I could imagine the hurdle that decision presented. Do you think he'll fight you for the kids? He's going to try, though I don't know why. Pride, probably. Heaven knows he's in no position to be a father to the kids, not when he barely tried when we were together. You have somewhere to call home while you get through this, I told her, reaching for her hand and giving it a squeeze. And Luke and I will do anything we can to help. Her smile sparkled. Oh, so now you're Luke and I. I think we're getting there, I told her, releasing her hand. From this view, I could see Luke's house. He didn't seem to be anywhere outside anymore. Had he gone home? Bex placed a hand on my shoulder. Thanks for listening, she said. Of course. Do you want me to come with you? She shook her head. No, it might get messy. I think I'll handle it myself. You're coming back with the kids, right? They may have to sleep on the floor for a little while. She laughed and cast her gaze to the vacant dining room behind me. Yeah, I noticed you were lacking a few things. Grandpa left the furniture and other belongings to my aunt and uncles and their families, I explained. So you could say this is a fresh start for both of us, Bex. I'll need some help around here, picking out new furniture and deciding how to fix up this old place. Aunt Sarah told me it was a chance to make this house my own, and I intend to. My kids will love sleeping on the floor for a little while, Beck said, smiling through her sadness. This'll be a new adventure for them. Yeah. Her lower lip trembled. Hey, I said, pulling her into a hug. Bex tumbled into my embrace and collapsed into sobs. I stroked her hair and tried to be as soothing as I could, but I knew the best thing was to just let her cry. And the rain outside seemed fitting. The sky sobbed too, pouring down and creating puddles outside while I held my best friend. Bex stayed another hour or so while we sorted out a few details, and then I walked her out to her car. The rain continued to drizzle, so I remained under the porch's cover and watched until she drove away. Then I braved the wet and dashed beneath its drops, enjoying its cool, startling sprinkles, until I reached Luke's porch. I knocked a few times and waited. Then, when he didn't answer, I knocked a few more times. Is he not here? I asked, taking in the side of his pickup parked in front of the barn. I dashed for the barn's side door then, and sure enough, there he was in his woodshop. Fluorescent light glimmered from the rafters high overhead, and Luke was bent near a table, measuring tape to one of the boards he'd placed there, a pencil in his teeth. My feet disturbed the sawdust on the floor, and Luke peered up. Hey, he said. How's Bex? Not good, I said. Her marriage is failing. I told her she could come stay here for as long as she needed to. Sounds like something Hank would do, Luke said with approval in his ardent expression. I'm hoping to help her, the way Grandpa, the way you, helped me. Luke lowered the pencil to the table. Me? How did I help you? I stepped to his side. Life was too short to keep anything to myself. I was grateful for Luke and he needed to know why. You've come to mean so much to me in such a short time. You helped me see Bridgewater in a new light. You let me work through my crazy emotions, and yet haven't been the least bit turned off by my emotional baggage. Well, hey, he laughed and set his pencil and tape measure down on the board that had a few markings on its side. What are you saying? he said. I'm saying thank you. And it was too soon to call this love, but I couldn't deny the stirring in my chest felt suspiciously like it. I care about you. I don't want to leave, but I hope you don't either. Havenwood Farm wouldn't be the same without you. Where is this coming from? What makes you think I'm leaving? Nothing. I guess I'm trying to say part of the reason I'm staying is because I want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Luke lifted his hand to my cheek. The touch was so tender, 
compounded by the adoration gleaming in his eyes. That kind of look spoke so much more than words ever could. I wasn't making up that connection I felt to you, Belle. That's all true, and it hasn't changed in the last few days. If anything, it's gotten stronger. Then you don't mind if I become your landlady? He laughed. Not at all, though I can't say I'd mind you becoming a whole lot more than that. He drew me to him. The embrace was accepting and offering all at once, and being in Luke's arms, having him in mine, was a powerful exchange. We held one another in that moment of connection, in that stillness where, though neither of us moved much, my heart somehow took residence with his. Since I'm your boss now, I think we should lay down some rules, I said. Oh? He released the embrace but kept his hands at my waist. I placed my hands on his chest, still needing to be as close to his heart as I could. First of all, kisses on the job are completely acceptable. This amused him. Are they now? In fact, they're to be expected. I can agree to that. The chores must be done by the end of the day. The animals need to be cared for, you know. Of course. But should we get distracted, sneaking off to be together is also highly possible. I think you should prepare yourself for this kind of situation. Barns and fields, anywhere indoors or outdoors, have plenty of places for us to get lost in. Maybe we don't have to go all that far every time, he said, nuzzling my nose. My lashes fluttered. That's right. I'm just saying, if it's with me, distractions are permitted. His mouth hovered over mine. Glad you clarified that. Anything else before I kiss you? I have some plans for the house, and I'd like your help if you're up for it. More furniture shopping? I need a dining table for one thing, and really, the place needs some TLC. And I've got to figure out how to contact farmers to rent Grandpa's land. Don't you worry about that. Hank's had the same farmers using his land for years. They'll be coming to you. That's a relief. He grazed his lips along my jaw. Anything else, boss? Just one more thing. I get the feeling you and Grandpa talked about me more than you let on. He told you about the letter he wrote me, didn't he? Luke grinned, his hands resting on my hips. He told me he was no matchmaker, but he felt like you and I would be a good fit for each other. He told me this house would be perfect for us. Unbelievable, I said. But I couldn't bring myself to feel betrayed. Luke had had that conversation on his chest this whole time. I didn't buy it either, but the minute I realized who you were, I changed my tune. Might not have happened if you hadn't staggered into me on the street the day we met, or lured me outside and kissed me like a woman who knows her own mind and wouldn't take no for an answer. But I had this feeling about you from that first moment, and the instant I learned your name— it was almost like Hank was saying, I told you so. I'm glad you listen better than I do, I told him. He told me you were stubborn. He told me you were a package deal. Luke puffed out his chest, a look of pride. He's not wrong. Luke kissed me then, long and slow and encompassing, while a feeling of love and wholeness settled over my heart. I wasn't sure how long it lasted, but eventually, we walked to the barn door and looked out. Together, we stood in the fall air, snuggling closely so I barely noticed the cold, and stared at the old farmhouse through the rain with a renewed sense of wonder and gratitude. Epilogue After packing the kids' clothes and a few of their toys— Along with a few bags of her own, Bex piled the kids into the van and drove out to Havenwood Farm. Rock didn't seem to care. If anything, he was glad to finally have her leave. Despite her attempts to save it, her marriage had quite literally fallen apart. 
She was happy Belle found someone as amazing as Luke Holden, especially after the heartache she'd suffered when her fiancé had died. Belle's transformation since she'd arrived in Bridgewater had been remarkable and noticeable, and deep inside, Beck sent a prayer heavenward for the same thing. She longed for a love like what Belle and Luke had. The minute she'd married Rock, the romance had vanished. He'd become a roommate who wanted food and intimacy and only paid attention to her when his body craved either. Then he resorted to ignoring her until the next time expectation reared its head. She didn't know how long he'd been seeing this other woman. Tara. He'd called her Tara. Bex cringed and shuddered, hurting and hating this whole situation. Though the rain had stopped, the ground was still soft, and her van navigated the muddy road before it turned to gravel until Belle's farmhouse came into view. She shifted into park and stared out her windshield. Are we here, Mommy? Paisley asked. We're staying at Aunt Belle's? We're here, Beck said, giving her daughter a smile she didn't feel. At least she had somewhere to stay, somewhere out of town where she wouldn't have to see Rock every day, somewhere she had the support of her friend. The next few months, who was she kidding, the next few years, wouldn't be easy. But Bex had to believe the kind of love she'd always dreamed of was still possible. Though, who would want a washed-up single mom with a deadbeat ex-husband? She didn't have a clue. Hey, what's up? It's Caitlin Meadows here. I just wanted to hop on and say thank you so much for listening to Inheriting the Farmhouse. I hope you loved Luke and Belle's story. I'm excited because book two, Fixing Up the Farmhouse, is coming soon to my channel. So if you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed. And if you like this audiobook, please hit that like button and leave me a comment. I'd love to know your thoughts. Thanks so much. This has been Inheriting the Farmhouse. A Havenwood Cowboys Romance, Book One. Written by Caitlin Meadows. Narrated by Emily Norman. Copyright 2022 by Courtney Pearson. Production copyright by Courtney Pearson.